Welcome to Krill Pet Arctic World Series. It's time for the third race of the series, Volga Quest in Russia. With me in our studio today, I have our expert who's participated nine times in the Finnmark race and 10 times in the Femin race. Welcome, Nina Skramsta. Thank you, Maria. And also we have a long time veterinarian who's been the head vet for the Femin race seven times and also a former vet for Volga Quest, Steinar Dagesta. Welcome. And Nina, uh, what kind of race is the Volga Quest? Well, Volga is one of few long distance races in uh, Russia. There are not very many uh, races uh, nowadays in Russia, but uh, the Volga Quest, which is uh, the two, uh, has two different parts, starts with like a mid-distance uh, stage race, and then you have one day rest, and then you have the long distance part, which starts today. So we don't see many mushers, but uh, the competitive sport of mushing is uh, building up in Russia. Cool. And uh, Steinar, how will you describe the Volga Quest? Uh, well, uh, Volga Quest is uh, one of the few Russian championships for dog mushers. Uh, and uh, I think it's a, it's a pleasure that we all are invited to come to the Russian mushers races. Uh, and um, uh, Things are different because uh, they do not have that much experience uh, as uh, European and American mushers have. And uh, also the organizers are building up competence in how to arrange mm. dog races. Uh, I think it's a very good idea from the founder of Volga Quest that they put this international in front of their uh, uh, arrangement because they really would like to see mushers coming from foreign country to take part in their uh, competition uh, that goes from out from the city of Togliate. And we have a lot to look forward to. Now here's what's coming up today. Today is the start of the final leg for those competing in the long distance part of Volga Quest. The first part of Volga Quest has already finished. We'll get insights from the first three days of the race. We'll get updates on the five dog teams in the long distance race. Our expert Dallas Sivi is in Russia to tell us all about it. But first, Volga Quest is located in the Samara region along the Europe's long, longest and largest river, Volga. And uh, our photographers has been there a couple of days. This is deep inside Russia, nearby Kazakhstan. And uh, they captured from their lenses some beautiful photographies and we'll get to know the towns along Volga. Blending 
Now, that was some beautiful pictures of the Volga and the area of Samara. Uh, how will you describe uh, this place in Russia? <laughs> Talking to me? Yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I think uh, I have the feeling wherever you are traveling on the northern hemisphere, uh, I think very much nature looks very much the same. So when traveling uh, along the banks of uh, or along the Volga River on the banks there, it's very much like being along a river in Alaska. It's it's a it's a, it's a wide wide bending road. It's birch trees. It's uh, heaps of sand, and it's very much the same nature as we find in other places uh, where mushing are taking place. Mm. And it's by a national park, Samarskaya Lyka. That's mm. right, Maria. That's uh, the race exploit in the national park of Samarskaya Luka. <laughs> and this national park is well known for uh, limestone formations, depressions, and it has quite interesting uh, wildlife as well. But the main thing here is that the Volga River makes an arch, like a 200 kilometer arch. And you have this island in the river of Volga, which is quite big. And this is the Samarskaya Luka. National Park. And that's I mean, where Volga Quest is taking place. That's right. This year, all the stages will be on this island of the National Park Samarskaya Luka. Due to conditions on the Volga River, they had to change the route this year. And, you know, in this uh, national park, it is quite interesting with the wildlife as well. They have everything from wolves to freshwater turtles. So it's uh, quite an interesting uh, fauna there. Mm. And um, now we'll get to learn what's even more special about the Volga Quest race. Volga Quest is uh, one of the few uh, long distance races in Russia. Mushing has a long tradition in Russia, but uh, distant mushing has not had a long tradition. Well, the Volga class goes along the uh, Volga River, which is about 3,700 kilometers long, north of the Caspian Sea. Starts in Togliati and the finish line is in Bulgor. This year, the trail is being changed a little bit due to really bad ice condition on the Volga River. And there are also some parts of the trail with very little snow at the moment, so there might be a little change of the trail at the last minute of the race. Now that was a little bit about the, the Volga Quest. And uh, you say that uh, mushing is pretty new. It's not long traditions in Russia. So what can we expect today? When we're talking about competitive mushing, it's a pretty new sport. They had some long races being arranged some years ago, which are not being arranged anymore, such as the North Hope race, the Hope race, uh, and also the Kalevala race, which is in the Karelia area close to the Finnish border. Right now, there are two, three famous or well, more well-known Russian races. We have the N uh, Nadista Hope race, which is at, uh, in the Shukotka era to the east all the way east of Russia. We have the Beringa race at the Kamchatka island, half island, and we have the Volga quest. So today we'll see a few teams, but they still are in the learning process of how to do long distance mushing. And we'll also see different kinds of uh, dogs, uh, more howdy dogs and howdy Alaskans and faster Alaska huskies. And we also will see more Siberian huskies. Mm. And uh, Steinar, you've, uh, you've been there twice, so uh, what kind of dogs have you seen there? Uh, I think I would just fill in, as uh, said already about that. It's, it's a great variety of dogs. Uh, 
so of course uh, uh, the native people of Russia they have run dogs for centuries and thousands of years probably and uh, it was probably dogs from Russia that uh, was the start for the uh, hen, uh, the competing dogs also in Alaska and later the on. The Siberians, so right? Yeah, Siberians and, and Shutka dogs and uh, Laikas and whatever. So what you will see is uh, uh, a wide variety of dogs, both with uh, thinking of coats and also uh, building-wise otherwise than thinking of the fur only. Uh, and um, uh, we do not see the kind of uh, competing Alaskan husky as we see in in uh, America and Europe. No, no. they're not uh, the, the, bred the, that way. Or? They are not kind of that streamlined as as they have developed to be in in our part of the world. Mm. And uh, on site we have our reporter Carrie Ann and our expert Dallas Seavey. And I wonder how they're doing out there in Russia. Welcome to Russia. It's great to be here at the start of the Volga Quest and uh, here in Shi... Shirayeva. Shirayeva. Dallas got it right. Shirayeva. That's where the start is. And Dallas, we're in Russia. Yes, it's we a are. <laughs> <laughs> first time you're in Russia. Tell me, what's your first impression? It's been it's been awesome. We've been here. Um, of course, it's a mushing ev event. So right away, you are in Russia. Completely different language, different place, different architecture, but the same type of people. You know, excited about a dog race, getting excited to go continue on the trail for some of them. Um, so my first impression is very happy. Uh, very welcoming people um, and it's almost stepping into something that I'm familiar with with again that Russian community that seems to be consistent whether it's Alaska, Canada, Norway or Russia. Yeah he's been talking about that for the last past days uh, Dallas that whenever you go the musher is the musher, is it? Yep, it's it's the same relationship between the mushers and the handlers and the vets and the volunteers and the dogs, and it creates this little culture that's um, unique, right? It's it's something unique, and it's it shocks me. We are so far from home, but yet there are things that are so much exactly what I do every single day in my life in my dog yard with, uh, you know, the mushing culture. So it's neat. And what about this place? Here we are. There's this beautiful landscape here, and and. What do you think about this place where th at the start here? Yeah, I mean, again, it's it's familiar in so many ways, right? So I'm 13 time zones away from where I live right now, and a lot of the the trees and whatnot look very similar to my home. Um, but it's it's all just a little bit different. There's just little aspects that you wouldn't see in Alaska or you wouldn't see in Norway that we are seeing here. So uh, nature-wise, it's beautiful, right? This is a national park of sorts here. We're nearly on an island, not quite, as the Volga River wraps around it. Um, and it's, man, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. This is at the start. The, the mushroom will soon come in here and start their race. And they're really coming back here as well. And today... Um it's the last part of the long distance race. Yep. So we're kind of, it's a very unique race format. So the first half of the race for the long distance mushers, for the mushers doing the 550, is done as a stage race. They do a preset amount of trail each day and then they spend the night sleeping and the dogs have more rest there. And then they take a, a longer break in between, which we've just accomplished. And this morning they're starting the second half. Now it's a non stop race. So they're going to do the same trail they just did. But instead of having a pre-set amount of distance each day, it's up to the mushers with just the one mandatory six-hour rest on the trail. So they're taking off here soon. Have you seen this way of racing before? I have seen both styles, but I've never seen the two mixed. And so it's really unique that way to, to do the first half of the race um, in one style and then the second half in another style. I think it's a great concept. Uh, we have stage racing. We have long-distance continuous races, but they just kind of merge the two. And also structurally, it makes sense because on the first half of it, that, that is its own race. They have the 250-kilometer class that just does the first part as a stage race. Afterwards, they have the banquet and the ceremonies that they, we saw yesterday a little bit. Um, and now today, they're starting the long-distance portion done more like a traditional long-distance race. 
we've had the, the possibility to discuss a little bit with the mushers. There, it's a bit difficult with the language. <laughs> we have to work on our Russian, don't we, Dallas? Yeah, I, we got Shira Yevo. <laughs> we got that far. That's the only one I've got. <laughs> but we met with the, some of the mushers yesterday, and you know, everybody here is very honored to meet with Dallas. And you did a great thing yesterday because there was a meeting, and you were explain us a little bit about what you did yesterday with the mushers here. Sure. Um, you know, it's kind of started out just meeting mushers and talking to them, and everybody had a lot of questions. So we figured, uh, why don't we do like a, a little musher talk, right? So, um, what, like six o'clock yesterday evening, we invited all the mushers up, uh, and the the race people, the host, the people hosting the race, gave us a room and a, set it up for us. And we just did a, a, a talk with the mushers and sharing information. Um, Bruce Lee was there as well, so the folks here were able to ask their questions, and we were able to talk about you know, how we do it in Alaska or how we've seen it done in. Canada and Norway and just help grow the mushing community in that exchange of information. And I can tell you there was not one musher that didn't listen to, to Dallas and some of the questions you got, were you surprised by it or was it like what you would have expected? No, I, I think it was, I don't want to say what I would expect, but I've done mushing seminars and symposiums in you know Spain, Norway, Alaska, Canada, all over the continental U.S. And I think we see fairly consistent questions, but one thing you get a gauge of the level of mushing based on the questions that they're asking. And so I was actually a little bit impressed. They were they were high level questions. There is some, of course, it's a mixture of mushers, but there were some kind of novice questions. But on the whole, it was a high level of questions, which means there's already a solid base of knowledge. Um, and some things that we would consider more basic was new here and some things that we view as kind of advanced in Alaska was normal here so it's just a little bit different. You see that people are coming around here for the start and um, so what can we what are you looking forward to at the start uh, Dallas? I'm excited to see you know always the dogs right I'm excited to see the dog teams what they're looking like at the at the starting line here these dogs have already run 240 kilometers, 250 kilometers. So we think of it as the starting line, but we are also getting to see how hard was the first half of the race for the dogs? Have they fully recovered? And as a musher, that would be my, my primary goal is to run the first half easy enough to where the dogs are every bit as good now as they were you know, in the beginning, beginning a couple days ago. Um, so we'll be seeing that. I like seeing the different equipment and gear. You know, where what are the mushers using for booties, for sleds, for tow lines, for harnesses? And that's just for me personally. I, I'm curious about that stuff. Um, that's what I'll be looking at. How many dogs they leave with? Right, they started with 12 dogs, and they will have decided to to leave some behind after that first half of the race. Possibly because of the format, the first half of the race was much faster because they had long rests in between, so the speed's going to be much higher. So you might have seen mushers bring a faster lead dog for the first half that they then are going to leave out from the second half as this is going to be less rest and they're going to want to bring the speed down a little bit. So, well, we're going to stay here at the start. We'll probably bring you some more interviews and, uh, well, now back to the studio and also. Thanks, uh, Carrie Ann. So uh, Dallas is saying that they can bring the, the same amount of dogs in the first part and over to the second part starting today of the race. Is that true? No, I believe uh, they have to start with the number of dogs uh, and as they finished uh, stage three at Monday yeah. and then they had a rest day yesterday. So if they s finish with eight dogs, for example, at Monday, they got to start with eight dogs today. Yeah, they can they can can kill <laughs> more no, dogs. They cannot bring back the dogs already dropped. They have to start with the amount of dogs that they had uh, at the finish line. Uh, Monday, and then considering if all the dogs are able to run further on today. So yeah, they'll. We have uh, teams uh, um, starting with everything between seven and eleven dogs today. So okay, out of twelve. So how can that, uh uh, what will that do with the speed and the tempo? Do you think? Um, of course, seven dogs could be a bit too little. And the one with seven dogs, that's Mikhail Fatehev, uh, the leader of the race. He's uh, down to seven dogs. He's dropped uh, five dogs to his uh, handler team. Uh, and uh, of course, when you have other measures with 11 dogs, that's four more dogs. I mean, it, it is a bit hilly on this island or peninsula of Samaskaluka. So it might be uh, good for, his t uh, for him to have, or for the measures to have more dogs. Um, yeah. And I wonder, Steina, how many dogs do they have to have over this finish line? 
Uh, I actually, I am well, not. Well, that's uh, yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah, yeah. That's six, Maria. Six yeah. dogs, yeah. Right? six dogs to finish the race. Okay. And so what we see today is uh, they will, uh, or during the next three days, there will be one checkpoint of uh, Karmale, and the uh, checkpoint of Karmale is used two times. So we have. Checkpoint Karmali 1 and Checkpoint Karmali 2. And at Karmali, the mushers need to take six hour mandatory rests, right? And they can decide if they want to do it on the way at Karmali 1, on the way to Islada, and then back again, or they can do it at Karmali 2. I know of a, a guy who knows uh, this trail because he is there in Russia, and that is our expert, Dallas Sivi. He will guide us through the trail. The first leg of the Volga Quest race goes from Shirayevo to Karmali. It's about an 80 kilometer run. And right out of the takeoff chute here, they're going to climb up into some nice kind of mountains or rolling hills. Very scenic for the first 20 kilometers. To the north, it's about a 200 meter mountain range. Um, all I've heard is that it's a beautiful run. Then they're going to drop down into some little bit lower lands and fields and meadows. If it's windy like this, that could add a little bit of complication. The sleds are going to be heavy on this first run because they have to carry all the food and equipment for the entire race. When they arrive in Carmeli, they're going to have the option to take their mandatory six-hour rest, or they can take it when they return to that checkpoint later. And uh, Steiner, uh, this trail, you've been there and you've seen it. Uh, is it hilly? It's hilly. It's up and downs. It's uh, small valleys, very often bushy valleys. So when they make the trails with the, with the snow go, they have to cut branches all the way and... Uh, I heard the mushers telling me, I have not been out on the trail myself, I haven't been to the checkpoints, but I've heard mushers said to me that they had to, to bend down from all the bushes and willows that were in their way. But I think it's also passing also over more hilly areas, but, but it's, uh, it's not high mountain area, so there will always be lots of uh, vegetation there. Okay, so mm. a lot of trees. Yeah. Well, uh, Maria, I understand. I think the highest mountains are about 300 meters above sea level, and that's the part of uh, the nor uh, northeast part of the Samarskaya Luka National Park. That's where it's most hilly. So we, compared to Alaskan or Norwegian uh, mountains, it's not so high. The mountains are not so high. No, but for a musher, is 300 meters above sea level tall mount uh, tall, or is it? Well, there could be some really tough hills to climb. <laughs> Especially if you have a smaller dog team. Mm. Now, uh, our reporter, Greg Heister, is also in Russia and he's doing some interviews with the founder. Okay, guys, welcome back. Uh, we're near Sharyevo, Russia, and we're getting ready for the start of the Volga Quest 2020. Greg, and this is Elena. I'm going to let her say her last name for you. What's your last name? Ryabuhina. There you go. Okay, so I hope you're taking notes at home. All right, so you're one of the race's founders. So let's go back to 2012, 2013, 2014, the very first Volga Quest. Why did you feel it necessary to have our dog race here? Actually, it's a lot of people around this place. They are interested in dog marshal, and they put together the first race like for their fun. And right now, we do understand that we need to put together this kind of event to make together the whole um, the whole company of the people who are really in love of this kind of sport. And this is why we are here. This is why we again start this unbelievable race. And I know uh, if you're familiar with Russia at all, she spent a lot of time near Kamchatka and Chukotka. And, and I know uh, mushing is huge in those areas, but does it have a long time history in, in the middle part of Russia where we're at? Um, no. It's oh, new, right? It's You're... a new one, absolutely new thing here. A historical, oh, everything start in the Far East. But the people around Russia, they did find out that it's very interesting uh, sport. And uh, m mostly of them, they were hooked by the dogs. Yeah. And so this is um, the, uh, a great opportunity for them to have some kind of development for themselves and for this kind of sport. I'm sorry for my poor English. <laughs> oh, no, actually, you're, it's, it's, it's better than mine. But uh, <laughs> no. so how did you get the word out? Like, how do you, how do you get the word out to mushers around? Uh, this country is enormous. And were there mushers before this race that lived close? Uh, most of them, they lived not far from uh, Norway and Finland. Mostly they are coming from around St. Petersburg. And, uh, but right now, even at this place, it's a lot of people who are doing the same. And uh, if you are talking about the Russians who are interested in, it's huge numbers. Yeah. 
Yeah, and so any idea how many dog teams are in this country? Um, fee- uh, truthfully, it's not too much, very famous, maybe mm. maybe 10 or 20. But as I know, in St. Petersburg and around Moscow, it's about 200 marshes. It's the uh, dog's leg uh, tourism. It's so popular in Russia now. So actually, they start like a, like a tourism, and then they are coming to the race. And I find it very interesting because uh, as the race begins later this morning, you're going to see dogs, Alaskan Huskies. You're going to see Malamutes. You're going to see Siberians. We did have a team with Greenland dogs that has dropped out uh, that will not race today. But uh, we have people here from all over the world. We have Russians running the race, but we have dogs from everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah, Yeah. you're right. You're quite right. Because uh, on the start line, even on the middle distance, you can see a lot of different, different dogs were coming. It's interesting because they, uh, as for the people who are not involved too much in the sport, they know uh, only uh, Siberian Husky because they like to have a picture of them. And so like me, 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 we name it. So on, <laughs> over here, as soon as they look to Alaskan Huskies, they said, it's, it's strange look go, uh, dogs, how they can run so long distance, how it's, maybe they find it's around this place, around the houses, mm-hmm. and put it on the sled. But it's not true, and the people educated that these guys came from Alaska now. Yeah. So it means why they named it Alaskan Husky. Mm-hmm. And also you may see you, on, on the start line, you can see uh, one dog, she was from Yakusha. It's another far uh, region from Far East. Mm. Only one, but they are really strong with the long hair, with the long uh, ear. Okay, can't wait to see those. Yeah, yeah. And, and what about the Russian public? We know there's mushers from, from Russia here, and, and obviously they're sunk into the lifestyle, but how about the people of Russia? Do they have an interest in mushing? Oh, yes. Uh, look at my Facebook page. I am not specialist in, in the mushing. I never mush by myself, maybe s- sometimes for, for fun, but not more. And I have a thousand, thousand questions about that. And I know that a lot of Russians are following for your guys, for your page. And, um, and on, the la- uh, on the start line, you, know, you saw a lot of people because we but we didn't announce too much about the race because we we were we only on on the first on the first line on the first stage of all of this sport but the people came and i probably today you will see a lot of youth over okay, there good. because the teachers came to us and asked can we come can we look can we ask marshals how to do it how to take care yeah. of the dogs it's a huge it's unbelievable event and the people are really interested in yeah, and it's it's been great since we've been here a little over 24 hours now. There is a huge interest and a huge need for knowledge. I know Dallas and Bruce spent time with all of the mushers, uh, mushers last night in like a symposium atmosphere. They were allowed to ask yeah, questions yeah. and they were there to answer it. So like there is a thirst and a hunger for information. It's obvious that the sport is growing here. Yes, and it's such important that uh, they have this kind of meeting with the, the uh, legends the stars and uh, believe me that the, the people around Russia they didn't trust me at first as soon as I told them that Dallas come comes and uh, um, Bruce. Bruce comes yeah. and uh, as soon as I put on my Facebook uh, the pictures Oh, they were so excited about it. Is it true? What are they doing there? <laughs> are they marching? I said, sorry, they are not marching. They, they will comment on the race, and they will probably they will teach the boys. Yeah. Over there. And everybody's happy. Believe me, it's, it's, yeah. it's like it's other world. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, just on a personal note, it's been fun to get to know Elena. She actually set up a house for us. And Olga is there, and her husband was actually there this morning cooking breakfast for us. The food's been uh, top shelf. The accommodations have been top shelf. And so we appreciate your hospitality. Oh, you are always welcome. I try to be helpful for you guys because I really like this game. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. This is Elena. Let's go back to the studio in Norway. What a great morning. Thanks, uh, Greg. And uh, Steiner, uh, you, w- you were there uh, at Volga Quest the very first year it was arranged in 2014. Was it the, uh, many people? Was it many mushers then? I'm sure it was more mushers than it is this year uh, in the long distance run because it, it started out as being a, a long distance race. And that year it went all the way from Togliatti, uh, follow the Volga River 
passed lots of cities and villages, and we ended up in uh, the Kazan. In Kazan, yes, in Tatarstan. Uh, so then it was a 650 kilometer race. Um, but uh, I can't remember exactly how many classes there, no, there but were. But it's uh, uh, less smashers today, and that's due to some weather conditions and the ice haven't been uh, well, thick enough? Well, yeah, we heard, heard reports that the ice on the Volga River hasn't frozen uh, yet, so are not good enough to make a trail there. That's why they use only use the National Park of Samarskaya Luka. But, uh, you know, there are two races in the Volga Quest. You have the mid-distance race, which was the first first three days, like a stage race. And those measures were quite, uh, there were more measures in that class than in the long distance class. So first you had the three first days with a mid distance race, a stage race, and those uh, measures finished at Monday. And then, then you had the long distance race, uh, measures continuing the race today after having a day off yesterday. So, in, but in the mid-distance class, there were more measures. I guess it was about 15 measures, maybe more 20 measures. But in the long-distance part, it's not so many right now because one measure did not actually pass the border. He was from Czechia, Jindra Zelenka. He was one of the favorites, actually. He had problems crossing the border from Czechia, the Czech Republic to, to Russia. And then we have uh, one measure with the uh, Greenland dogs, um, the measure Nosikov. He uh, had to qu scratch uh, due to his own uh, uh, wish to finish the race. His dogs were fine, though. Okay. So, so there are actually not many measures left in the long distance class, but they're sure going to have a, a race now when they start today. Mm, that's right. And uh, on site we have uh, Greg and Bruce, our reporters, and they will tell us more about what we can expect of this day. Okay, guys, welcome back. Uh, we're near the start line here, the Volga Quest 2020, Greg and Bruce. And what an exciting morning it is, Bruce. Another start of a sled dog race event. And so it's been the Bear Grease and then the Fairman in Norway. And now we're in Russia for the Volga Quest 2020. Yeah, it's uh, amazing how sled dog sports have just taken interest everywhere. And it's really neat for us to travel around and just see how mushers are very similar everywhere. Yeah. And everything is so similar, right? I mean, there's an army of volunteers. There's there's race farm founders that may, they're not even into mushing, but yet they have this vision and this dream for an event to help people uh, to take advantage of downtime in life and, and to do something worthy with it. And and this, this race is no different. A lot of great people that we've met, we've only been here for uh, 24 hours or so. And so uh, the anticipation is growing. Take us back to your early days in mushing and what it was like to get ready for your first early, early races. Well, that's a good question because that's what this culture and environment reminds me of early days of the quest and and like the people that the volunteers, like you were saying, that are were so instrumental in keeping the energy going for like Iditarod and all the races we could name, really. And it really was an the exciting thing about those times is the exchange of information. How do you feed your dogs? How how do you run this section of trail? How do you make that sled? And Dallas and I did a little question and answer thing here last night for the local mushers and handlers and. You know, that's what they wanted to know. What are you guys doing in Alaska? What's going on there? Just feeding, training puppies. Yeah. And and that was really the exciting thing more than just how you prepared for the race was the exchange of information and the building of a community. Yeah, and we talked a little bit earlier. We're going to see Malamutes. We're going to see Siberians. We're going to see Alaskan Huskies. A little uh, bummed out. We're, we're hoping to see some, some dogs from Greenland in, in a team that will not race today. But we've got still some of these dogs behind us, Bruce. So I know uh, you're a dog guy. So what do you see? I see, I see sled dogs. You see what? You just see dogs, yeah, actually. Yeah, well, that's true, right? Uh, I see <laughs> no, canines. But uh, I walked up through the dog yard yesterday when I first arrived here, and uh, there's a real separation of kennels that are the Alaskan Huskies, like these standing over on the right, are very typical what you'd see in any race in Canada or, or Alaska. And the bloodlines, when I talk to them, I ask, how did those bloodlines make it all the way to the middle of Russia like this? And they said some of them were Dee Dee John Rowe. They had bought dogs and had come through Norway, yeah. Mackie, uh, Jeff King was mentioned as another one where a lot of the Norwegian mushers bought dogs or got breedings and then 
these guys here in the middle of Russia had contact with the Norwegians. So those bloodlines that came out of the Alaska villages along the Yukon River are all the way here in the middle of, of Norway. And then Siberians are very popular here. A lot of the dogs that uh, were out here in the dog yard that I looked at yesterday were the purebred Siberian type. And that was typical in all of Europe not too long ago, 20 years ago. But it's recently the Alaskan breeds are kind of coming in here. Yeah, and we're going to, in the next uh, 48, 60 hours or so, we're going to run through a national park. We're going to run along the Volga River. If you're not familiar with that river, it's the longest river in Europe. I know there's a hope every year to, to run some of the, the trail, the race down on that river. But, uh, again, not enough ice down there to do that safely. So they've kind of had to bring it up into the, you know, uh, the forest areas of this part of Russia. But all this history around that river, I didn't realize... What a unique place that was to you, you get to come to an event like this and do some research. But one of the bloodiest battles in, in the history of the world uh, happened there at uh, the Battle of Stalingrad that is on uh, the Volga River uh, back in the days of Joseph Stalin and, and Adolf Hitler with Germany. Uh, it's, it's really a cultural river that connects East and West and, and Europe and Asia. And so many things have happened on that river. It's over 2,000 miles long. That's one of the great things that you and I get to do with these things is to learn all this history uh, that these dogs and, and teams get to travel through. Yeah, the Volga River is the largest river in Europe. And when you say connects East and West, you're not talking about like kind of New York to California. Right. It's Asia, yes. the trade routes with all of Europe, and yeah. this was the central part of that. And for people from Alaska or the Yukon and Canada wanting to know what this terrain is like, the Volga River out here is very much like the lower Yukon. It's that big. Yeah. And as I look around the landscape here, we could be standing in Dawson in the Yukon or we could be standing in Fairbanks. Uh, same type of rolling hills, not big mountains, but really big hills like outside of Fairbanks on the early part of the Yukon Quest are very much like uh, the Black Hills and areas, people that run the Quest, very much like around Dawson City. Uh, birch trees, pines, not spruce, but it's it's very much a northern environment that we're used to. Yeah, and a lot of hardwoods. We asked the questions this morning and what kind of trees we're looking at on these hillsides around there. You'll see them throughout the day as well, but oak trees. Oak trees, uh, yeah. And so I, I'm sure fall colors in this area have to be just spectacular in September and October. Yeah, so when they it, it's it's they're going to be running through the forest most of the day and and I talked to some of the mushers last night through our translator and about a third of this race early on is climbing hills and then it flattens out and then they return through that section coming back to the finish line. So it's a real mixed topography, but there is some pretty big hill climbing, they tell me, on the trail. Ladies and gentlemen, fans of sled dog racing all over the place, what an exciting morning it is. Greg and Bruce, we're in Russia for the start of the Volga Quest 2020. What a day it is. Let's go back to the studio. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Well, we learned a lot there, didn't we? Absolutely. And these guys, uh, Bruce and Greg, absolutely, they definitely had done some good research about the river and the, the route between Europe and Persia or Asia as well, and traveling on the Volga River. And I find it quite interesting. It has a cultural and a very interesting natural perspective as well, this race. Mm. Um, mm. How is the weather right now? Uh, is it very cold in this area, I don't think it is really cold just today or has been the last couple of days, but it, it, it's an interior part uh, of Russia, so it, it can drop really low. When I was there in uh, 14, it was uh, 40 degrees below. 40 degrees below, 40 and degrees that's below that. That equals says, in the in the Fahrenheit too. Yeah, exactly. So it was really really cold. So, so so they are very much used to to low temperatures, as as we are in America and Europe also. 
But Stein, I'm speaking of today, and Maria, I know uh, they are expecting about seven, mi minus seven, eight degrees uh, Celsius, okay. and a low of uh, minus 11 degrees Celsius. So it's not as cold as it was last weekend when they had about minus 20 degrees Celsius. It's actually getting a bit warmer. How has the mushing season been this year for you here in Norway? Uh, this year has been uh, really sad, actually. I live in an area with pretty much snow called Hadlan. Uh, this year, the last five Five, six weeks have been terrible, actually. We have very little snow, so... But I'm not competing this year, but I'd like to do some training runs on snow instead of gravel, so... I just hope for more snow. We still have a lot of winter to left, so... I'm sure it'll be more snow. Yeah, and it might be colder in Russia throughout these days as of the race as Absolutely. well. So, uh, our reporter, Karian, she is uh, in the starting area, Shereyevu, and she has some interviews. Over to you. I'm standing here at the start line with Arseny Belarusis, and he's the race marshal of the Volga Quest. And tell me, Arseny, how are things doing? Are you ready for the start now? Yes, we are ready. Thank you. And uh, the main thing is that our teams are ready. So uh, here is five teams. Uh, one team had scratched, but five teams are quite okay. And let's wait for the start. It's you already had three days of racing with a mid-distance race. Um, Everything went well during the first part of this Volga Quest uh, competition? Yes, everything went well, but uh, some teams uh, had to uh, drop some dogs. And uh, our leader, uh, he dropped, uh, he dropped, so to calculate, uh, 12 minus 7 is uh, oh, 5. I think dogs. So, <laughs> uh, so uh, he will start with seven dogs, okay. and uh, it's not uh, many for the distance. So let's wait for him. It's a lot of people participating, and it's it's a people's race. Tell me, um, how many volunteers, and how how do you manage to get this Volga cast together? Oh, that's a question maybe not for me, but for Svetlana Semyonova, our CEO. Uh, but uh, the people, they like the idea of the race and the spirit of the race. So uh, I think that the key point is this. Uh, the spirit, uh, the landscape of Samarska Luka, where the race is situated, the spirit of dog mushing and so on. And that's the key point for them. For today's for today's stage, uh, could you could you explain to us what's the biggest challenge for the for the racers uh, for the for the measures today? Uh, today, uh, the biggest challenge uh, is the difference on the trail condition. Uh, they will go uphill now, and then they go up hills and down hills, and then uh, a lot of uh, space, uh, open space, uh, and it could be windy, and it could be snowy uh, at night. Uh, so I think the weather condition is important and uh, it could be challenging. The Volga Quest usually takes place also on the Volga River. This year will be, was it a bit difficult to make it? Could you explain us a little bit why? Yeah, uh, this year is extremely hot uh, in Russia and uh, the ice, uh, it, uh, so we have no uh, good ice. Uh, on Volga, so we decided to make two laps here on Samarska Luka. Samarska Luka is a national park here. It's it's beautiful scenery around us. Yeah, it's very beautiful and interesting. And uh, uh, the other point is uh, the mushers could uh, face with uh, wild animals, uh, wild pigs and muses. Uh, so that's it. I will let you get ready for the start of the race and uh, thank you. We will uh, for sure catch up with you a little bit later during, during these three, up three up, up, upcoming days. Okay, thank you. Thank you and uh, back to you guys in Oslo. And Dallas, CV, he has taken a closer look at how they prepare ahead of the race. All right, we're up here by the starting line of the Vogel Quest. We're about to start the second half of the race where the long distance mushers are taking off. So they're getting their sleds all geared up here, laid out. The road going back to where the dogs are camped is a little bit rough. There's a lot of sharp rock and gravel. So the mushers are making sure that they're gonna have good uh, surface on the bottom of the sleds. 
And there's a couple different types of runners we're gonna see, like this sled right here. You actually see like a cross country ski on the bottom of it. Um, so again, they wanted to bring the sled up here where there's snow because there is gravel between here and where the dogs are camping. If you come around, you can see that there's another kind of spare ski sticking out the back of it. So as you're traveling along, if you go across a road crossing and there's a bunch of rock or gravel, it can shred the bottom of that runner or the plastic. And so it makes it much easier for the dogs to pull if you can stop real quick, put a new plastic on, or in this case, a whole new ski, and then continue down the trail. On this side, we can see that uh, the team over here has the harnesses already laid out. And there's eight harnesses laid out. I think that's a pretty good indication that they're gonna be taking off with eight dogs in that team. Um, now this other one, just the left, you see they got a two, four, six, eight, ten dog line out right there. So probably gonna have to see a few more dogs. Again, these teams started with 12 dogs, have gone halfway around the, the long distance trail. Now they're taking a break. They're gonna be leaving with a few less dogs. So different sleds, and it's fun for me to see different sleds and harnesses getting ready to rock and roll. See over here, they're starting to get uh, the booties put onto the dogs. Just do that last minute prep, um, getting the boots put on. And then they're just gonna transfer the dogs right over here and put them in the teams. So they're gonna be, uh, getting a little more exciting here as, as they get those boots on and the dogs know what's coming next. Now, uh, Nina, uh, there was cross-country skis uh, under the sled. Is that normal? Well, I did actually got, got to see it right, uh, right away, but um, uh, no, it's not. But in the sled, they have, uh, underneath the sled, there are runners and we have plastic uh, underneath the runners to make the sled glide. I don't know where if they have maybe um, some homemade equipment as well, but I'm pretty uh, surprised. They do have a lot of uh, well, uh, good equipment here. I mean, this is Russia. I don't know how easily they will could buy uh, sled dog equipment from other countries, uh, but uh, they do have good equipment here. Yes, Steinar, what did you notice when you were there? About the equipment and the sleds and how they... Uh, do they have cross-country skis on, uh, under the sled? Yes, we saw that one example of that. Uh, it looked to me like a sprint, sprint sled of a kind, so it's, it's not a typical long-distance sled, I can tell. But uh, Russians are extremely self-sufficient with all kinds of goods, uh, with sports equipment and everything. Uh, but I thought it was atomic skis actually on this this sled. So uh, of course they buy they buy uh, gear from all over the world. Uh, so. But you know, Maria, what is standard, What is interesting is that when you go long distance racing in Europe or in uh, Alaska or Canada, you will have like a more typical long distance sled which has good space enough to to carry a dog or two if you need to have dogs in your sled and equipment and. Some, a lot of them measure in the long distance races, like I did trot, Finnmark race, families, you can go, will have a trailer after the sled where you can carry more stuff you need. What we see here is that they actually use sprint sleds and they have a trailer after. And uh, our reporters, Greg and Bruce, has looked even more on the uh, taking a look at the equipment and they also talked to some of the measures prior to the race. Hi guys and welcome back Greg and Bruce we're near the start line pack uh, in the holding area really where the dogs have spent the last 24 hours resting and Bruce just wanted to take a chance or an opportunity and kind of show everybody uh, some equipment Bruce come on over here with the camera and here here's a, a dog truck now smaller than what we're used to in Alaska but the same concept yeah a lot of I'm actually surprised that for being an isolated community from the the uh, larger mushroom world in Norway and Alaska. These guys have studied their equipment. Smaller dog trucks because they don't bring, bring as dogs. many dogs to these events, but the equipment is really top-notch, which has surprised me. They've studied a lot of the designs, like from Iditarod. Above us here is a sit-down sled, and they've got really good snow hooks and equipment. Uh, more a sprint-type sled yeah. than you would find in longer races, but very much compatible to in uh, basic design to what you would find in Iditarod. And we're seeing uh, a change of different types of plastic here and runners. And so uh, obviously whoever this musher is has spent some time researching and, and finding knowledge to be competitive. Yeah, uh, they've got the, the quick change plastic setups with the dovetail and even a, 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 a traditional wooden sled like yeah. is on that dog truck over there. 
they still have the rails on there to put on the, the quick change plastic. And that sled is very traditional, even in Alaska's interior village. It's what in the early days people called a beaver sled, which was for going out on the trap line for like two to three days. It's got the typical mortise and tendon and okay. tied. Yeah, yeah. Instead of bolts, it's tied. And uh, it's a design anybody that's run dogs in interior Alaska would be very, very familiar with in the bush. Yeah, and again, we got this box, and, and I know you talked about the sit-down sled, but what do you think they're carrying in there for a race this length, and, and is there anything specific in there? I really don't know, to be honest, other than it's just, you know, it is a place to sit down. And again, the important thing is it's putting the musher standing closer to the center of, yeah. of the actual... Uh, of the runners versus being out on the tail and they carry some of their supplies. Well, th there's a lot of mandatory gear to be carried in this race. And part of it is a lot of food for the dogs and the mushers. So that's there available uh, as they uh, go to their checkpoints. There is mandatory layover. So they've got their supplies. Yeah. And... Elena, come on over. And I see uh, somebody's going to be doing some ski polling up there too. Hi, <laughs> Elena, come the on over. Who, who, who is this? And Elena's going to help translate with us this morning. Just a we're just we're kind of so how, give us his name. Uh, Slava Demchenko. Oh, did you, okay. So we know you. So you're you're one of the contenders. Yes. He's yeah. the famous one. He's the famous one. Yes. Okay. And so tell us tell us uh, why he's famous. Why he's famous? Because actually, probably he had more experience uh, um, than anybody's in Russia. He uh, went through the huge race in Russia in the Far East at Berinje. Yeah. He did win it. So actually, this is as a result. Oh, this right. truck. Okay. <laughs> yes. Right. And. Uh, as I know, Slava is so popular because he tried to um, to give his experience to the people around him. So he's very friendly. He's o very open for uh, Martian society in Russia. Very good. So can you ask him about his dogs? We want to know about his dogs. Where do they come from, the genetics? Are they fast? Can they win? Okay, I will ask. Slava спрашивает, я тебе дифирамбу сначала, так сказать, напела, а теперь они спрашивают, расскажи, пожалуйста, о своих собаках, какие крови, сколько им лет. У меня, у меня собаки э, из Норвегии, Швеции, Финляндии в основном все. Аляскинские хаски. Э, им э, от трех до пяти лет. Все молодые собаки. So his dogs are coming from Norway, from Finland and Swiss. Uh, and some Alaskan husky. And they are from the age it's from two uh, old, two years old till, сколько еще, до какого? Three, Three and five years old. Okay. Well, does he expect to win? Ты, надеюсь, собираешься выиграть? Ну, я буду стараться. He will try. <laughs> <laughs> well, tell him that he's got a beautiful country. We appreciate him having us here. And I think Bruce has a question, too. Сначала он говорит о том, что они влюблены в Россию, и твоя страна им очень нравится. Отлично. Мне тоже нравится моя страна. Like my Russia also. Мне тоже нравится. And I like also American. Нарт я делал по фотографиям американских нарт. Okay, he did, uh, uh, he did do, he did made this sled by himself. And uh, uh, he took a picture of some American sleds and he did it by himself. That's impressive, yeah, isn't it, yeah. Bruce? And ask him then... To get the parts, like the runners, did he order those, or where did he get the parts to make it? Где ты заказывал или брал части, запчасти вот для этого всего? У нас в обычных магазинах, кроме лыж, лыжи лыжи делают в Новосибирске у нас, тоже по образцу американских лыж. So everything you can find in a regular market, everything except uh, ski. The runner. Yeah. The runner, yeah. So the runner he did find in Novosibirsk, but it's they made it special under the American um, drawings. Okay, can you ask him whose American sled that he looked at to, to mimic? Очень важно, на чьи нарты ты срисовал из американцев? Ой, я с разных. Dallas CC. Я видел, как он, как он у него нарта, я там некоторые части его использовал. So some details да. he did Martin, find from CV. Мартин Бузер. Мартин Бузер. Вот и Ланс Маккейн, 
and also Lance. Ну и Тим, Тим Уайт еще там подсказывал некоторые детали. And also he contact with Tim White. Ah, Tim right. White from Minnesota, Tim White from Minnesota, who first invented a lot of the quick change yeah. plastics and ones that are uh, suited to different temperatures of snow. Yeah. Tim really helped with early Iditarod sled designs, yeah. so that's that's good. Yeah, yeah so Tim like, White. Plastic yeah. на лыжи я сам вырезал. Вот эти вот лодцы чинхоса одеваются, чтобы ну крепление специально. And, uh, but for these sleds, he he cut by himself everything. He he got only like a big big stuff, and for the form, for the um, for the size, he did it by himself. He Fantastic. Cut. Yes. So Tim White and, and 12 uh, I did our championships. Yeah, sorry, it's, it's it starts where it's race yeah. time. Good uh, luck to you. Спасибо, <laughs> спасибо. <laughs> good luck, good luck, good luck. Okay, well, very interesting, and uh, boy, it's a it's a good morning. It feels like a race start, doesn't it? Yeah, I like this time. Actually, I like it more than finish line <laughs> because the people around they are so exciting. The dogs are singing the songs, and you have some kind of Norwegian rush also. <laughs> okay, guys, let'll do it for now. Let's send it back to the studio in Norway. A lot more to come today. And uh, that was Vyacheslav Demchenko. How big is he in uh, Russia, Steinar? Um, <laughs> he, I'm uh, not from... actually sure, but he, he is he's a, a known name. Uh, I have seen him several times. He is always smiling. He is happy. Uh, and uh, people are enjoying his company. But, um, but there are not that many races going on. I, I think maybe he he started as a as a sprint musher somewhere, and I as far as I remember he 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 lives in Moscow. I think he used to be a lawyer. I don't know if he has stopped doing that kind of work and has developed into a more or less professional musher. I'm not sure about that. Uh, great guy. Sore thing about that, and that is the reality about uh, having races in Russia. We have this problem communicating when when we from American. Europe go to Russia, we have difficulties, both with the letters and also yeah. the language in general. We need yes. translators all the time. Yeah, that's yeah right. because he speaks only Russian. Exactly. Uh, Demchenko is uh, actually the, uh, the, uh, the winner of the last year's uh, Beringia race, which is uh, 621 miles or 1,000 kilometers. And uh, he won last year. And uh, as far as I know, he'll do the Beringia race in, uh, in two weeks' time. And that's a stage race, though. So, and it goes on the, island, uh, the, the peninsula of uh, Kamchatka. And he's going to go there first of March to start and the finish will be about 15th of March. So uh, he's the, uh, the last year's winner of the Bringa race as well and he has a lot of experience from different races. Yes, because he participated in last year's Volga Quest as well, didn't he? Yes, he did actually. Um, he came uh, in second. Uh, really? I, I think uh, he's uh, he's the one to look for now in this race as well. He still has 11 dogs. He's on, in second position at the moment. I believe he'll be one of the people able to win the race. Mm, and he actually made his sled himself. That's pretty amazing. Well, you do find that in Norway or in other European countries as well, that people want to make their own sleds. Okay, so, uh, but it's nice to know because then uh, he tells where he got all the, the, the different parts to the sled. He got everything from uh, uh, buying in Russia and he got the runners special made for him. Uh, well, I, I mean, this guy seems like a really dedicated musher. And, yeah, I, I, and to me, he seems like kind of Robert Surly to the Russian uh, machine community that, as uh, Robert Surly is to the Norwegian machine community. He seems like a really nice guy. He's eager to help everybody else and to teach machine to more people. So Demchenko and Robert Surly have more the same attitude, I feel. And I think he will do very good in the race because as far as I could remember from what he said in the interview, he, he had bought his dogs from Scandinavia. So I think that calls for that he will do, uh, do well in the race. <laughs> you <Okay>. think so? <laughs> yes, uh, I think so too. Well, of course, he needs to do the right training and feeding program as well, of course. But he's got pretty good bloodlines, I, I would believe. So. Yeah. It will be very exciting to see uh, Demchenko later in uh, the yeah. race today. And uh, uh, Dallas Seavey, he uh, will bring us a weather report. All right, the teams are going to be taken off here in just a few minutes from 
uh, Shirayevo heading for Carmeli. And uh, looking at the trail, it's going to be a, a decent trail, at least here. Um, you know, we've got kind of a little bit of a coarse surface on it. The snow has been uh, thawed a little bit and then refrozen. So it's a little bit abrasive. And that can kind of hook on the runners a little bit. It's going to be something that you're definitely going to want to keep the booties on the dog's feet. But it's really hard packed, at least right here. So with that solid surface, the dogs are going to have good traction. And they're really going to be able to drive down the trail. So I think this looks like a decent trail. We do have a bit of a breeze right now. And it's about 7 below Celsius. And that's about 19, almost 20 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is an optimal temperatures for the dogs. Got a little bit of a breeze out here. That's going to help keep it cool. So even if the temperature rises throughout the day, it's going to keep it cool for the dogs having a little bit of a crosswind. So that's nice. Also with the snow the way that it is, where it's been thawed and refrozen, it's not that light dry snow that the wind is going to drift or fill in the trail. So I think these guys are queued up for a really nice trail from here over to Carmeli. Did that look like a yeah, nice trail to you, Nina? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would uh, uh, for sure like to have a training run or race. Yeah, absolutely. If you got the chance to do a race in Russia, would you try it? If I could <laughs> be able to go without problems crossing the border and take my own dogs. You know, for me, it's about my own dogs. So I would like to bring my own dogs to go and to, to do uh, competitions. So yeah, it's always interesting to learn and see new places and new cultures. Mm. And uh, you, Stein, and I were a veterinarian there. Mm. Were there many foreign veterinarians from, uh, from the outside borders? No, yeah. it, was, it was only me that was there as a foreigner. Uh, and uh, besides that, it was local Russian veterinarians. And uh, f for me there, uh, it was inter interesting to see how how they were doing their uh, races, and the veterinary team were also uh, very interested in knowing more about how to be a vet, a trail vet on dog races. So uh, there are um, a, a building interest f for uh, sled dog mushing in general in Russia. And that comes to the organizers, uh, the sponsors, um, the public, uh, the veterinarians and uh, everyone. And ac according to what you talked about, eventually going to Russia, it was, it was not a problem with border crossing with big trailers full of uh, dogs from outside Russia. That went very well the year in 2014. So uh, if that is the reality for the future, the, the, the issue with border crossing with, with the dogs shouldn't be a problem, I think. No, you know, Maria, I, think, I believe it's uh, very good if you can see more foreign mushers in the Russian races, because then the knowledge of the Russian measures and the, 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 the knowledge for the uh, veterinarians will uh, increase because for sure they know how to mush, they know how to do uh, to take care of their dogs, but they do need more knowledge on how to train for long distance. I think we could mm. uh, get more information out and help. They, and also you as a veterinarian can bring that information to the uh, Russian veterinarians. Mm -hmm. I think that will gain and help increase uh, the, the um, knowledge of the sport, actually. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that is uh, also the reason why, why the founders and organizers and initiative takers for, for World Quest, especially uh, Svetlana Samonova and, and her husband, Sergei. She's the founder. Yeah, she's the founder yeah. of the race. The, first, the way I look at it, she's, she's the race marshal and the one I have been in contact with. Uh, they really had the, um, this idea to put, to put the word international sled dog race in, in front of Volga Quest because they really would like to... Uh, to attend more uh, uh, publicity from from uh, mushers from abroad. Yes, and uh, our Americans, uh, Greg and Bruce, are in Russia, and they've talked to some of the dogs prior to the race. 
Okay, guys, welcome back. Greg and Bruce, we're near the start line here, the Volga Quest 2020. I just like saying that. And uh, the teams behind us are getting ready. Let's go over. This is M Mikel Fativ uh, wearing bib number 15, and I believe he's going to be the first to leave. But, Bruce, let's first talk about the dogs. What do you see here? Uh, some hound bred into these, Alaskan Husky types. But this is one of the houndier teams I've seen here, which was originally... Hound being bred into Alaskan Huskies was something I originally heard of from European mushers that ran more sprint type races. So hound, explain that to what people know, like that's a broad term. <clears throat> yeah, like English pointers, German short hairs, yeah. and then crossing it with the Huskies and typically you see the more pointed ears, a little lighter coat for nothing like you would find, say, in Kamchatka or northern Alaska because those dogs typically were running in a, you know, warmer environment but the dogs all pretty much in booties to protect their feet uh very similar to what you'd find staging in a in a race anywhere in interior alaska and anything different about the the tow lines or the harnesses pretty much the same and as the other mushers we talked to said they they took pictures they got on the internet they looked at stuff the mushers here i'm talking about as the overall community and have learned a lot of the the same techniques and ways of caring for dogs. I don't see anything that different with the tug lines and stuff like that, including they have a bungee in front of the sled to help uh, absorb impact. Let's go down and look at Mikhail's sled here and see if you see anything that's different. And we have another team uh, getting ready. They're gonna go out of here every two minutes. Should be fun, but um, let's take a look at his sled. He, he's got a, a ski out here. What are we looking at here? I'm not yeah, really sure what ski, what the extra for. skis for, but the runners really are more like a cross country ski than a runner like sprinters might have than you would find on the Yukon yeah, Quest so or the Iditarod. They're very thin, and uh, is that just possibly an extra ski in case he breaks one? He can change it out. Right? Possibly that's exactly why he has that yeah. along because these are very thin and they're very much like a cross country ski, which sprinters like in the. The fur rendezvous might have that type of sled that he's running, whereas some of the other sleds are uh, much more Iditarod style. Yeah, and it's interesting for me because although this isn't a hugely long race, 450 kilometers, these are sleds that are not designed to carry a whole lot. No, especially this one here. Yeah, if you have to load a dog and your mandatory gear, that's pretty minimal sled compared to some of the ones that we'll see later on going out here, like a sit-down sled. Yeah, and you have to assume if he's carrying an extra cross-country ski with him that we see here, he fully expects there's a real possibility that he's going to break one. Well, if the camera here at some point zooms down and see how thin the, the tail of this runner is, that might be typically used in a sprint race, like I was saying, but to be out in rough mountainous terrain like yeah. we're going to see here, uh, very similar to the Yukon Quest, you're kind of vulnerable. So this is Mikhail Fatib here. Slava, who we heard from earlier, uh, wearing bib number 25, just uh, the next team over. And so we've got one, two, three, four. We've got four of the five teams up here at the line uh, getting ready to go. And, and I just would imagine, like, there's some anxiety. Some of these guys are pretty experienced in running these races, I know, but... Uh, others have there's got to be some anxiety and nervousness and uh, they are going to be gone for a couple of days well this is a long race for here so yeah. that's where the anxiety would be is that where most of their races are much shorter like a few hours this actually becomes an endurance event but it's pretty cool it's they've got banners yeah, here in the starting it. shoot yeah. uh, it's with the sponsor names it's something that any musher or handler were, uh, people involved in racing anywhere in Canada or Alaska or Norway would be familiar with the whole scene of dogs barking and getting ready to go and the banners up. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see how these guys handle a longer race because actually for here, this is a very long race. And I know Bruce, for a guy like you who loves the history and the culture and the heritage and the tradition of these sled dog events and these sled dogs, and here we are halfway around the world from something that, that you have uh, been a part of for all those decades, and of course me with the Iditarod, to be here in the, the great country of Russia watching a sled, it's just a great morning. Like, it, it kind of gets me all fired up. Yeah, and 
another aspect I was thinking about as you were saying that is, again, we go back to what's been learned about dog care and sports medicine and, and feeding of dogs in general that's been learned through Iditarod and these other races has influenced the dog care and the breeding of these dogs clear over here, which once again goes to show this is a very positive thing for yeah. dogs and maintaining these bloodlines and a working dog environment where the dogs, obviously, by the bark and behind us, they just want to get going. Yeah, and it's also interesting uh, when you consider that uh, how the walls, the, the borders have, have come down in a physical sense and certainly in a symbolic sense in this country of Russia that has allowed the ideas, the information, and uh, mushing. Uh, to gravitate and find its way here. So, ladies and gentlemen, we'll take another break. Let's send it back to the studio there in Oslo. We are getting ready for the start of the Volga Quest 2020. That's true. And uh, even though it's five measures competing, uh, do you think we will get much competition and an exciting race? Well, the leader of the race, uh, Mikhail Fatiev, he is a hard one. He is a really has a really competitive mind. Uh, we will for sure, although he's only got seven dice at the moment, uh, we will for sure uh, see a measure who's going to have speed, maybe a bit too much. I'm. We have to be care uh, to to wait and see, but he might have a maybe start too fast, I don't know. We'll also see uh, Demchenko as one of the favorites uh, running behind, and I'm sure we'll have contact between the two pretty soon. Actually, I think so. Yes, and uh, there is one tech point, right? Uh, yeah. Do you think uh, six hours is enough rest for 215 kilometers? Yes, I absolutely do. Uh, we, uh, we see a lot of that in uh, the European races, Norwegian races, or the Yukon Quest, uh, Detroit, that it's not a problem to go 215 kilometers nonstop without resting. If you have a dog, trained dog team, that's not a problem. I've done that myself. Just snacking and, and changing booties on trail, but going nonstop. But here, they'll have six hour mandatory rest in between those 215 kilometers. And those six hours need to be taken at Carmelie 1 or Carmelie 2. It'll be interesting to see where they take it. Because they go in a loop. They go in a loop all the way out to Oslada on the west side of the Samarskaya Luka and then back to Karmali again. Uh, but, and they can choose if they want to use the six hour mandatory rest at Carmelie 1 or Carmelie 2. But we might also see that uh, some of these measures might rest a little bit along the trail. But they, as long as they rest more than five minutes, they have to get off the trail. They are not allowed to stay in the trail for more than five minutes. And it's also very uh, strict that they don't leave any dog food when they are snacking. They are not supposed to leave any dog food at all on the trail. Because it can distract the other yeah, dogs coming. Absolutely. And we do have uh, some of the similar rules in Norway as well. But here you can rest on trail from up to five minutes. If you want to rest more than five minutes, you have to move out of the trail. We'll see how they do. Yes, yeah. it will be very interesting. And uh, Greg and Bruce, they are checking the atmosphere right before the start. Welcome back. Just a quick little hit. We saw a bunch of school children. It's a holiday. They're here. This has got to make you feel good that the fans are coming out. Uh, actually, it's a really, it's a holiday for the pupils. But uh, the uh, friends of us, she's the director of the school. She have a co phone calls a couple of minutes ago, and she said, "Are we able to bring the pupils, the kids?" Yeah. And we said, "Of course, of course." And you look, there is two buses came to yeah. just to share the people, to yeah. share our teams. Yeah. It's it's very it's it's impressive yeah. me. It just the people really interested in, and they, as you know, the kids love love the yeah. dogs. And, and Odd, our, our camera guy, if you pan over to the right, you can see one of the school buses over there. And I get a kick out of it because it, it seems like the color yellow is universal for a school bus. Yep, yeah, it's, right? a, it's an international, like, international, it's an color, international yeah. color. And all the children, they're, they're lined out down here, down uh, the start line with all these banners. Prideful morning, I bet, for you. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I need to tell you, yes. Yeah. And actually, it's a little bit early for them for their holidays, but they wake up and they came. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's send it back to the set. We're moments away from the start of the Volga Quest 2020. <laughs> and uh, Dallas Sivi, he uh, will, let, uh, will guide us through the start of this race. Yeah. 
All right, first in the shoot, we have Mikhail Feyetev. Um, Bidmer 15, he's got a nice looking team, a uh, little bit more subdued. These guys came in with the fastest time after the first half of the race. Uh, so he has a seven dog team, which is a smaller lineup. And so that speed early on in this race in the first half may end up being a, a real challenge for him when it comes to finishing the trail in the second half here. Uh, they've got the booties on and they're taking off a steady pace, but uh, a little more subdued. And there goes Mikhail Feyetev uh, um, out of the chute. Once they get a little past the people, you see them cruising along here. But there's a little bit smaller team, a uh, fairly steady pace. I wouldn't say this is a, a crazy driving team at this point. Uh, gotta, gotta untangle somebody here. <laughs> it's the problem when you start getting a little bit of slack in the lines, it makes it easy for dogs to step over and get on the wrong side of it. But he's gonna get them sorted out, get them on the right side of the lines there. Make sure nobody's got a, a leg over anything they shouldn't. And the lead dogs are up there holding them nicely. <laughs> nicely lined out, which is what you want to have a dog team that has leaders holding the team strung out, everybody behaving themselves. Have a little challenge getting the, the lines in the right spot here. All right. Got him untangled. He's gonna pull the snow hook there, and they take off again at a, a steady little clip. A couple of the guys in the back trying to hit a lope. Uh, the front guys seeming like they're they're content with the speed that they're going right now. So I uh, think we're gonna see these guys at a much slower pace than they were doing the first half. Probably hit it a little too aggressive on the first half if you're thinking of it as a long distance race. Here's second in the starting shoot. We have Slav Dominchko, um, in number 25. Now he's got a nice looking lineup here. I'm seeing, uh, I think we got 11 dogs in this team. And right now they're all calm and standing here, which is nice to see. But as they were pulling up to the starting shoot, they had a lot of zip to them. So I think this is a team that's gonna have a very nice traveling speed, a lot of zip on the trail. They seem like they've got good horsepower. So. I'm excited to see how these guys kind of develop. It seems like a little more of a steady long distance team than, uh, than uh, Feyetev who just saw leave the start line. So there we go, he pulls the hook and that's what I'm talking about. These guys have some zip, there's some snap to this dog team. I'm much happier with the looks of this team leaving the starting line here with a lot of energy and enthusiasm. You see the dovetail coming off the back of the sled as he's standing on the brake, trying to keep them slowed down to this speed. Um, here's a nice shot where they're stretching out a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's a nice looking dog team. They'll get loosened up and rolling here, but that's, uh, that's more like what I like to see taken off with uh, 200 plus kilometers to go. You wanna see a, a solid, strong looking dog team, 11 dogs, you know, a little bit heavier sled, a little more of a distance mindset here when I'm looking at this team. And that was Slav Dominchko taking off uh, from the start line. Here we're back to the, the shoot. We have Arsini. Um, he was one of the faster uh, times on this last section, or one of the, I shouldn't say faster, one of the better looking teams finishing the last section of the race. And I think it shows here as well. We got a lot of wagon tails. I think he's sitting in a very good position, leaving for the second half of this race in third position right now. Uh, he's got a little bit of a time to make up on the teams ahead of him. However, he's got a nice looking gang of dogs and I think that's by far the most important thing. And there's plenty of trail left to catch up with the teams ahead. So I think uh, we saw Dominchko take off just a minute ago. This is Arsini. I think this, this team's a really solid team. I think this is uh, a very strong candidate. It is last year's champion from this race. You can see he's standing on the sled, just patiently waiting for them to count down his time. Bunch of happy waggy tails. Got booties on all the feet there. This is a nice looking lineup. Lead dogs are ready to get out there. They keep looking up at the person wondering, uh, can we go yet? Can we go yet? The dogs can't quite tell time. They don't hear the people counting down. All they know is uh, the cues from their musher. I can see the handler steps back. There they go. A nice lineup of dogs charging out of the chute. Again, this is another really nice looking team. And this is Arsini taking off here. Yeah, that, these guys are attacking the trail. If anything, uh, you know, there still is 200 plus kilometers. You don't want to be, be careful about letting them go too fast early on. You know, no foot on the brake at this point. I'm gonna guess that he's gonna slow him down pretty quick here once he gets past the people and the cameras. Um, it's always nice to have a, a fast looking dog team take off, but 
Yeah, there he's, uh, he just shifted his heel over onto the track there, but he'll probably be getting them slowed down because you got to be cognizant. You've got a lot of miles left to go. you got to take it easy, um, but it's nice to see a high-powered, strong team taking off from here. So that was uh, Arsini taking off right there. Next up into the chute, we have Yuri um, having a little bit of trouble getting the right combination. Uh, has a smaller team. I think we've got eight dogs in that team. And, uh, would, I mean, he started with a 12-dog team early on. After the first half, decided to leave some dogs behind. Um, and we may have seen that after having run a little bit, you know, harder pace relative to the team's ability. Of course, he's behind the teams ahead of him right now. Um, but it's always a relative thing. So if you, we say that the team's running too fast or too hard, that doesn't necessarily mean relative to the other mushers. It's relative to your dog's ability. Um, but we see a little bit smaller team leaving here. And as I see these guys having a little bit more of a challenge figuring out uh, the right combination, I start thinking that the dogs that got left behind may have been very key lead dogs. So here we see the handler trying to lead the team up into the starting chute. The dogs seem energetic. We've got waggy tails and barking dogs. That's a good sign. Um, but it seems a little, there we go, a little disorganized. The lead dog on the one side is hesitant. There's a lot of people standing around the, around the starting line and not quite certain about running through a crowd of people. So that can be a, a real challenge, especially, like I said, if the, the dogs that were left out of the team were the uh, you know, experienced lead dogs, Trying to find a good combination can be a challenge, and just the whole team, they seem like they're having fun, but not real business-like. <laughs> um, so we're gonna need to find a combination that works and uh, to direct these guys out on the trail. So it looks like he's gonna try to, try to take off, oh, better stop there. There we go, get it situated. That's, uh, I think he's trying to get out on the trail where this dog feels a little more comfortable away from people um, to then you know, sort it out once he's past the crowds because it seems like these dogs are more than a little distracted by, by the people. They want to stop and play with the kids here. Some of them are excited to go, but it's, it's a matter of all of them deciding to go at the same time. Right now, it looks like half of them are excited to visit the people. The other half are excited to go and then then it switches. <laughs> the ones that were ready to go are ready to visit, and then uh, vice versa. So he's getting the dog loaded in the sled. Um, gonna take off, get past the people and all the crowds, and then you know, get the dog back on. Now coming up behind him here, we have Alexi Dudkin with a team of Siberian Huskies. Um, his starting time is coming right up because uh, Yuri was supposed to have been gone right now, and they're starting just two minute intervals. So Alexi's coming up into the, the starting slot here because um, his starting time is coming up. And if, if Yuri misses his time, then he's just going to have to go at the end of the race. But with only five mushers, the end of the race is right now. He is, you know, not going to have to wait too long. So here we have two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven Siberian Huskies passing them in the chute. They're pulled up alongside. I think we're going to see Alexi take off next here, and Yuri's going to have to wait till Alexi's on the trail, and then he'll be allowed to take off. So, bib number two there. That's uh, Alexi Dudkin taking off for the Siberians. That was a nice-looking team. I mean, these uh, Siberians, I think, are going to hold a little bit steadier of a pace. Over the last few weekends here, we've seen some Siberian teams do really well in some of these mid-distance races. Um, you know, in the five to 650-kilometer distance, we've seen some Siberians do quite well. Uh, these guys seem at a more, I would say, more normal pace for the show Siberians as they're just kind of chugging along, going to the bathroom, being a little more casual. But that's one of the great things about Siberians is they are very good traveling dogs. They take it easy, they're not going to run too hard, and they, they have fun out there. So here we're back over to Yuri. Um, so we got past the people here. Just, uh, I mean, maybe 100 yards, not even, uh, just a few Thank meters past the, the end of the people there. And put the other lead dog back up now that he doesn't have to be concerned about running through a crowd. Gets everything zipped up. Pulls the hook. Uh, <laughs> this is where having a good lead dog can save you a lot of time and headache um, as you try to get the right combination down. It is, it is tricky, and these guys, you know, they just seem a little bit distracted. 
Um, they all seem happy, which is, is a very good thing, but nobody really seems to be uh, in charge, let's put it that way. So, you know, having one good lead dog that kind of takes charge of it and says, all right, guys, we're going this way, and, and charges down the trail, sets the tempo for the whole team, whereas uh, if everybody's just kind of wiggly and happy and having fun and nobody's going to be kind of telling the rest what to do, it can be a challenge. I, I would guess that as you know, he had 12 dogs and left behind four after the first half of the race, um, this is where it's important that you set the right tempo for those key lead dogs. They've got to be there when you need them um, or else it's going to be a long ways because he's past the people here, but there's going to be another checkpoint in 80 kilometers and you're going to have another town and more people. After they rest, they're going to have to take off past people again. So it's important that these dogs are accustomed to running in all conditions. Uh, here they go. Uh, the, the black lead dog he has up there is getting a little talking to from the white one next to him. Um, he's cruising out of here now. These guys are flying down the trail now that they got past the distractions of the people. So he's moving well, but that is going to be difficult if it's going to be a 10-minute process to go by a crowd. And that's just going to be a matter of training and I think it's important to use these races as a training experience um, to see what you need to improve. And I would be willing to bet next year he's going to be spending a little more time, you know, getting the dogs used to running through a crowd and not always stopping to play with the people. But it's time to travel past the past the folks and just, you know, continue to develop the dog team. And that was Yuri that we just saw taken off there, and he is on the trail after uh, having a little trouble getting down the starting chute with the crowds. Now, Nina, what do you think about the start? Well, we did see some problems with two of the teams here, like the last one here, Goriano. He had surely had problems with one of his lead dogs. Uh, he d the dog did not, did not want to go out of the chute. What we see is, uh, wow, this is fast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you mean? Well, this is right now because Chirimin is gone in the lead before Fachev. Uh, we have Demchenko, uh, Goriano, and uh, Dotkin at the last uh, position, going on their way to the uh, checkpoint of Karmali. Uh, that's where they can stop six hours if they like, or they can stop at Karmali the next time they come to Karmali. Mm -hmm. So what we see is that Chirimin has become in the lead before Fachev and uh, Demchenko. So Chirimin is in the, uh, is doing the best race so far, and he he has. Uh, a team of 10 dogs and he's last year's winner and um, he'll sure make uh, be doing a good race now I'm sure he wants to uh, yes win. what do you think uh, Steiner about Thierry uh, I think he will do a good race he is the younger of the <laughs> the mushers here uh, he has won uh, Volga Quest uh, several times uh, he comes from a family that uh, lives from mushing dogs. His father also is a, a non-musher in Russia. Uh, I think he, uh, he will do good. Uh, he enjoys what he's doing and uh, I think he would be one of the favorites. And Nina, they're yeah. really packed here. Yeah, that's what I was uh, noticing. They are traveling together and then you have Dudkin uh, a little bit behind and Dudkin is uh, racing the Siberian uh, Husky teams. Uh, just, and those other teams are uh, Alaskan Huskies with some hound in them as well. And they do travel uh, quite uh, tight together. And right now we see that Fatiev is um, losing speed. He has the most hounded dog team here. And we saw that at the end here now, he was losing team, uh, speed actually. And I remember he always only has seven dogs. But you, uh, you know, I have to also say one thing. We saw that uh, bib number 12, Guriano, he had to take one of his lead dogs into the sled at the starting line. And uh, what happened here was, yes, here we have a picture, pictures from the, from the, from trail, the trail and we Mika will see Fatiev. Fatiev. Yeah. Uh, he has the most hounded dog team. He's got seven dogs. And now you see, this is a good speed we see here. The question is if he's able to keep that speed for the whole race, the whole last days of the race. Well, he has dropped five dogs already. And it, he might not, he should not go too fast if you want to um, keep all the dogs going to the finish line. He has to take, uh, make sure he treats our um, races in a way that uh, he'll have enough dogs to cross the finish line. And he's done the seven dogs already.
So it would be smart to save a little bit of the forces in the team. Yeah, I think uh, his uh, <laughs> problem or um, his challenge, uh, that's a good, better word, his challenge is not to go not too fast. He needs to speed, to, to, to lower his speed, I would say, if he wants to f and keep the, the next line. Next up is Vyacheslav Demchenko. Yeah. That's uh, with their, uh, Robert Serle, guy of the Volga Quest race, as we were talking about. A really nice guy, always smiling. Unfortunately, not very uh, familiar with English, but he's, uh, he's a positive guy. And he's got a nice team of uh, 11 dogs, um, Alaskan Huskies. And those dogs had a lot of energy at the starting line. So they were well rested and, you know, look, uh, th that's a nice, nice looking team with smiles on their face and no tails wagging. And uh, Demchenko himself has made his own sled and he's made a sit down sled, which is very common in long distance racing. And then we have another team coming up, and that's Arseni Tjuryomin, last year's winner. This is a young guy, and uh, Stana, you know him, and you told me that he wants to do more races outside of Russia too. So this guy has big ambitions. Uh, I, that, that's my impression. Yeah. He, uh, he speaks English, he's... Uh, he's young. He's, he's, he's the younger one. He, uh, he's got a, a team of 10 dogs, and that's a nice speed. Well, those, those are nice trails and nice pictures from the trail. I, Looks I, like uh, some part of the Finnmark race going from uh, Tana to Naiden in the Finnmark race. It's quite the same nat nature. As, as far as I re recall, Arseni, he also signed up for Femmes Löpe one year. Yeah. But uh, for some reason, he didn't make it. So he, he is one that really would like to go uh, outside Russian borders also with, with his dogs to compete. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria, we have another team here. Stana, this is uh, Alexei Dudkin with his uh, Siberian Husky team, a pure breed uh, dog team. They might be a bit slower and they uh, probably like a colder weather. But that's a nice team, and he's got the bigger, uh, as long as, as well as Demchenko, he's got a big team of 11 dogs. And these dogs have a very nice traveling speed. So although some of the ones in the front go fast, they might lose speed, while this team will probably keep an even speed throughout the race. So I believe um, he'll be able to climb on the result list, I would believe. Well, there's one dog here. Oh, they have a little one. bit oh, here's trouble, trouble with, with, this, this one with pooping here. Pooping problems. <laughs> but, hey, uh, but now the dog is fine and running again. He was just stopping the whole team trying to <laughs> poop. <laughs> yes. What will you say about the, the dogs? Well, that's a happy looking Siberian dog team and a um, Siberian Husky dog team. And I need to find out a little bit. Well, he's a. Uh, um, is this a uh, Dutkin guy here, the measure here, he is living just north of the Volga Quest area. He's uh, living west of Kazan, the city of Kazan, and he's done many races for many years. He's uh, finished the North Hope race eight times, winning several of them, and uh, uh, he also done the Volga Quest earlier, so yeah, he had to stop. Here's another team, Yuri Guriono. This guy, uh, this musher, had to, to use some time on the starting line because one of his dogs was too shy to pass all the spectators and the crowds. So he actually had to put uh, the dog in the sled going out and then just after the starting line he stopped again and put the lead dog back. Uh, that's a black lead dog. It was just too shy. So Guriano, eight dogs, uh, and are going pretty fast. I'm sure uh, this is a nice speed right now, but it's probably a bit too fast for going all the way to the finish line. He needs to lower the speed uh, to make sure he has all dogs to the finish line. Yeah, what happens if he has too much speed? Oh, it, if he's not, the dogs are not trained to it and the trains are very hard, they might have sore wrists or sore shoulders. I'm sure Steiner can tell more about that when you have a very hard trail and the dogs are not familiar with hard trails. It's easier to get like a small uh, wrist or a, a small, uh, sore muscles in their shoulders. So uh, when you have hard trails, you have to take, uh, make sure you, you mash your dog team uh, to the ability of your dog team. And if they're trained only in loose snow, you need to take care and be more careful on hard trails. If you train a lot of hard trails, the dog team will have bigger problems in loose snow. 
So that's why it's so important to go out there, train in all kinds of different conditions before you go to the race, because you never know what kind of conditions you will have in a race. So it's not a bad thing that uh, Alexei Dudkin is now uh, falling a little bit behind. It, he can come back later. Well, that's uh, well. Dudkin is uh, in fourth right now, and then Guriano in fifth. And uh, Dudkin is a steady pace with the Siberian Huskies. But Guriano, mm, I'm not too sure. I might see him going too fast. He might climb, but he might lose a lot of speed at the end. I, right now, I prefer teams going in a more steady space, like uh, uh, Demchenko, Chidiomin, and uh, Dudkin. Those three measures have more steady space, while Fatiyev and Guriano might have started a little bit too fast in my uh, belief. Do you agree, Steinert? Yes, I completely agree. So it's uh, always important when you are running a long distance race to take it a little bit easy. Mm. And um, as we say, to stand on the brake in the beginning of the race to lower the speed, make sure the dogs are not going too fast. All, all motors actually would like a good sole and a good trail for their dogs, but you should never forget to relax even though you have good conditions. Because if the, the trot length is too long, you will start having problems, especially with the wrists. Uh, so uh, if you allow your dogs to run too fast because of the good conditions, you will end up by losing uh, uh, your, uh, mm. not losing speed, but you will lose your position mm. in the race. Mm. Uh, and also you might end up with uh, pulling out too much uh, dogs from your team in the race. So you end up on the lowest uh, number um, no allowed dogs. having yeah. to continue the race. So you should never uh, run so fast that you actually uh, end, end up with injuries uh, on your dogs. Mm. No. And uh, Greg and Bruce, our reporters, stare out in the trail at Sosnovi. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Greg Heister, Bruce Lee, and welcome to a place called Winter Crossing as we have teams now on the trail headed here and actually within sight. And this will be Slava Demchenko, our first musher coming through here, Bruce, as yep. we turn and look. Yeah, and that'll be easy for fans to identify because he's the only one with a sit-down sled. So it's always to spot his team. He looked really good going out. And right now, that team's moving really nicely, better than actually I thought for this kind of trail condition. Yeah, Slava Demchenko is really moving well. He's out of Moscow, Russia. You met him earlier before the race started, and he is certainly one of the pre-race favorites here. He's got a large kennel. Of course, uh, he's run the Beringer race and, and hopes to do it again, and he's getting prepared as we turn around and you can see the team there uh, on the camera moving well that team looks great yeah and this is one of the two really strong uh, Alaskan Husky teams that he's been breeding and and uh, this kind of this kind of trail is uh, a little soft the team in front is actually having to set uh, the tracks for the others and is probably working a little harder than the team behind him there. And we got the second team yeah. right behind him. And that's Arseny Tiri Yuman out of Irkutsk, Russia. He's the defending champion of this race. His father Ola granted in 2014, but this is Demchenko coming across the road crossing right now with two, four, six, eight, 10, 11 dogs. And Slava, one of the guys always, hey Slava, how are you? Always with a smile on his face. And a ski pole. He's, and actually, he's working. He's, he's racing. They look really, really good. And he's got them all in boots, and they look well cared for. Here comes the next team. Yeah, the defending champion, Arseny Tiriyuman. Two, four, six, eight dogs. And, and uh, his team having a little more difficulty with the road crossing. This is tough for some teams. Well, it is in any race because the dogs get to the road. It just looks like a better trail, a bigger trail. So. And the team wants to go. The leaders just don't know which uh, which which trail to take here. So. And he's got his leader straightened out now, and off he goes. Yeah, these are, for the mushing community, these are a little more of the houndy dogs, like you would see 
uh, in some of our mid-distance racing where they bred in some hounds, but they're going pretty good right now. Once he gets them lined out, he just doesn't quite have the leaders. And here comes our next team, number 21. Yeah, this should be Yuri Goryunov out of uh, Moscow. And he ran the Volga 2014. He's from a region close to Finland. And... Uh, those guys look really, really good as well. Those okay, so we, we had those screwed up. That was actually Yuri Gurianov well, that was second. first, and that was just Arseny Turi Human that came through. And so we, we were watching the tracker a minute ago, and, and evidently the, the was tracker was lagged behind, and so we got those switched up. So again, to repeat, that was Gary Yunov that was uh, the first, first team, the second team across the crossing here, and then Arseny Turi Human, the defending champion, that's closing in on him. And right now we, we're close to watching a, a pass live here at the road crossing. And uh, Aris, that's the third team there, he's 23 years old, kind of new at mushing. He's from people that know geography of Russia. It's by the Lake Bacall area. I really see him, the way he's handling his dogs is like a young and up and coming, really strong musher. And I like the, the breed of dog, the kind of dog he's running, the Alaskan Husky. Yeah, so we've got three teams now across the road crossing here. First, it was Slava Depchenko as we turn and address the camera. And then uh, it was uh, Yuri Gurionov that we then saw uh, pass through. He's from the, the region close to Finland. And then Turi uh the former defending champion that also went across. We saw three pretty good teams cross this, this road. Yeah, they're actually racing. I mean, that's three teams within sight of each other. And two of them had out ski poles and were really yeah. pushing so and so now let's talk race strategy a little bit is it too early in this length of race to be pushing because they're pushing at like a mid-distance pace yeah i could see that by how they were kicking and polling but they do have as we know up ahead they've got a six hour layover coming so that's a big rest in a race of this length but uh those, those dogs are actually racing. They're not just traveling this trail from what I saw just then. And I'm wondering with the teams that are in second and third place, do they have an advantage with their team knowing that somebody's in front and dogs the way they get excited and trying to chase down the team in front of them? Did we just see teams moving a little faster than we normally would have? Well, it's a little bit of both. What I see, I walk this trail both directions for a while and there is a nice base, but but it isn't a smooth pack trail. So the first teams are setting the tracks, the actual runners, where it's going to be a little easier for the teams that are following. But also, it's the type of situation where, to explain for mushers here, uh, mushers that are following this race from anywhere in the world, this is the type of trail that if you put 50 dog teams on it, it would completely fall apart into sugar snow, yeah. which means there's a nice little crust to run on, but after a while, there's not much base underneath. But uh, these front th three are close enough. There's really no advantage except the very first team is setting the scent and the tracks on the trail for the teams that are following. Yeah, pretty fantastic. We got a great race coming. I just, before we cut it off here and wait for the other two teams, I just want to walk over here. I find this very, very interesting. Odd, our camera guy, and Odd, if you can pan out there and you can see all this stubble, it almost looks like we're standing near a cornfield, but actually those are sunflowers. So we're, we're in an area of Russia where they grow sunflowers. Probably we enjoy those sunflower seeds all over the world, and we may be watching where they're growing right here in Russia. Let's go back to the studio. We've got more teams coming in a little bit. Thanks, Greg. And uh, now, Nina, we saw the three first mushers. What yeah. do you think? Uh, well, I do agree with what Bruce just said, that some of these uh, mushers, uh, two of the teams, have, do have a uh, mid-distant pace. I mean... We're not used to seeing teams going in mid-distance paces uh, in the long-distance race uh, in Norway. And that, I mean, it's hard to say. I wasn't there. It's, I just saw the team from the side and from behind. But I do feel some of the teams do have a bit too high speed um, compared to the distance. And as we also saw, one of the teams that was Goriano, he did have problems with his lead dog, wanted to pass across the road. Uh, maybe the dog is a bit too shy of people and the spectators, because we also saw that on the starting line. 
Uh, we also saw that there was a, a loose dog. Did you see that? There was a loose dog on the t uh, trail. That's probably some village dog from one of the settlements or villages they pass through. So I'm sure they'll uh, do. Uh, they do meet some loose dogs um, who are not from the race. Did you experience that, Steinar, when you were there? I, I cannot remember seeing any loose dogs and uh, uh, no stray dogs, as far as I can remember. So that was not a problem. But but it it, it might have been so without having actually me remembering it. But I but I will now just uh, say the same as uh, uh, Masher says here that um, uh, we we see that there is a potential for. Uh, for educating uh, lead dogs in a better way mm. for at least some Russian mushers. We saw that on the on the starting line for the one mushroom question and, and also on the road crossing here, that uh, the, the speed or the direction of the, of the, of the team didn't follow the track and it, it was a bit of confusion there. Mm. And uh, that's... That is something f for a new beginner, but uh, it, it shouldn't be the, the fact when you are a, a, a developed musher or an experienced musher. No. Well, Maria, I do think uh, they have different training schedules and different training opportunities. Some of these measures that we are used to uh, in uh, Alaska or Canada or Europe. Um, I do know that Demchenko, he only has one round of 2.2 kilometers or 1.2 miles. That's one round, and he trains on that round going in circles all the time, 1.2 miles or 2.2 kilometers, round and round and round. So he does not have a fast team on the trails, <coughs> on the hard trails, because in this round is all, always just water and mud, and that's where he trains his dog, round and round. And that's got to be more like 1,600 rounds on this a uh, training loop as uh, Demchenko has. Uh, well, I've done some mathematics here because <laughs> he, uh, he has about 3,000, 3,500 kilometers before the race season. That's pretty, that's okay uh, if he's doing uh, shorter, long distance races. But I mean, going one loop 1,590 times, and that's your only training ability. And then you bring your dog team to another part of Russia to compete or outside mm -hmm. of Russia to compete. And then you meet people, you meet snow for maybe for not the first time, but you meet totally different conditions. Mm. So of course, like Demchenko or some other measure, they might have uh, challenges they have not been trained the dog team for. So that's what we might, uh, might have seen here now, crossing the, uh, the road. The dogs didn't want to cross. New challenges for the teams. Yes, and we still have two teams left to go. Greg and Bruce are at the trail in Sosnovi. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Winter Crossing. Uh, Greg and Bruce, and we have now got Mikhail Fativ from Tiyum in Russia. He's got fast dogs. Uh, Siberians and Alaskans, kind of a mix. He was finished second place in 2014 and 16. And so this is our fourth team coming to the road crossing right now. And certainly this team's still within range of those first three teams that we saw. But what do you see uh, to this point, Bruce? A little slower pace, not quite the fast cadence of those front three, but it's only been minutes since they've gone yeah. through. So this uh, far into the race, these guys are all really close together, more than I would have guessed at this point. And they're moving really nicely. Yeah, and Mikel wearing bib number 15. He was the first to leave Sharievo the start line uh, earlier this morning. And, and again, uh, that team kind of charged when it saw this road crossing, and they went across it quite nicely. Yeah, they did really well. And again, he has some of these... Uh, these hound husky crosses, Alaskan husky crosses that you see in a lot of the sprint races like in uh, uh, the North American and the Fur Rendezvous. But he's, you know, he's behind them, but he's just a minutes behind them, really. And obviously he stopped here and he's going to take a look and, and maybe put another booty on a dog. Maybe one of the, the dogs is throwing a booty, so he's going to replace it now and take a little time to do that. And obviously, uh, way too early to be worried about who's up in front of him. He's well within range, and, and it sets up as the run to Karmali continues now for these four teams, but changing a booty out here, and that could have happened at any time. Yeah, well, uh, hound your dogs, take a little more foot care, and this is a very crystalline snow, so 
it's a good thing to be taking care of them like that, their feet, particularly in hounds. But another thing we should point out, he's he started with only seven dogs, and he's competing with these 10 and 11 dog teams. And uh, so he has a little smaller dog team, but also a little lighter weight dog that's so... Uh, he doesn't have quite the power of those first three teams we saw going through, particularly two of those teams. So if our math is right, uh, the teams left Sarajevo and they're headed to Carmali where they have to take a mandatory six hours rest there at Carmali or on the way back through Carmali. And it's about a 62 kilometer run today that they're in. So we're guessing, we don't have the exact distance, but we're guessing they're uh, out of that 62, they're probably 40 or 45 kilometers into this run today. And so right now you're looking at Mikel Fativ uh, taking a, a break right now to, to change out some booties here at the winter crossing. And he's probably 20 kilometers or so from Karmali. So to, ca to kind of repeat, we've had Slava Depchenko go through, followed by Yuri Gorionov and then Arseny Turyumin. Uh, who and I believe Arseny then passed uh, Yuri uh, not far from our site here. Those three were all close enough. They were basically just together. Yeah, it seemed like within a hundred yards of one another. You could almost throw a baseball and hit each other. But and right now again, you're looking at uh, fatigue and taking his time and, and making sure that all of his dog's feet are protected. And Bruce, you talked about that this morning. This is the type of snow uh, that is very granular and can take a dog a toll on, on dog's feet if they're not uh, making sure that the booties stay on. Yeah, it's a real crystalline type of snow where it's had a temperature change. It's a little icier. And uh, as we said, setting this race up, this is a place that's kind of in a pocket of its own uh, here in Russia of the exchange of knowledge that has been shared in so many other places. And when we had that little symposium last night, impromptu Dallas and I, the mushers asked us to come. The subject of booties was one they were really asking about because booties aren't always worn in some of these areas like they are in long distance races and dallas and i were stressing the importance of performance is matched with dog care and the importance of a booting and the great materials that are now available and so i was really pleased to see today when all these teams left the starting line they had their dogs booted for the most part and if you're watching the coverage prior to the start, it was uh, Mikel Fatigue's sled that, that Bruce and I were standing next to and talking near the start line. And we noticed that there was an extra cross-country ski that was sticking out of the side of the sled. And it was interesting because his runners are basically cross-country skis that he has bolted to the bottom. Yeah, they're really, uh, they're really thin in the tails, which we pointed out, and the fact that he's carrying an extra one with yes. him shows that he has the knowledge that this thing may break if the trail gets rough out here. But uh, I, I'm actually just really glad to see him take the time to take a break and it, early in the race when you need to be really taking care of these dogs' feet and their conditioning and making sure all the boots are good. Uh, there's also the aspect that on a softer trail, and he's a little bit farther behind, they might be punching through the top of the trail, the, uh, the base. And so then you have to make sure that you're not getting little snowballs built up around what we would call the wrist area that can, can be aggravating to the dog. So just checking them all, taking his time, and that's a good thing because you have to have in mind the vision of not today, but two days from now and how those dogs are going to be feeling. And again, you, I, I'm impressed. And uh, it, the message kind of brings home as we sit and watch Mikel Fatih take his time, be patient with this team. Uh, these are slow moving events. And really the Iditarod or the Fairman or the Bear Grease, they're all when you consider teams are going seven to ten miles an hour, that's a really slow moving event. You've got to take your time and make sure that all the pieces are in place. Be detail oriented because on these trails, anything that can happen and, and go wrong most certainly will find a way to do that. And so Mikel taking some time right now to care for his dogs and make sure that the feet are covered and so that he has no foot problems or pad problems as this race uh, continues down. And, and again, he's not even 40 or 50 miles into the race. You had a long way to go. And it is an important time to care for dogs. But if 
they get a problem with a with a foot and even the first 20 miles then you have to deal with that for the rest of the race so it's better to take care of them right in the beginning so they're feeling good the whole way and that equals speed but you know another thing we might point out to the mushing community people that race dogs at mid distance and long distances few of these mushers like this guy are wearing backpacks with probably what appears to be like 25 30 pounds of supplies in there rather than having it in their sleds and that's just something I don't think other than one or two times I've ever seen in the Quest or the Iditarod or even mid-distance races. And again, Mikel taking his time going dog by dog, uh, partner by partner up that line to make sure that all the dogs and their feet are bootied up. And, and again, that backpack, it does look heavy from this vantage point. What an opportunity for the fans out there watching to kind of peer in and see a few minute, minutes of what it's like for a musher when they're not moving on the trail and how much time you have to spend bent over uh, and the toll that that takes on mushers' backs. It, you know, it's throughout the years covering these races, uh, it is a very physical thing for these guys that are bent over all the time taking care of these dogs, what? whether they're feeding or changing booties. Booties are one of the most monotonous and painful things mushers deal with because exactly what you said, Greg, they're bent, you're bent over all the time. And, you know, if you're taking care of seven or eight dogs, it's not so much when you get in races where you've got 16, you know, that takes a long time, but you're just constantly bent over, checking booties, pulling little snowballs off, checking their wrist, and that is the fatigue that ends up in a lot of, it run all the mushers' backs after a day or two. And the mushers are lucky. You know, it's not a particularly cold day today. It might be three or four degrees below Celsius, uh, maybe 27, 28 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale. But there's a nice breeze up here, Bruce, that kind of keeps things cooled off. And you can see Mikel there, not really in a parka, more in uh, just a Gore-Tex cover that's keeping the wind off of him. And it's uh, one of those days it's quite easy to stay warm. Yeah, it's it's really pretty. This breeze is making it nice for the dogs. And on top of that, it's not super sunny out here. I mean, it may look bright on camera. I don't know. But there is a cloud cover, so you just don't have that feeling of the sun baking on the dogs. But, uh, but yeah, the breeze is really nice for them. And, and in these hound deer teams, this is almost perfect because they don't have the thick coats of the more pure... Uh, thick-furred uh, Alaskan Huskies are particularly the si Siberian team that's still coming behind us here. Yeah, yeah. that final team that uh, out of these five that we're still waiting for is Alexei Dudkin. Uh, he's from the Chuvash Republic of Russia, and uh, he finished this race back, back in 2016. We're still waiting for him as we continue to watch Mikhail Fatiev, and he's going literally foot by foot through his team and it appears that he's taking some booties off and putting different ones on and so is there a change in materials and booties that would would make a difference or maybe he's just bought some new ones that he doesn't like as much as other ones and so he's just changing them out for those reasons well i don't think that he's really changing materials i mean i think he's just some dogs have might need one booty some might need all four some might need two it's just getting any uh, booties off of them that might have accumulated a little snow inside. If you're not a musher, just imagine putting some grains of coarse sand in your yes, shoe. We've all had that. And go for a run, and before long, you, you know, it gets aggravating. You get a blister. So for the non-mushing community, uh, there's two things. You can get snow built up around the top of the booty, or you can get snow down in it. And that's why mushers have to constantly stop and take care of those you know the mushers that have run a lot of race races uh this is <clears throat> all just common knowledge but like you mentioned earlier greg we're kind of reaching out around the world to bring yeah. even the more elementary aspects of this sport to the public and booties are just something that are done not to help with an injury but to prevent the same as we all get up every day and put yes. our shoes on yes. and to protect our feet so you can go on about your day and on about your work well it's the same with these dogs the booties are preventative and so it's important to constantly take care of them it would be like uh, if you're a climber or a hiker 
you wear two pairs of socks so that you don't get blisters, right? It's more of a prevention thing, and it's nice to have moleskin, but generally moleskin doesn't go on until you already have a blister. Exactly, and yeah. that's not what's going on here. This is a preventative thing to make sure the dogs, it's just the old thing, no feet, no soldier, yeah. no feet, no dog. Yeah. Yeah, and so let me ask you this about rest. So obviously he's been sitting here for 15 minutes or so. So if he's here for another 10 minutes, does this 25-minute rest make a difference in the ultimate outcome? In the uh, race? As it far a, as a rest for the dogs, these kinds of breaks for a few minutes let them just kind of cool down and kind of catch their wind, but it doesn't really matter to the accumulative actual rest for a dog. Gotcha. It's actually, if you looked at it purely in that sense, it's lost minutes. Okay. But then again, they aren't totally lost as long as you're taking care of the dogs. If you need to change the booties, you just need to change the booties. And you know, part of that might be with him, the reason the others didn't stop at all and kept going. They're on the beginning of this trail, and I mentioned earlier, as more teams go over this trail, it's gonna get punched out, and if you put 50, dog teams on here it turned pretty much to sugar snow his dogs may be punching through a little bit more and getting more of that loose granular type of snow so he has to be more aware so there's advantages and disadvantages to being in front and there's advantages and disadvantages to being in the back and you just kind of have to play the cards as they are for the location on the trail and the condition that you're in there's something about the booties that he's not liking. I, I see him put them on, take them off, put them on, take them off. And so is it possible that some of them got balled up and so he's putting them in his coat to warm them up so he can put new ones on? Do you ever do that as a musher? No, no. that's not really a thing. I, I, I think he's just going to individual dogs that uh, have different little issues that, that he's dealing with. And I mean, the, the difference is this. In most of the races that the world has seen and that you've covered yourself, we see mushers at checkpoints, but you don't see them live out on the trail. Yes, yeah. Okay, so yeah. what this is, it might seem like, why isn't he going? Well, this is something mushers do on the trail all the time that's normally hidden from the public. And what we're doing here is because we happen to be at a place and we have live coverage for people that run dogs, it's nothing to stop along the trail for 10 to 15 minutes and go through your dogs and take care of them. And you might go, well, it's a race. Why aren't they going? Because it's in long events, you have to think of the big picture at the end. And so what we're really getting right now is the insight of a day-to-day -day life of a musher on the trail. It's not always push, push, push. It's stop and take care of the little details. Yeah, let's walk across the road here. We can get a closer vantage point. So maybe we can peer in and see what's happening. And, you know, what's different about this race, Bruce, if, if this was the Iditarod or the Bear Grease or even the Fairman, uh, as reporters, we would probably be walking over there and, and try to get a quick question and answer and figure out what exactly he's doing. But he speaks Russian. We don't. And so we're at uh, a standstill as far as asking him exactly what's happened. Well, on top of that, I mean, he may be within our range here, but on top of that, he's working right now. And... It's not a break where he's stopping and feeding and you have the opportunity when they're done with their chores to go over and get a little insight about how their race is going. But you're actually just seeing a musher stop on the trail and how they take care of their dogs. So. And I did notice that he started to put his gloves back on, so I think he's getting close or closer to going at this point that or else his hands just got really cold but I, I would imagine Bruce is you know this being somewhat of a warm day but when it's 30 or 40 below zero and you've got to stop and change all the booties on your dogs uh, that can be very difficult on your hands yeah that is uh, one of the joys of booting dogs <laughs> and but but also another important thing people don't realize what he's actually doing right now yeah is picking up his booties, his trash off the trail, and that's you're not. And you reuse them. You you can reuse them. You can hang, take them home, get them dried out. You know, booties. We talked about that last night. You know, on a long race uh, at Dallas, and I would send out 1,200 booties on Iditarod. Well, they all cost, and yeah. but then they become training booties, so they have value. But the more important thing is, mushers in any race, whether it's this race in Russia or in Norway or 
uh, on the Iditarod, part of the rules are you don't leave trash along the trail. You're responsible to clean. You get to run through these areas. You're also supposed to take care of them. So he pulled out a little trash bag to pick up his, his used booties, and then he can take them to the checkpoint. You can hang them up, get them dry, and then use them later in training or even other races if all they need to do is dry. The trouble if you take too long and what he's dealing with now is after you wait a while and the dogs that have had their booties on they start ta they learn they how to take them they off do. so it's this thing you go to the back and you replace one and then you look up front and somebody else has taken one so you walk up and you take that one yeah. and you put it back on then you turn around and the one in the back's got yeah. the booty off yeah. again so you really have to be quick and you have to be efficient and then get going again because they're only held on by a velcro strap or a uh, band that goes around the top of the booty and so the dogs have figured out very easily that they watch the musher put it on I can just grab it with my teeth and pull it right back off and uh, and off they come and so it starts the whole process over again you're looking at Mikel Fatib he's in fourth place here at the Volga Quest 2020 we've had three teams in front of him it started with uh, Slava Depchenko who came through first and then Yuri Goryunov out of Moscow came through and he was followed by the defending champion Arseny or, or sorry I'm sorry Arseny Turiyumin and and I think that Arseny then shortly passed Yuri uh, within after, sight of us yeah here. within yeah. sight of us when they crossed this road crossing here called Winter Crossing and you're now looking at Mikhail Fatiev uh, running a, a mix of Siberians and Alaskans, finishing second in 2014 and 16. And again, this is a team that uh, was dubbed as a, a fast team, uh, that it was going to be interesting to see if it could keep its pace, keep its speed through a race of this distance. And, and the mittens uh, have gone on Mikel, so that tells me he's about ready to go. And up goes the snow hook. And again, only seven dogs compared to the larger teams. And so, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, M Mikel Fatih back on the trail now in fourth place here at the, and he's stopping and, and what, just doing their business, Bruce? Most likely, yeah, after a little break, we'll see here, he's, yeah, somebody had to relieve themselves and off they go. Okay, Mikel Fatih back on the trail in fourth place of the Volga Quest 2020. Off into the distance he goes. He is chasing Slava Depchenko, followed by Arseny Turiyumin and Yuri Goryunov. And so it is Mikhail Fativ in fourth place on the move. And Bruce and I will continue to be here at the road crossing. And we're waiting for Alexei Dudkin to come next. He finished the race back in 2016. He's from Chuvash Republic out of Russia. So keep it right here. We'll throw it back to the studio for now. Now, the race has already started and um, we have seen the four first mushers mm -hmm. and uh, it, it took a while with uh, Fatev. Yeah, I, w this was strange. I mean, why if he has some um, like lead dog problems from the start and then he decides to change all the booties just after the road crossing where you have the, a lot of people on the camera. I, I don't know why he stopped right there, but obviously his dog team is... Um, more houndy and they're used to higher speeds and they seem tired i would say and he needs to make sure they have booties on all the time and but, i mean compared to what we see uh from european and american and canadian races he used to um, way too long time to change all the booties here um if you want to be competitive you have to practice changing dog booties, and you have to do it fast. The, he had uh, with it, um, it seven dogs. Uh, to change the booties for seven dogs will take like two, three minutes maximum. It will be so fast. And I, I don't know. He stayed there for 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Mm. So he used quite a long time. And we didn't get to see everything he did. But I mean, something was obviously not right. So I'm curious. Maybe that he's been going through overflow and he needed to, he needed to change his booties, uh, but still he used to way too much time. So he is clearly not gonna be in the lead anymore, as what I can see. Mm. And Steiner, from a veterinarian's uh, perspective, uh, how is it to be in Volga at uh, these checkpoints? Uh, it's um, uh, as being on other races. Uh, we are there to uh, to see that uh, the teams are doing well, uh, 
to see that the animal welfare issues are taken care of, uh, to help out if, there, if uh, any of the dogs have problems. Uh, so, but according to the, the last matches we see here that had so much problems with that uh, road crossing, um, it's not very common to see that in races here in Europe or in America, I guess. And uh, I think it all comes down to the fact that they are not very much trained in, in the competition situation. Uh, so it was, uh, it, it was kind of... Uh, in uh, inefficient mm. mood yeah, or true. mode he, he this marshal was was doing his uh, job and uh, it, it didn't seem to me that he actually was racing he was out more or less for a training trip mm. because uh, you should have had much more efficiency uh, while you are doing things with your dogs but you know maria which, uh, which is also very special uh, what is also very special is that he's actually having a backpack on his bag back and then his sled is like a, more like a sprint or a mid distance sled so he has very little space in his sled and he has a backpack with things so what if he gets a dog in the sled, the dog, the, 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 there's a little room in the sled. And um, you never see that in long distance, uh, people having backpacks. So this is um, very special. Yes. And we have one last musher who will uh, cross uh, this road crossing. We'll go back to Greg and Bruce. Okay. Go, we're on. We're on? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Greg and Bruce, we're back here at Winter Crossing. Uh, we believe we're uh, about 20 kilometers or so from uh, Karmali, uh, the next checkpoint. We've had four teams go through, and right now we're still waiting on Alexei Dudkin. Uh, he finished this race back in 2016. We saw him leave this morning, moving slower than the others at this point. Well, it's a Siberian team, and their natural gait is to be a little slower. And it's just how they're built and the way they do. Uh, in other races, you know, like in the Quest and the Iditarod, it's a race within the race. Of They know the Siberians are slower gated than the Alaskans, but they also keep track of who has run those courses the fastest with Siberian teams. So this was the only team that went out that we saw this morning that is all Siberians. Yeah, so we expected uh, this team to go a little bit slower than the others. You know, really interesting place that we're standing in around us. It looks like uh, it's a lot of farm country, a lot of farming equipment. We're standing in a field of sunflowers. You can see the stubbles behind us out there. Uh, if we're in Iowa or Nebraska in, in the United States, you would think that that might be, you know, old uh, corn stubble, right? But it's, uh, it's actually sunflowers. So I'm sure there must be an industry here, sunflowers, and we all enjoy those sunflower seeds around the world. And so that possibly is uh, what we're standing here. But we saw Slava Depchenko come through here first. Really it, strong. Team. Yeah, really, really good looking nice team. looking dog team. Followed by Yuri Goryunov and then Arseny Turiyuman. Uh, and then that was followed up by uh, Mikhail Fativ, which we're uh, able to enjoy and watch him really care for his dogs as he went across this road and stopped. And he must have sat there for 15 or 20 minutes to change booties and to inspect each one of his teammates and go really paw by paw through that team, making sure uh, that things were OK. And of course, we're still waiting on Alexei Dudkin to come through uh, here at the Winter Crossing. Man, we're in Russia, and uh, we are live, and how cool is this? It's pretty neat, and as far as uh, the trail and the country we're seeing, where we started this morning, as I'd said earlier, it reminded me a lot around Dawson and the Yukon, or outside of Fairbanks and the hills on the Yukon Quest. Now we've gone through a transition where they ran through those hills, and we're out basically in mixed forest and agricultural areas for people that are just interested in what this race is like as far as the country. It's flattened out quite a bit. And uh, as, as you said, Greg, a lot of big, massive fields of, <laughs> yeah. of uh, sunflowers through this whole area. That's kind of their agriculture industry right around here. 
Yeah, it's been a really interesting morning for us. Of course, it started in Sarajevo there, and, and the teams were camped out for 24 hours at a time of rest. We spent a lot of time there yesterday, uh, both talking to volunteers and race staff and personnel and, of course, the mushers. And uh, we've met a lot of great people, a lot of happy people and people that I think are – uh, really enthused about what's going on with uh, with this dog race and the fact that mushing is uh, becoming part of the landscape in the middle section of of Russia and of course we talked uh, you know up in Kamchatka and Chukotka the, those places there's been mushing going on for generations right for centuries yes. and then basically that's a shared culture with that is well known in in Alaska for Alaskans along the whole west coast it's it's a shared Bering Sea culture uh whale hunters seal hunters subsistence lifestyle the use of dogs to do everything and uh even same languages uh in the indigenous people there to a degree yeah and uh there was a bunch of, of young children that came out to that race start this morning. Later, we learned they were from an orphanage. And so it's uh, it's been an interesting kind of full circle morning for us. We've, we've met a lot of great people. And uh, to sense the excitement that is building around this Volga Quest and this race started in 2014, ran in 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. It did not run. And it's been kind of resurrected here with uh, this Arctic World Series uh, start and they're able to get this race back in Russia and uh, going again. And what's been interesting for me as well, Bruce, is to learn how important and, and how many fans and how many mushers there are in this country. Didn't realize how big uh, the economy was when you when you start thinking about mushing in this country. Yeah, and, and here at Winter Crossing, it actually is a crossing of a road, yeah. which should have shown up on the films. It's actually a road through this district. And... Uh, People that were just randomly going by yeah. stopped their cars and got out and watched because it's such a unique for thing for them to see. So a few people that weren't even following the race just basically stopped and said, what's going on here? It's a dog race. And, and we're interested enough to stop and, and watch the first three teams particularly go through. You know, I want to talk a little bit about more about Siberia and since we have this Siberian team that's going to be here shortly. Uh, of course, there's a real tradition of that long term in Alaska with the Norris family. Yes. And a lot of the early exchanges that happened in Europe and Alaska with sled dogs was the Norris family, Earl, Earl and Natalie yeah. Nor Norris. And they ran the early sprint races in Alaska. And then uh, those dogs have gone on with the Norris family and people from their kennel. And a matter of fact, Al Alaska is now champion musher martin boozer first came over uh to alaska to work in the norse's siberian kennel so even though they're a slower gated dog there is a real history of those being used in all the events that we know around the world and a pure breed and a pure breed yes yeah which is different than the alaskan husky and so a lot of variances and, and we've been talking all day about that's one of the i think the interesting things certainly for a guy like you when you get to come into these races and you see all of these different breeds and you were talking this morning about uh slav it wasn't slava's team it was uh, whose team was it? Was it Mikel Fatih's team that actually had uh, some houndy looking dogs mm -hmm. and stuff in there? And there was a, a time uh, in the Alaskan community, the, the mushing community, where hounds were bred in. Everything has been tried uh, to make these you know, Martin Boozer called them a, a long time ago designer dogs, right? So you're designing and, and trying to create the perfect sled dog. Well, genetics is what the whole is so interesting in the sport. If you're really into it and raising dogs, just that the art and and science and magic of breeding uh, to get a better and better athlete. And I think the dogs, I mean, the re one of the reasons we're seeing the pace of all these races pick up now. And I don't mean just getting to the finish line in less days. I mean, even from the aspect, as we see now, the difference between first and 20th after a yeah. thousand miles is just a few hours. You take one wrong nap yeah. and you go from second place to 15th. And it's because the genetics is so good in all of these sled dogs now, the whole the whole pool of dogs has been lifted and and that's true 
with the Alaskan Huskies and and the actual racing Siberians, which I would do, I would make a separation from the show dog Siberians. Those dogs are bred for looks. These people that are racing uh, Siberians now around the world and all these events, they're breeding more like Alaskan Husky people do for working performance. Yeah, and I see uh, this team coming right now yeah. on the ridge line. Team is on the trail, and, and we're going to walk up here so we can stay out of the trail. But this is Alexi mm -hmm. Dudkin, um, the fifth team on the Volga Quest 2020 to make its way across the winter crossing here. We don't have exact mileage. We've been told it's uh, 62 kilometers to Karmali, uh, the next checkpoint, but uh, we're, we're not quite sure those numbers are accurate. If that's true, then it's about 40 to 45 kilometers to this point, but time will tell as, uh, again, the GPS that is on these trackers it's going to give us real life information as as these teams go from point A to point B. But it's kind of cool. Like we're able to watch these teams from a long time come across this winter crossing. And so you see them going through this wide open area. Again, a, a sunflower kind of a pasture and it's all been mowed down, but you can see it across there. And, and Dudekin's yeah. teams looks pretty good. Yeah, they, they're moving nicely. <clears throat> I'd say for, they're probably moving just visually after watching hundreds and hundreds of dog teams. He's coming across there probably about nine, nine plus miles an hour right now. They're probably a little excited seeing people coming out of the woods here, so they might have picked up. But, you know, I'll go out on a limb here. I don't normally do that. You, you like don't, it when you I don't do. like to do that. I'll go out on a limb. And, I, and the pace at which we are seeing these dogs run, the speed... And the mileage that we only have available here without a lot of accuracy, I, I really question our, our what we're being told the these distance. distances are because yeah. these dog teams are really moving nicely. And I think it's a little longer, at least to this point that we are, than what we have available to us. So uh, these guys for Siberians are trotting out really, really nice. It's a nice looking dog team. We'll see when they go by. And he's got a big team. Yeah, beautiful looking team, and we do have a car coming, and they're going to slow the car down as uh, Alexi Dudkin getting very close uh, to coming across Winter Crossing here. And the car is slowing down, so we'll have no issue. But, man, this is a beautiful looking dog team. Team yeah. number five across and uh, I like, Winter Crossing. And I like this leader. It just looked and went straight across without any questioning. These are a little shorter than some of the Siberians I've seen in Alaska, but uh, boy, they look good. They really do. Alexi Dudkin wearing bib number two, and again, he's going to stop here right across this crossing as Mikhail Fatib did a little earlier ago, and so who knows, maybe he's going to walk through his dog team and do, take this time now for a little inspection. <laughs> he's going to get a little hydration, possibly some coffee. And he's talking with Elena right now, uh, one of the race founders and certainly been our translator and, and host over the last 24 hours. So let's go talk to Elena. What is, yeah. So what, uh, what's, what's happening? No, just he w wants, to, um, wants, to, wants to put one dog inside. And as you see, the dog uh, looks very fresh. Yeah good one and actually i talked with him before start today and he said i will take care about my dogs i'm fine with them and i want to finish this is my first task and my, my general plan yeah. to finish so and i saw him on the yard on the checkpoint he took care about his dog um, too much i mean a lot yeah. of yeah. spend a lot of time to take a care about them and right now he said that uh, he was feeling that one dog is tired a little bit he wants to put it inside and actually also he asked me how far the guys yeah. i said not so far the for, fourth one yeah. so so it's not about competing or winning no, no, for him no. it's about getting a good looking yeah. dog team yes. to the finish yes line. yes and look at them it's it's really fresh yeah how, how well do you know alexi um, I, I, I met him two years ago, and he was like a guest 
uh, in Svetlana's place. It's not. I did. I did meet him not during the race. He was Svetlana's guests because, as I told you, Svetlana, she she had a good capacity dog yard, yeah. and she has uh, some kind of education program for the children. So a lot of people are around Russia came to her. They have some kind of performance parties, and also, as I told you, told you, uh, education program. Yeah. Boy, Bruce is a big team. Good-looking team here. Well, it's a powerful-looking team. They're just not quite as fast because of the gate, but I am actually surprised at the long-distance view that we had of them, that they really were moving moving better, faster than I thought they, they were. From So maybe he's taking a little more time. Maybe the trail's a little more difficult. But it's just that Siberians tend to have uh, more of a steady trot than, than the Alaskans oh, yeah. do. And interesting, uh, I saw him pull out a big waterproof bag out of the middle of his uh, sled there and obviously keeping everything dry, but a lot of extra weight in that waterproof bag. Yeah, that is a detail, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and in this race, if I've read the rules correctly, and they haven't changed for this year because I looked at some past, uh, the musher has to carry a complete set of extra clothing for themselves so if they get stopped they have to yeah. say they get wet at a cross and sh shoes uh it should be lights it's a lot of stuff yeah. it's yeah. the whole list so so that's something it's kind of up to you what you want to bring on the iditarod or quest as far the dog things are mandatory but yeah. the musher can go with one set of clothes and get wet yeah. but in this race they have to have a complete extra change of clothes for the musher. So that's a lot of bulk, which may be part of what's in there. And wasn't there a musher yesterday that was docked some time because of the mandatory equipment of matches that was missing? So even if you don't didn't have enough matches uh, in the sled or didn't have them at all, something that weighs nothing, uh, the rules are, are very, very serious. Yes. Uh, last time, uh, two years ago, uh, this young lady, it's Yulia, she, uh, she was stuck in a uh, snowstorm and if she ha has no this kind of uh, different kind of uh, clothes with her she will be frozen so yeah. and sh so she put on everything that she has in, in her sleds so and she was safe can you ask the name of the dog that he's putting in the sled um Alma. 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 name is Alma. Uh -huh. And it looks to be a smaller female, yeah, yeah. so it's not a whole lot extra weight. Yeah. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. No, <laughs> Uh, he said that um, she probably not so so strong for this race because he had al already experienced two days ago the same situation. So probably he sh he will drop her. <laughs> no, but this, so he takes the the waterproof backpack out of the sled to put create room for the dog, <laughs> and now he's going to carry that monster waterproof bag uh, on his back down the trail. No, не знаю. Палку не забудь свою. Да. <laughs> what do you say? What's funny? funny. He, he is asking how long to Carmali, and it's only 18. He said, "Okay, otherwise my my neck will be died." <laughs> but again, that's yeah. the third musher. Yeah. Even at the starting line, that they carry a backpack yeah. and and they've got a ski pole out. Yeah. So. Very, very interesting. Ladies and gentlemen, you are watching Alexei Dudkin make his way down the trail, a team of beautiful Siberians heading to the checkpoint of Karmali. He is our fifth and final team to come across the winter crossing here. Uh, and it's been an interesting afternoon watching these teams and how lucky we were to see two stop just beyond this road crossing. And so we could kind of peer into an, an afternoon or a, a moment on the trail for all these mushers and what they had to go through. Of course, we watched Mikhail Fatigue go through each one of his team's uh, feet, check them over, put new booties on them, and then we saw one, one dog actually get put in the sled here 
and then Alexi taking that heavy bag out of the sled to create room for his teammate, and then now he's going to carry that. that. That was I could tell when he slung that on his shoulders. There's 40, 50 pounds in that bag. Yeah, that that uh, <laughs> didn't look fun to me no. on the back of a sled. But you got to do what you yeah. got to do, yeah. and that's part of the price. Really, he's running a a smaller sprint sled, yeah. and that's the trade-off. Whereas if you normally have enough room for your gear and the idea that you might load a dog, well, that's the size sled, so that's the sacrifice he has to make. So. Yeah. Well, I know teams have to be getting close to Carmali now, and I know uh, Dallas and Carrie Ann are there, and I'm sure the live coverage, if it hasn't started from that checkpoint, will be coming shortly. So for now, I'm Greg and Bruce Lee. We're going to send it back to the studio in Norway. We're going to break down and move on down the trail ourselves. It's been a great day to this point. We're on the trail of the Volga Quest 2020 here in Russia. Back to you. Thank you so much, guys. Well, now we'll take a look at the map. Nina will guide us through the rankings. And uh, Nina, what do we see here? Yeah, right. Uh, what we see here is that some of the teams have arrived to the first checkpoint of Karmale. Actually, one team has already gone through the checkpoint, that's Gorionov. But we know that the Tuyormin and uh, uh, Demchenko has decided to do their first six hour uh, rest, uh, the mandatory rest. But then Anguriano is in the lead. He's gone through Karmali, the first checkpoint. He's now is on his way to the next point, uh, to, to, to Slada, where there is a turnaround, and then going back to Karmali too. Uh, that's where he has to take his six hour mandatory rest. But as far as we know, Tereyormin and Nademchenko is arresting, <coughs> taking their six hour mandatory rest at Karmali 1. And we're waiting for Mikhail Fatigyev uh, arriving at Karmale. His uh, team having some problems at the last road crossing, as we could see. They used a lot of time to change booties. And then we have the Siberian Husky team of um, Dudkin uh, uh, in the last position at the moment. And uh, this is in the middle of the day right now in Russia. And it's getting pretty warm for the Siberian Huskies. Some of the other teams might have uh, less uh, fur. Uh, what's good is that Gurion, uh, no, Tjormin and uh, Demchenko is taking it, uh, their six hour mandatory rest in Karmali. That's pretty good because now they are able to rest their dogs in the heat of the day. <clears throat> so they are able to continue to Slada and back to Karmali during the night when the temperatures are lower. And it's always a good thing to have early rest. Well, what we see is that the Guriano, he needs to take a six hour mandatory rest at Karmale 2, which means he's traveling during the warmer parts of the day and then he'll have to rest in the night again when it's colder, when the other teams will be traveling. So I think uh, Demchenko and uh, Tjormen are uh, doing uh, the right decision, resting at taking their mandatory six hour at Karmale 1. So we'll see how much faster they will go on the next leg uh, compared to Goriano. And then we're waiting for, uh, for Fatyev and, uh, uh, and Dudkin coming into Karmali 1. Thank you so much, Nina. Now, we will be back shortly with more live updates from the Volga Quest. Stay tuned. Hey! 
Welcome back. Just a quick little hit. We saw a bunch of school children. It's a holiday. They're here. This has got to make you feel good that the fans are coming out. Uh, actually, it's a really, it's a holiday for the pupils. But uh, the uh, friends of us, she's the director of the school. She have a co phone calls a couple of minutes ago, and she said, are we able to bring the pupils, the kids? Yeah. And we said, of course, of course. And you look, there is two buses came to <laughs> yeah. just to share the people, to yeah. share our teams. Yeah. It's it's very it's it's impressive. Yeah. Me. It just the people really interested in, and they, as you know, the kids love love the yeah. dogs. And, and Odd, our, our camera guy, if you pan over to the right, you can see one of the school buses over there. And I get a kick out of it because it, it seems like the color yellow is universal for a school bus. Yep, yeah, it's right? inter international, international, it's international, international color. International yeah. color. Yeah. And all the children, they're, they're lined out down here, down uh, the start line with all these banners. Prideful morning, I bet, for you. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I need to tell you, yes. Yeah. And actually, it's a little bit early for them for their holidays, but they wake up and they came. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's send it back to the set. We're moments away from the start of the Volga Quest 2020. <laughs> and uh, Dallas CV, he uh, will, let, uh, will guide us through the start of this race. Yeah, I can't. All right, first in the shoot, we have Mikhail Feyetev, um, Bidmore 15, he's got a nice looking team, a uh, little bit more subdued. These guys came in with the fastest time after the first half of the race. Uh, so he has a seven dog team, which is a smaller lineup, and so that speed early on in this race in the first half may end up being a, a real challenge for him when it comes to finishing the trail in the second half here. Uh, they've got the booties on, and they're taking off a steady pace, but uh, a little more subdued. And there goes Mikhail Feyetev uh, um, out of the chute. Once they get a little past the people, you see them cruising along here. But there's a little bit smaller team, a uh, fairly steady pace. I wouldn't say this is a, a crazy driving team at this point. Uh, gotta, gotta untangle somebody here. <laughs> it's the problem when you start getting a little bit of slack in the lines, it makes it easy for dogs to step over and get on the wrong side of it. But he's gonna get them sorted out, get them on the right side of the lines there. Make sure nobody's got a, a leg over anything they shouldn't. And the lead dogs are up there holding them nicely. <laughs> nicely lined out, which is what you want to have a dog team that has leaders holding the team strung out, everybody behaving themselves. Have a little challenge getting the the line's in the right spot here. All right. Got him untangled. He's gonna pull the snow hook there. And they take off again at a, a steady little clip. A couple of the guys in the back trying to hit a lope. Uh, the front guys seeming like they're, they're content with the speed that they're going right now. So I uh, think we're gonna see these guys at a much slower pace than they were doing the first half. Probably hit it a little too aggressive on the first half if you're thinking of it as a long distance race. 
Here's second in the starting shoot. We have Slav Dominchko, um, number 25. Now he's got a nice looking lineup here. I'm seeing, uh, I think we got 11 dogs in this team. And right now they're all calm and standing here, which is nice to see. But as they are pulling up to the starting chute, they had a lot of zip to them. So I think this is a team that's going to have a very nice traveling speed, a lot of zip on the trail. They seem like they've got good horsepower. So I'm excited to see how these guys kind of develop. It seems like a little more of a steady long distance team than... Uh, then uh, Feitib, who just saw leave the start line. So there we go, he pulls the hook, and that's what I'm talking about. These guys have some zip, there's some snap to this dog team. I'm much happier with the looks of this team leaving the starting line here with a lot of energy and enthusiasm. You see the dovetail coming off the back of the sled as he's standing on the brake, trying to keep him slowed down to this speed. Um, here's a nice shot where they're stretching out a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's a nice looking dog team. They'll get loosened up and rolling here, but that's... Uh, that's more like what I like to see taken off with the 200 plus kilometers to go. You want to see a, a solid, strong looking dog team, 11 dogs, you know, a little bit heavier sled, a little more of a distance mindset here when I'm looking at this team. And that was Slav Dominchko taking off uh, from the start line. Here we're back to the, the shoot. We have Arsini. Um, he was one of the faster uh, times on this last section, or one of the, I shouldn't say faster, one of the better looking teams finishing the last section of the race. And I think it shows here as well. We got a lot of wagon tails. I think he's sitting in a very good position, leaving for the second half of this race in third position right now. Uh, he's got a little bit of a time to make up on the teams ahead of him. However, he's got a nice looking gang of dogs, and I think that's by far the most important thing. And there's plenty of trail left to catch up with the teams ahead. So I think uh, we saw Dominchko take off just a minute ago. This is Arsini. I think this, this team's a really solid team. I think this is uh, a very strong candidate. It is last year's champion from this race. You can see he's standing on the sled, just patiently waiting for them to count down his time. Bunch of happy, waggy tails. Got booties on all the feet there. This is a nice looking lineup. Lead dogs are ready to get out there. They keep looking up at the person wondering, uh, can we go yet? Can we go yet? The dogs can't quite tell time. They don't hear the people counting down. All they know is uh, the cues from their musher. I can see the handler steps back. There they go. A nice lineup of dogs charging out of the chute. Again, this is another really nice looking team. And this is Arsini taking off here. Yeah, that, these guys are attacking the trail. If anything, uh, you know, there still is 200 plus kilometers. You're going to want to be careful about letting them go too fast early on. You know, no foot on the brake at this point. I'm going to guess that he's going to slow them down pretty quick here once he gets past the people and the cameras. Um, it's always nice to have a, a fast looking dog team take off. But yeah, there he's, uh, he just shifted his heel over onto the track there. But he'll probably be getting them slowed down because you got to be cognizant. You've got a lot of miles left to go. You've got to take it easy. Um, but it's nice to see a high-powered, strong team taking off from here. So that was uh, Arsini taking off right there. Next up into the chute, we have Yuri. Um, having a little bit of trouble getting the right combination. Uh, has a smaller team. I think we've got eight dogs in that team. And... Uh, would, I mean, he started with a 12-dog team early on. After the first half, decided to leave some dogs behind. Um, and we may have seen that after having run a little bit, you know, harder pace relative to the team's ability. Of course, he's behind the teams ahead of him right now. Um, but it's always a relative thing. So if you, we say that the team's running too fast or too hard, that doesn't necessarily mean relative to the other mushers. It's relative to your dog's ability. Um, but we see a little bit smaller team leaving here and as I see these guys having a little bit more of a challenge figuring out uh, the right combination I start thinking that the dogs that got left behind may have been very key lead dogs so here we see the handler trying to lead the team up into the starting shoot the dogs seem energetic we got waggy tails and barking dogs that's a good sign um, but it seems a little there we go, a little disorganized. The lead dog on the one side is hesitant. There's a lot of people standing around the, st around the starting line and not quite certain about running through a crowd of people. So that can be a, a real challenge, especially, like I said, if the, the dogs that were left out of the team were the uh, you know, experienced lead dogs, trying to find a good combination can be a, a challenge. And just the whole team, they seem, 
like they're having fun, but not real business-like. <laughs> um, so we're gonna need to find a combination that works and uh, to direct these guys out on the trail. So it looks like he's gonna try to, try to take off, oh, better stop there. There we go, get it situated. That's, uh, I think he's trying to get out on the trail where this dog feels a little more comfortable away from people um, to then you know, sort it out once he's past the crowds because it seems like these dogs are more than a little distracted by, by the people. They want to stop and play with the kids here. Some of them are excited to go, but it's, it's a matter of all of them deciding to go at the same time. Right now, it looks like half of them are excited to visit the people. The other half are excited to go and then then it switches. <laughs> the ones that were ready to go are ready to visit, and then uh, vice versa. So he's getting the dog loaded in the sled. Um, gonna take off, get past the people and all the crowds, and then you know, get the dog back on. Now coming up behind him here, we have Alexi Dudkin with a team of Siberian Huskies. Um, his starting time is coming right up because uh, Yuri was supposed to have been gone right now, and they're starting just two minute intervals. So Alexi's coming up into the, the starting slot here because um, his starting time is coming up. And if, if Yuri misses his time, then he's just going to have to go at the end of the race. But with only five mushers, the end of the race is right now. He is, you know, not going to have to wait too long. So here we have two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven Siberian Huskies passing them in the chute. They're pulled up alongside. I think we're going to see Alexi take off next here. And Yuri's going to have to wait till. Lexi's on the trail, and then he'll be allowed to take off. So, bib number two there. That's uh, Alexi Dudkin taking off for the Siberians. That was a nice looking team. I mean, these uh, Siberians, I think, are gonna hold a little bit steadier of a pace. Over the last few weekends here, we've seen some Siberian teams do really well in some of these mid-distance races. Um, you know, in the five to 650 kilometer distance, we've seen some Siberians do quite well. Uh, these guys seem at a, more, I would say, more normal pace for the show Siberians as they're just kind of chugging along, going to the bathroom, being a little more casual. But that's one of the great things about Siberians is they are very good traveling dogs. They take it easy, they're not gonna run too hard, and they, they have fun out there. So here we're back over to Yuri. Um, so we got past the people here. Just, uh, I mean, maybe 100 yards, not even, uh, just a few Thanks. meters past the, the end of the people there. And put the other lead dog back up now that he doesn't have to be concerned about running through a crowd. Gets everything zipped up. Pulls the hook. Ah. <laughs> this is where having a good lead dog can save you a lot of time and headache uh, as you try to get the right combination down. It is, it is tricky, and these guys, you know, they just seem a little bit distracted. Um, they all seem happy, which is, is a very good thing, but nobody really seems to be uh, in charge, let's put it that way. So, you know, having one good lead dog that kind of takes charge of it and says, all right, guys, we're going this way, and, and charges down the trail, sets the tempo for the whole team, whereas uh, if everybody's just kind of wiggly and happy and having fun and nobody's going to be kind of telling the rest what to do, it can be a challenge. I, I would guess that as you know, he had 12 dogs and left behind four after the first half of the race, um, this is where it's important that you set the right tempo for those key lead dogs. They've got to be there when you need them um, or else it's going to be a long ways because he's past the people here, but there's going to be another checkpoint in 80 kilometers and you're going to have another town and more people after they rest, they're gonna have to take off past people again. So it's important that these dogs are accustomed to running in all conditions. Uh, here they go. Uh, the, the black lead dog he has up there is getting a little talking to from the white one next to him. Um, he's cruising out of here now. These guys are flying down the trail now that they got past the distractions of the people. So he's moving well, but that is gonna be difficult if it's gonna be a 10 minute process to go by a crowd. And that's just gonna be a matter of training. And I think it's important to use these races as a training experience um, to see what you need to improve. And I would be willing to bet next year he's going to be spending a little more time, you know, getting the dogs used to running through a crowd and not always stopping to play with the people, but it's time to travel past the, past the folks and just, you know, continue to develop the dog team. And that was Yuri that we just saw taken off there, and he is on the trail after uh, having a little trouble getting down the starting chute with the crowds. 
Now, Nina, what do you think about the start? Well, we did see some problems with two of the teams here, like the last one here, Goriano. He had surely had problems with one of his lead dogs. Uh, he, the dog did not, did not want to go out of the shoot. What we see is, uh, wow, this is fast. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, this is right now because Chirimin is gone in the lead before Fachev. Uh, we have Demchenko, uh, Goriano and uh, Dotkin at the last uh, position going on their way to the uh, checkpoint of Karmali. Uh, that's where they can stop six hours if they like, or they can stop at Karmli the next time they come to Karmli. Mm. So what we see is that Chermin has become in the lead before Fachev and uh, Demchenko. So Chermin is in the, uh, is doing the best race so far, and he he has a team of ten dogs, and he's last year's winner, and um, he'll sure make uh, be doing a good race now. I'm sure he wants to. Uh, yes. Win. What do you think, uh, Steiner, about Chermin? Uh, I think he will do a good race. He is the younger of the, uh, the mushers here. Uh, he has won uh, Volga quests uh, several times. Uh, he comes from a family that uh, lives from mushing dogs. His father also is a non-musher in Russia. Uh, I think he, uh, he will do good. Uh, he, enjoys what he's doing and uh, I think he would be one of the favorites. And Nina, they're yeah. really packed here. Yeah, that's what I was uh, noticing. They are traveling together and then you have Dudkin uh, a little bit behind and Dudkin is uh, racing the Siberian uh, Husky teams uh, just, and those uh, other teams are uh, Alaskan Huskies with some hound in them as well. And they do travel uh, quite uh, tight together and right now we see that Fatiev is um, losing speed. He has the most hounded dog team here and we saw that at the end here now he was losing team, uh, speed actually and I remember he always only has seven dogs but you, uh, you know I have to say one thing we saw that uh, bib number 12 Goriano he had to take one of his lead dogs into the sled at the starting line and what happened here was yes here we have a picture pictures from the from the, from trail, the trail and we Mikael will see Fatiev. yeah uh, he has the most houndy dog team. He's got seven dogs, and now you see this is a good speed we see here. The question is if he's able to keep that speed for the whole race, the whole last days of the race. Well, he has dropped five dogs already, and it he might not, he should not go too fast if you want to um, uh, keep all the dogs going to the finish line. He has to take, uh, make sure he treats our um, races in a way that uh, he'll have enough dogs to cross the finish line. And he's done to seven dogs already. So it would be smart to save a little bit of the forces in the team. Yeah, I think uh, his uh, <laughs> problem or um, his challenge, uh, that's a good, better word, his challenge is not to go not too fast. He needs to speed, to, to, to lower his speed, I would say, if he wants to f keep and the, the next, finish line. Next up is Vyacheslav Demchenko. Yeah. That's uh, with their, uh, Robert Surly guy of the Volga Quest race, as we were talking about. A really nice guy, always smiling. Unfortunately, not very uh, familiar with English, but he's, uh, he's a positive guy. And he's got a nice team of uh, 11 dogs, um, Alaskan Huskies. And those dogs had a lot of energy at the starting line. So they were well rested and, you know, look, uh, th that's a nice, nice looking team with smiles on their face and no tails wagging. And uh, Demchenko himself has made his own sled and he's made a sit down sled, which is very common in long distance racing. And then we have another team coming up, and that's Chiriomin, Arseni Chiriomin, last year's winner. This is a young guy, and uh, Steinar, you know him, and you told me that he wants to do more races outside of Russia too. So this guy has big ambitions. Uh, I, that, that's my impression. Yeah. He, uh, he speaks English, he's... Uh, he's young. He's, he's, he's the younger one. He, uh, he's got a, a team of 10 dogs and that's a nice speed. Well, those, those are nice trails and nice pictures from the trail. I, Looks I, like uh, some part of the Finnmark race going from uh, Tana to Naiden in the Finnmark race is quite the same nat nature. 
As far as I recall, Arsene he also signed up for Femmes Löpe one year, oh, yeah. but uh, for some reason he didn't make it. So he, he is one that really would like to go uh, outside Russian borders also with with his dogs to compete. Mm. Uh, Maria, we have another team here. Stana, this is uh, Alexei Dudkin with his Siberian Husky team, a purebred uh, dog team. They might be a bit slower and they um, preferably like a colder weather. But that's a nice team, and he's got the bigger, uh, as long as, as well as Demchenko, he's got a big team of 11 dogs. And these dogs have a very nice traveling speed. So although some of the ones in the front go fast, they might lose speed, while this team will probably keep an even speed throughout the race. So I believe um, he'll be able to climb on the result list, I would believe. Well, there's one dog here. Oh, they have a little one. bit oh, here's a trouble a, with, with, this, this one with pooping here. Pooping problems. <laughs> but, hey, uh, but now the dog is finally running again. He was just stopping the whole team trying to <laughs> poop. <laughs> yes. What will you say about the, the dogs? Well, let's uh, have a look at Siberian dog team and um, Siberian Husky dog team. And I need to find out a little bit. Well, here's a... Uh, um, this is a uh, Dutkin guy here, the measure here. He is living just north of the Volga Quest area. He's uh, living west of Kazan, the city of Kazan. And he's done many races for many years. He's uh, finished the North Hope race eight times, winning several of them. And uh, uh, he also done the Volga Quest earlier. So, yeah, he had to stop. Here's another team, Yuri Guriono. This guy, uh, this musher, had to, to use some time on the starting line because one of his dogs were too shy to pass all the spectators and the crowds. So he actually had to put uh, the dog in the sled going out and then just after the starting line, he stopped again and put this lead dog back. And that's a black lead dog. It was just too shy. So Guriono, eight dogs, uh, and are going pretty fast. I'm sure uh, this is a nice speed right now, but it's probably a bit too fast for going all the way to the finish line. He needs to lower the speed uh, to make sure he has all dogs to the finish line. Yeah, what happens if he has too much speed? Uh, it, if he's not, the dogs are not trained to it and the trains are very hard, they might have sore wrists or sore shoulders. I'm sure Steiner can tell more about that when you have a very hard trail and the dogs are not familiar with hard trails. It's easier to get like a swollen uh, wrist or a, a swollen, uh, sore muscles in their shoulders. So when you have hard trails, you have to take, uh, make sure you, you match your dog team. Uh, to the ability of your dog team. And um, if they're trained only in loose snow, you need to take care and be more careful on hard trails. If you train a lot of hard trails, the dog team will have bigger problems in loose snow. So that's why it's so important to go out there, train in all kinds of different conditions before you go to the race, because you never know what kind of conditions you will have in a race. So it's not a bad thing that uh, Alexei Dudkin is now uh, falling a little bit behind. It, he can come back later. Well, that's uh, well. Dudkin is uh, in fourth right now, and then Guriano in fifth. And uh, Dudkin is a steady pace with the Siberian Huskies. But Guriano, mm, I'm not too sure. I might see him going too fast. He might climb, but he might lose a lot of speed at the end. I, right now, I prefer teams going in a more steady pace, like uh, uh, Demchenko, Chidiomin, and uh, Dudkin. Those three measures have more steady pace, while Fatiyev and Guriano might have started a little bit too fast, in my uh, belief. Do you agree, Steinert? Yes, I completely agree. So it's uh, always important when you are running a long distance race to take it a little bit easy. Mm -hmm. And um, As we say, to stand on the brake in the beginning of the race, to lower the speed, make sure the dogs are not going too fast. All, all mushers actually would like a good soul and a good trail for their dogs, but you should never forget to relax even though you have good conditions. Because if the, the trot length is too long, you will start having problems, especially with the wrists. Uh, so uh, if you allow your dogs to run too fast because of the good conditions, you will end up by losing uh, uh, your, uh, mm. not losing speed, but you will lose your position mm. in the race. Uh, and also you might end up with uh, pulling out too much uh, dogs from your team in the race. So you end up 
on the lowest uh, number um, no, allowed no, having yeah. to continue the race. So you should never uh, run so fast that you actually uh, end, end up with injuries uh, on your dogs. Mm. No. And uh, Greg and Bruce are reporters. They are out in the trail at Sosnavi. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, Greg Heister, Bruce Lee, and welcome to a place called Winter Crossing, as we have teams now on the trail headed here and actually within sight, and this will be Slava Demchenko, our first musher coming through here, Bruce, as yeah. we turn and look. Yeah, and that'll be easy for fans to identify because he's the only one with a sit-down sled, so it's always to spot his team. He looked really good going out. And right now, that team's moving really nicely, better than actually I thought for this kind of trail condition. Yeah, Slava Demchenko is really moving well. He's out of Moscow, Russia. You met him earlier before the race started, and he is certainly one of the pre-race favorites here. He's got a large kennel. Of course, uh, he's run the Brinja race and, and hopes to do it again, and he's getting prepared as we turn around it and you can see the team there uh, on the camera moving well that team looks great yeah and this is one of the two really strong uh, Alaskan Husky teams that he's been breeding and and uh, this kind of this kind of trail is uh, a little soft the team in front is actually having to set uh, the tracks for the others and is probably working a little harder than the team behind him there. And we got the second team yeah. right behind him. And that's Arseny Tiri Yuman out of Irkutsk, Russia. He's the defending champion of this race. His father Oleg ran it in 2014. But this is Demchenko coming across the road crossing right now with two, four, six, eight, ten, eleven dogs. And Slava, one of the guys always Hey Slava, how are you? Always with a smile on his face. And a ski pole. He's, and actually, he's working. He's, he's racing. They look really, really good. And he's got them all in boots, and they look well cared for. Here comes the next team. Yeah, the defending champion, Arseny Turiyuman. Two, four, six, eight dogs. And, and uh, his team having a little more difficulty with the road crossing. This is tough for some teams. Well, it is in any race because the dogs get to the road. It just looks like a better trail, a bigger trail. So. And the team wants to go. The leaders just don't know which uh, which which trail to take here. So. And he's got his leader straightened out now, and off he goes. Yeah, these are, for the mushing community, these are a little more of the houndy dogs, like you would see uh, in some of our mid-distance racing where they bred in some hound. But they're going pretty good right now. Once he gets them lined out, he just doesn't quite have the leaders. And here comes our next team, number 21. Yeah, this should be Yuri Goryunov out of uh, Moscow. And he ran the Volga... 2014 he's from a region close to finland and uh those guys look really really good as well those okay so we we had those screwed up that was actually yuri gurian all okay, that exactly. was first and that was just arseny turi human that came through and so we, we were watching the tracker a minute ago and, and evidently the the was tracker was lagged behind and so we got those switched up so again to repeat that was gary yunoff that was uh, the first, first team the second team across the crossing here and then arseny turi human the defending champion that's closing in on him and right now we we're close to watching a, a pass live here at the road crossing and uh Aris, that's the third team there. He's 23 years old, kind of new at mushing. He's from the people that know geography of Russia. It's by the Lake Bacall area. I really see him, the way he's handling his dogs, is like a young and up-and-coming, really strong musher. And I like the, the breed of dog, the kind of dog he's running, the Alaskan Husky. Yeah, so we've got three teams now across the road crossing here. First, it was Slava Depchenko, as we turn and address the camera. And then... Uh, it was uh, Yuri Gurionov that we then saw uh, pass through. He's from the, the region close to Finland. And then Turi Uman, uh, the former defending champion that also went across. We saw three pretty good teams cross this, this road. Yeah, they're actually racing. I mean, that's three teams within sight of each other. And 
two of them had out ski poles and were really yeah. pushing. So, and so now let's talk race strategy a little bit. Is it too early in this length of race to be pushing? Because they're pushing at like a mid distance pace. Yeah, I could see that by how they were kicking and polling. But they do have, as we know, up ahead they've got a six hour layover coming. So that's a big rest in a race of this length. But. Uh, those those dogs are actually racing. They're not just traveling this trail from what I saw just then. And I'm wondering, with the teams that are in second and third place, do they have an advantage with their team knowing that somebody's in front and dogs the way they get excited and trying to chase down the team in front of them? Did we just see teams moving a little faster than we normally would have? Well, it's a little bit of both. What I see, I walk this trail both directions for a while, and there is a nice base, but but it isn't a smooth pack trail. So the first teams are setting the tracks, the actual runners, where it's going to be a little easier for the teams that are following. But also, it's the type of situation where, to explain for mushers here, uh, mushers that are following this race from anywhere in the world, this is the type of trail that if you put 50 dog teams on it, it would completely fall apart into sugar snow, yeah. which means there's a nice little crust to run on, but after a while, there's not much base underneath. But uh, these front th three are close enough. There's really no advantage except the very first team is setting the scent and the tracks on the trail for the teams that are following. Yeah, pretty fantastic. We got a great race coming. I just, before we cut it off here and wait for the other two teams, I just want to walk over here. I find this very, very interesting. Odd, our camera guy, and Odd, if you can pan out there and you can see all this stubble, it almost looks like we're standing near a cornfield, but actually those are sunflowers. So we're, we're in an area of Russia where they grow sunflowers. Probably we enjoy those sunflower seeds all over the world, and we may be watching where they're growing right here in Russia. Let's go back to the studio. We've got more teams coming in a little bit. Thanks, Greg. And uh, now, Nina, we saw the three first mushers. What yeah. do you think? Uh, well, I do agree with what Bruce just said, that some of these uh, mushers, uh, two of the teams, have, do have a uh, mid-distant pace. I mean... We're not used to seeing teams going in mid-distant paces uh, in the long-distance race in uh, Norway. In that, I mean, it's hard to say. I wasn't there. It's, I just saw the team from the side and from behind. But I do feel some of the teams do have a bit too high speed um, compared to the distance. And as you also saw, one of the teams that uh, was Goriano, he did have problems with his lead dog, wanted to pass across the road. Uh, maybe the dog is a bit too shy of people and the spectators, because we also saw that on the starting line. Uh, we also saw that there was a, a loose dog. Did you see that? There was a loose dog on the t uh, trail. That's probably some village dog from one of the settlements or villages they passed through. So I'm sure they'll uh, do. Uh, they do meet some loose dogs um, who are not from the race. Did you experience that, Steinar, when you were there? I cannot remember seeing any loose dogs and uh, no stray dogs, as far as I can remember. So that was not a problem. But but it it, it might have been so without having actually me remembering it. But I, but I will I'll just uh, say the same as uh, uh, Masher says here that um, uh, we we see that there is a potential for. Uh, for educating the lead dogs in a better way mm. for at least some Russian mushers. We saw that on the on the starting line for the one mushroom question and, and also on the road crossing here, that uh, the, the speed or the direction of the, of the, of the team didn't follow the track and it was a bit confusion there. Mm. And uh, that's... That is something for a new beginner, but uh, it, it shouldn't be the, the fact when you are a, a, a developed musher or an experienced musher. No. Well, Maria, I do think uh, they have different training schedules and different training opportunities. Some of these measures than we are used to uh, in uh, Alaska or Canada or Europe. Um, I do know that Demchenko, he only has one round of 2.2 kilometers or 1.2 miles. 
That's one round, and he trains on that round going in circles all the time, 1.2 miles or 2.2 kilometers, round and round and round. So he does not have a fast team on the trails, <coughs> on the hard trails, because in this round is all, always just water and mud, and that's where he trains his dog, round and round. And that's got to be more like 1,600 rounds on this a training loop as uh, Demchenko has. Uh, well, I've done some mathematics here because uh -huh. he, he's ha he has about 3,000, 3,500 kilometers before the race season. That's pretty, that's okay uh, if he's doing uh, shorter, long distance races. But I mean, going one loop 1,590 times, and that's your only training ability. And then you bring your dog team to another part of Russia to compete or outside mm. of Russia to compete. And then you meet people, you meet snow for maybe for not the first time, but you meet oh, totally different conditions. Mm. So of course, like Demchenko or some other Russia, they might have uh, challenges they have not been trained the dog team for. So that's what we might, uh, might have seen here now, crossing the, uh, the road. The dogs didn't want to cross. New challenges for the teams. Yes, and we still have two teams left to go. Greg and Bruce are at the trail in Sosnovi. Okay. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Winter Crossing. Uh, Greg and Bruce, and we have now got Mikhail Fativ from Tyumen, Russia. He's got fast dogs, uh, Siberians and Alaskans, kind of a mix. He was finished second place in 2014 and 16. And so this is our fourth team coming to the road crossing right now. And certainly this team's still within range of those first three teams that we saw. But what do you see uh, to this point, Bruce? A little slower pace, not quite the fast cadence of those front three, but... It's only been minutes since they've gone yeah. through. So this uh, far into the race, these guys are all really close together, more than I would have guessed at this point. And they're moving really nicely. Yeah, Mikel wearing bib number 15. He was the first to leave Sharievo at the start line uh, earlier this morning. And, and again, uh, that team kind of charged when it saw this road crossing, and they went across it quite nicely. Yeah, they did really well. And again, he has some of these... Uh, these hound husky crosses, Alaskan husky crosses that you see in a lot of the sprint races like in uh, uh, the North American and the Fur Rendezvous. But he's, you know, he's behind them, but he's just a minutes behind them, really. And obviously he stopped here and he's going to take a look and, and maybe put another booty on a dog. Maybe one of the, the dogs is throwing a booty, so he's going to replace it now and take a little time to do that. And obviously, uh, way too early to be worried about who's up in front of him. He's well within range, and, and it sets up as the run to Karmali continues now for these four teams, but changing a booty out here, and that could have happened at any time. Yeah, well, uh, how do your dogs take a little more foot care? And this is a very crystalline snow, so... It's a good thing to be taking care of them like that, their feet, particularly in hounds. But another thing we should point out, he's, he started with only seven dogs, and he's competing with these 10 and 11 dog teams. And uh, so he has a little smaller dog team, but also a little lighter weight dog. That's So uh, he doesn't have quite the power of those first three teams we saw going through, particularly two of those teams. So if our math is right, uh, the teams left Sherry Avo, and they're headed to Karmali, where they have to take a mandatory six hours rest there at Karmali or on the way back through Karmali. And it's about a 62-kilometer run today that they're in. So we're guessing. We don't have the exact distance, but we're guessing they're uh, out of that 62. They're probably 40 or 45 kilometers into this run today. And so right now you're looking at Mikel Fativ. Uh, taking a, a break right now to, to change out some booties here at the Winter Crossing. And he's probably 20 kilometers or so from Karmali. So to, ca to kind of repeat, we've had Slava Depchenko go through, followed by Yuri Goryonov and then Arseny Turyumin. Uh, who and I believe Arseny then passed uh, Yuri uh, not far from our site here. Those three were all close enough. They were basically just together. Yeah, it seemed like within a hundred yards of one another. You could almost throw a baseball and hit each other. But and right now again, you're looking at 
uh, fatigue and taking his time and, and making sure that all of his dog's feet are protected. And Bruce, you talked about that this morning. This is the type of snow uh, that is very granular and can take a dog a toll on, on dog's feet if they're not uh, making sure that the booties stay on. Yeah, it's a real crystalline type of snow where it's had a temperature change. It's a little icier. And uh, as we said, setting this race up, this is a place that's kind of in a pocket of its own uh, here in Russia of the exchange of knowledge that has been shared in so many other places. And when we had that little symposium last night, impromptu Dallas and I, the mushers asked us to come. The subject of booties was one they were really asking about because booties aren't always worn in some of these areas like they are in long distance races. And Dallas and I were stressing the importance of performance is matched with dog care and the importance of, of booting and the great materials that are now available. And so I was really pleased to see today when all these teams left the starting line, they had their dogs booted for the most part. And if you're watching the coverage prior to the start, it was uh, Mikel Fatih's sled that, that Bruce and I were standing next to and talking near the start line. And we noticed that there was an extra cross-country ski that was sticking out of the side of the sled. And it was interesting because his runners are basically cross-country skis that he has bolted to the bottom. Yeah, they're really uh, they're really thin in the tails, which we pointed out, and the fact that he's carrying an extra one with yes. him shows that he has the knowledge that this thing may break if the trail gets rough out here. But uh, I, I'm actually just really glad to see him take the time to take a break and it, early in the race when you need to be really taking care of these dogs' feet and their conditioning and making sure all the boots are good. Uh, there's also the aspect that on a softer trail, and he's a little bit farther behind, they might be punching through the top of the trail, the, uh, the base. And so then you have to make sure that you're not getting little snowballs built up around what we would call the wrist area that can, can be aggravating to the dog. So just checking them all, taking his time, and that's a good thing because you have to have in mind the vision of not today, but two days from now and how those dogs are going to be feeling. And again, you, I, I'm impressed. And uh, it, the message kind of brings home as we sit and watch Mikel Fatih take his time, be patient with this team. Uh, these are slow moving events. And really the Iditarod or the Fairman or the Bear Grease, they're all when you consider teams are going seven to 10 miles an hour, that's a really slow moving event. You've got to take your time and make sure that all the pieces are in place, be detail oriented because on these trails, anything that can happen and, and go wrong, most certainly will find a way to do that. And so Mikel taking some time right now to care for his dogs and make sure that the feet are covered and so that he has no foot problems or pad problems as this race uh, continues down. And, and again, he's not even, 40 or 50 miles into the race you had a long way to go and it is an important time to care for dogs but if they get a problem with a with a foot and even the first 20 miles then you have to deal with that for the rest of the race so it's better to take care of them right in the beginning so they're feeling good the whole way and that equals speed but you know another thing we might point out to the mushing community people that race dogs at mid distance and long distances few of these mushers like this guy are wearing backpacks with probably what appears to be like 25 30 pounds of supplies in there rather than having it in their sleds and that's just something i don't think other than one or two times i've ever seen in the quest or the iditarod or even mid-distance races and again Mikel taking his time going dog by dog uh, partner by partner up that line to make sure that all the dogs and their feet are bootied up and and again that backpack it does look heavy from this vantage point what an opportunity for the fans out there watching to kind of peer in and see a few minute minutes of what it's like for a musher when they're not moving on the trail and how much time you have to spend bent over uh, and the toll that that takes on mushers backs you know it's throughout the years covering these races uh, it is a very physical thing for these guys that are bent over all the time taking care of these dogs, what? whether they're feeding or changing booties. Booties are one of the most monotonous and painful things mushers deal with because exactly what you said, Greg, they're bent, you're bent over all the time. 
And, you know, if you're taking care of seven or eight dogs, it's not so much when you get in races where you've got 16. You know, that takes a long time, but you're just constantly bent over, checking booties, pulling little snowballs off, checking their wrist, and that is the fatigue that ends up in a lot of, it run all the mushers' backs after a day or two. And the mushers are lucky. You know, it's not a particularly cold day today. It might be three or four degrees below Celsius, uh, maybe 27, 28 degrees on the Fahrenheit scale, but there's a nice breeze up here, Bruce, that kind of keeps things cooled off. And you can see, Mikel, they're not really in a parka, more in uh, just a Gore-Tex cover that's keeping the wind off of him. And it's uh, one of those days it's quite easy to stay warm. Yeah, it's it's really pretty. This breeze is making it nice for the dogs. And on top of that, it's not super sunny out here. I mean, it may look bright on camera. I don't know. But there is a cloud cover, so you just don't have that feeling of the sun baking on the dogs. But, uh, but yeah, the breeze is really nice for them. And, and in these hound deer teams, this is almost perfect because they don't have the thick coats of the more pure... Uh, thick furred uh, Alaskan Huskies are particularly the si Siberian team that's still coming behind us here. Yeah, yeah. that final team that uh, out of these five that we're still waiting for is Alexei Dudkin. Uh, he's from the Chuvash Republic of Russia and uh, he finished this race back in 2016. We're still waiting for him as we continue to watch Mikhail Fativ and he's going literally foot by foot through his team and it appears that he's taking some booties off and putting different ones on and so is there a change in materials and booties that would would make a difference or maybe he's just bought some new ones that he doesn't like as much as other ones and so he's just changing them out for those reasons well i don't think that he's really changing materials i mean i think he's just some dogs have might need one booty some might need all four some might need two it's just getting any uh, booties off of them that might have accumulated a little snow inside. If you're not a musher, just imagine putting some grains of coarse sand in your yes, shoe. We've all had that. And go for a run, and before long, you, you know, it gets aggravating. You get a blister. So for the non-mushing community, uh, there's two things. You can get snow built up around the top of the booty, or you can get snow down in it. And that's why mushers have to constantly stop and take care of those you know the mushers that have run a lot of race races uh this is <clears throat> all just common knowledge but like you mentioned earlier greg we're kind of reaching out around the world to bring yeah. even the more elementary aspects of this sport to the public and booties are just something that are done not to help with an injury but to prevent the same as we all get up every day and put our yes. shoes on yes. and to protect our feet so you can go on about your day and on about your work well it's the same with these dogs the booties are preventative and so it's important to constantly take care of them it would be like uh, if you're a climber or a hiker you wear two pairs of socks so that you don't get blisters, right? It's more of a prevention thing, and it's nice to have moleskin, but generally moleskin doesn't go on until you already have a blister. Exactly, and yeah. that's not what's going on here. This is a preventative thing to make sure the dogs, it's just the old thing, no feet, no soldier, yeah. no feet, no dog. Yeah. yeah, and so let me ask you this about rest. So obviously he's been sitting here for 15 minutes or so, so if he's here for another 10 minutes, does this 25-minute rest make a difference in the ultimate outcome? In uh, of race? As it far a, as enough? rest for the dogs, these kinds of breaks for a few minutes let them just kind of cool down and kind of catch their wind, but it doesn't really matter to the accumulative actual rest for a dog. Gotcha. It's actually, if you looked at it purely in that sense, it's lost minutes. Okay. But then again, they aren't totally lost as long as you're taking care of the dogs. If you need to change the booties, you just need to change the booties. And you know, part of that might be with him, the reason the others didn't stop at all and kept going. They're on the beginning of this trail, and I mentioned earlier, as more teams go over this trail, it's going to get punched out. And if you put 50 dog teams on here, it turned pretty much to sugar snow. His dogs may be punching through a little bit more and getting more of that loose, granular type of snow. So he has to be more aware. So there's advantages and disadvantages to being in front, and there's advantages and disadvantages to being in the back. And 
you just kind of have to play the cards as they are for the location on the trail and the condition that you're in. Yeah, there's something about the booties that he's not liking. I, I see him put them on, take them off, put them on, take them off. And so is it possible that some of them got balled up and so he's putting them in his coat to warm them up so he can put new ones on? Do you ever do that as a musher? No, no. that's not really okay. a thing. I, I I, think he's just going to individual dogs that uh, have different little issues that that he's dealing with. And I mean, the, the difference is this. In most of the races that the world has seen and that you've covered yourself, we see mushers at checkpoints, but you don't see them live out on the trail. Yes, yeah. Okay, so yeah. what this is, it might seem like, why isn't he going? Well, this is something mushers do on the trail all the time that's normally hidden from the public. And what we're doing here is because we happen to be at a place and we have live coverage. For people that run dogs, it's nothing to stop along the trail for 10 to 15 minutes and go through your dogs and take care of them. And you might go, well, it's a race. Why aren't they going? Because it's in long events, you have to think of the big picture at the end. And so what we're really getting right now is the insight of a day-to-day -day life of a musher on the trail. It's not always push, push, push. It's stop and take care of the little details. Yeah, let's walk across the road here. We can get a closer vantage point. So maybe we can peer in and see what's happening. And, you know, what's different about this race, Bruce, if, if this was the Iditarod or the Bear Grease or even the Fairman, uh, as reporters, we would probably be walking over there and, and try to get a quick question and answer and figure out what exactly he's doing. But he speaks Russian. We don't. And so we're at uh, a standstill as far as asking him exactly what's happened. Well, on top of that. I mean, he may be within our range here, but on top of that, he's working right now. And it's not a break where he's stopping and feeding, and you have the opportunity when they're done with their chores to go over and get a little insight about how their race is going. But you're actually just seeing a musher stop on the trail and how they take care of their dogs. So. And I did notice that he started to put his gloves back on, so I think he's getting close or closer to going at this point that or else his hands just got really cold but I, I would imagine Bruce is you know this being somewhat of a warm day but when it's 30 or 40 below zero and you've got to stop and change all the booties on your dogs uh, that can be very difficult on your hands yeah that is uh, one of the joys of booting dogs <laughs> and but but also another important thing people don't realize what he's actually doing right now yeah is picking up his booties, his trash off the trail, and that's you're not. Can you reuse them. You you can reuse them. You can hang, take them home, get them dried out. You know, booties. We talked about that last night. You know, on a long race uh, at Dallas, and I would send out 1,200 booties on Iditarod. Well, they all cost, and yeah. but then they become training booties, so they have value. But the more important thing is, mushers in any race, whether it's this race in Russia or in Norway or. Uh, on the Iditarod, part of the rules are you don't leave trash along the trail. You're responsible to clean. You get to run through these areas. You're also supposed to take care of them. So he pulled out a little trash bag to pick up his, his used booties, and then he can take them to the checkpoint. You can hang them up, get them dry, and then use them later in training or even other races if all they need to do is dry. The trouble if you take too long and what he's dealing with now is after you wait a while and the dogs that have had their booties on they start ta they learn they how to take them they off do. so it's this thing you go to the back and you replace one and then you look up front and somebody else has taken them off so you walk up and you take that one <laughs> yeah. and you put it back on then you turn around and the one in the back's got yeah. the booty off yeah. again so you really have to be quick and you have to be efficient and then get going again because they're only held down by a velcro strap or a uh, band that goes around the top of the booty and so the dogs have figured out very easily that they watch the musher put it on i can just grab it with my teeth and pull it right back off and uh and off they come and so it starts the whole process over again you're looking at mikhail fatib he's in fourth place here at the volga quest 2020 we've had three teams in front of him it started with uh, slava depchenko who came through first and then yuri goryunov out of moscow came through and he was followed by the defending champion arseny or, or sorry i'm sorry arseny turiyuman 
And and I think that Arseni then shortly passed Yuri. Within uh, after, sight of us. Yeah, here. within yeah. sight of us when they crossed this road crossing here called Winter Crossing. And you're now looking at Mikhail Fatiev uh, running a, a mix of Siberians and Alaskans, finishing second in 2014 and 16. And again, this is a team that uh, was dubbed as a, a fast team, uh, that it was going to be interesting to see if it could keep its pace, keep its speed through a race of this distance. And, and the mittens uh, have gone on Mikhail, so that tells me he's a about ready to go and up goes the snow hook and again only seven dogs compared to the larger teams and so ladies and yeah Mikel Fatih back on the trail now in fourth place here at the and he's stopping and what just doing their business Bruce most likely yeah after a little break we'll see here he's yeah somebody had to relieve themselves and off they go Okay, Mikel Fatih back on the trail in fourth place of the Volga Quest 2020. Off into the distance he goes. He is chasing Slava Depchenko, followed by Arseny Turiyumin and Yuri Goryunov. And so it is Mikel Fatih in fourth place on the move. And Bruce and I will continue to be here at the road crossing. And we're waiting for Alexei Dudkin to come next. He finished the race back in 2016. He's from Chuvash Republic out of Russia. So keep it right here. We'll throw it back to the studio for now. I think we have three spans in the middle. Yes, that's what I think.
welcome back to Krill Pet Arctic World Series. We're in our third race of the series, which is the Volga Quest in Russia. Now, before we begin, uh, we'll take a look at what's coming up today. We'll get to know the five long distance measures and how they did in the three first stages of the race. We will talk to Arseny Tyurymin and Slava Djemchenko at the Karmali checkpoint. Our reporter is checking in on the spectators as many school children has come to watch the race. Well, uh, so far, some have, uh, measures have actually reached the first checkpoint. Yeah, Maria, that's right. We have uh, waiting for one team uh, to the checkpoint. Otherwise, the uh, other four teams have uh, be, uh, come to the checkpoint and also one team has actually passed through. Yes, and we'll take some uh, a look at the pictures here yeah. as they arrive at Karmale checkpoint. Yeah. This is Demchenko coming into the checkpoint of Karmale. Uh, with Slava Demchenko uh, raising 11 dogs and his dog's uh, team looks energetic. That's a good, nice looking dog team coming in here. And uh, so he's the number one so far, the first one out, right? Uh, well, he's, yeah, he's into the checkpoint now, but there is another team who has passed through the checkpoint already, Gurionov. Uh, maybe come later, back to that later. But uh, this is Demchenko, and uh, he is uh, taking his six hour mandatory rest at the Karmali checkpoint. Uh, you can decide if you want to do the six hour mandatory here at Karmali 1, or if you want to take the loop and come back and do it at Karmali 2. If you want to do it at Karmali 2, you have to go for an additional 72 kilometers before you're able to rest. So uh, he's going to take a six hour here, as I've been told, and um, uh, he uh, will have a well-rested team for the night run further on. What do we see here? What are they doing? Uh, this is a veterinarian, probably checking a sore wrist at the front legs of this dog, wheel dog. Uh, yeah, he's bending and checking the front legs. This is uh, probably a veterinarian with a mark on his arm here. Uh, or some race official. No, it's a veterinarian. I think he's trying to, to yeah. Well, maybe you, Steiner, can uh, tell yeah, us a little bit about the, the uh, routines. I'm just uh, seeing the, the pictures, as uh, both of you also. And it's, it seems to me that uh, this is one of the trail vets at the race. And uh, obviously they have a, um, a routine on the race. They will have a checkup on the dogs on the checkpoints. So I guess they will go through all uh, dogs uh, competing to see that uh, joints uh, and uh, body in general are fit for further fights. Well, this is a little bit different from what we would see in uh, Scandinavian or Euro American and Canadian European races, other European races. Uh, normally the team will uh, lay down in the straw and rest and the veterinarians will come and check the teams uh, when the dogs are at. Uh, it will bite the straw and... Uh, Laying down. Yeah, okay. here uh, the measure just arrived to the checkpoint and it's a little bit strange, uh, strange to see that uh, the veterinarian is yeah. checking it right away. What do you think? Yeah, I think it also seems a little bit uh, different from what we are used to in, in our races. Yeah. There are, yeah. What did you do when you were a veterinarian at Volga Quest? Did you check the dogs where they were lying down or while they were standing up? Uh, actually both. Uh, it was a it was a race under development uh, while I was there, so it was always changes <laughs> in what was happening from one day to another. So uh, our regime that, at that time was to, I think we should take take a check up on the dogs two times through the race was our schedule, as far as I can recall. Mm. And uh, we also have another musher, Arseny Tyurymin, and we'll take a look at when he's coming into the checkpoint, uh, Karmali. How do you think these dogs look like, Nina? This is a nice looking team, and this is a young musher, uh, Tyurymin. He was uh, last year's uh, winner. 
as I recall, and uh, he has big ambitions. And look at the teams, the dogs are waving their tails, they're uh, barking of joy, and uh, he's taking care of them, giving them a, a hug, <laughs> and thanking every dog coming into the checkpoint. That's a very good thing to see that the measures actually thank each of the dogs arriving to the checkpoint. That means he really cares about his dogs. I like that. And the dogs are happy. You see, they're shaking, they're waving their tails. And he's, uh, he's done a good race. I oh, expect him to climb uh, before the finish line on the results. Yeah. So this is a guy, boy with a uh, good high ambitions. Yeah, that's a happy looking lead, lead dogs. And they're not very tired. These dogs have uh, been trained good for this race. And he will also uh, rest here, do you think? Oh, yes, uh, he, he is rest. he'll rest here. Uh, he'll take a six-hour mandatory rest here. We have that confirmed. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and what will uh, Arseni do then? Will he sleep or do you think he will... <laughs> oh, Arseni, do? now he needs to take care of his dogs. So that means he needs to get them bedded down on some straw or hay. So that's what the official is doing right now. It's helping Arseni's dogs or Chermeni's dogs to the place where they're going to sleep. And look, they're so full of energy. There's, yeah, they just want to still pull hard. So he's going to lay his dogs down on straw. Oops, <laughs> a little tangled up there. Um, yeah, that's where he's going to stay. He's going to put on the straw and he's going to make food and take care of his dogs. Maybe give them a massage. This, what is good here now is that this is the middle of the day or uh, in Russia here in, uh, in the Volga Quest. And he's now giving his dogs lots of good rest for six hours uh, plus a mandatory time adjustment in, from the time in, uh, start intervals. Uh, and he'll give them rest in the heat of the day. So this will be the warmest part of the day because of the day, daylight and, and, uh, and the sun. So this is good. The, sun, the dogs will get rest when it's warm. And when after these six hours, uh, it's getting colder, it's getting nighttime, and that's when he can keep on moving. Well-rested dogs, cooler temperature. So, so I would absolutely recommend to rest at Carmeli 1. And he will travel throughout the entire night then? Yes, because the next leg will be 72 kilometers, uh, more or less, and then he'll be back at Karmali too, because there are no checkpoints in between. So he'll have a five hour, uh, if the kilometers are right or the miles are right, he'll have about four, uh, five hour um, uh, race during the night and then get back to Karmali too. Yeah. Uh, Steiner, uh, do you think, do you know if the handlers can help uh, the mushers at these checkpoints? No, I think they, uh, they have to take care of their dogs all by themselves. Yeah. Uh, so whatever is done by feeding, uh, check up on the dogs, uh, massage and everything, they have to do it all by themselves. I think it is like other competitions also, they, they will have to drag all the, um, the, the food and the straw and everything to the, to the stakeout area for their dogs. And... Um, it all depends on uh, the mushroom's uh, way of doing it all by himself. Yes. Well, um, yeah, well, Maria, I'll just comment that. Uh, yeah, the handlers are allowed to bring the food for the dogs to the checkpoint of Carmali. But all the snack and the extra food the musher or the dogs need for the rest of the race, they have to pick up here and carry in their sled. Yes. So Carmali is the only checkpoint. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, also uh, competitions of being the best musher. We also have some pictures of uh, Yuri Gurionov, who's the third musher into the checkpoint of Karmali. And uh, Nina, how does uh, this uh, dog team look like? Oh, well, they're wearing a tail. So this guy, one of the, uh, his uh, swing dogs are actually chewing on the uh, tug lines, which means it's full of energy. And uh, of course, these dogs are understanding that they're coming to a, pe a place where there are lots of other dogs and people. They have lots of energy. Uh, He's got eight dogs. I know one of his lead dogs was a bit too shy for the spectators. So we might expect the one of the lead dogs to be a little bit uh, shy coming in here now, because he had to carry it out for one lead dog on the slide out from the start line, because it was too afraid of the spectators and the people watching. But now the team is happy. Yeah, the waiting tells one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight dogs. And what he's doing right now is actually pulling straight through. We're seeing a team not, this is the first team, not stopping at Karmali 1. This musher, um, Yuri Gurionov, he has now decided to pull straight through the checkpoint uh, and go 
all the way back to Karmali too before taking a six hour mandatory rest. Yes. Uh, what do, does the dogs look uh, look energetic to you? Oh yes, yes, uh, I think so. Yeah. They were really out on a fast track today. It seems like. Mm -hmm. yeah. The dogs looks a bit different from uh, the other uh, types of dogs. Yeah. Uh, well, Guriano and also Fatiev has more houndy dogs than the other measures. Well, let's say Dudkin, uh, Alexey Dudkin, he has a Siberian Husky purebred team. The other measures have still in the race have Alaskan Huskies, but Fateyev and Guriano have more bird dog breed bred into the Alaska Huskies, which means that they are more houndy. They have more speed, like they are more bred for sprint or mid-distance races. So it's a bit mm. unusual to see because they also have a shorter coat. Uh, I noticed that uh, Gurionov, he, actually, he was uh, shouting something or saying something while he was passing through. What do you think that could be? Oh, he probably just wanted to get the attention from his dogs to, to make sure they kept to the left instead of going right into the checkpoint. He wanted to go straight through and the trail was probably just going on the left side. So he would probably shout something like uh, left, left, uh, uh, go through, go through or whatever you they say in Russian. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we're not that familiar with Russian uh, right now, but uh, our reporter, Carrie Ann, she is at the checkpoint Karmali right now. Let's hear from her. Yes, Dallas, we've been watching three mushers coming to the checkpoint now, two of them. Arseni and Slava, they yep. decide to stay here for six hours, but there was one guy that just went back. Yuri just uh, went on through, um, seemed to have a similar run time to the other guys. Uh, they all came in very close together, uh, saying that they did the run at pretty much the same speed. So two of them came in here to take their six hour break. Yuri went on through. You know, it's it's going to be curious to see what he does from here. So he may go up to Ulara. Uh, he may come all the way back to here and take a six, which would mean he's going to have a, a decent lead, but a slow time after that. The advantage that these guys have is they're getting the six hour out of the way. They'll see what he does and if they need to adjust to be able to catch up with him. What would you do in this situation coming here? You know, we're looking at it's about two o'clock. Um, it's not super hot out today, but these guys are going to get the advantage of having a nice rest when it's warm out for the dogs. And then if they stay here for six hours, they leave at 8 p.m. It's going to be a very nice time to travel with dogs. Generally, I like to put more rest earlier in the race. Um, I think on this one, I would have pl probably be taking my six right here with these guys. Well, we're going we're gonna to talk to these guys afterwards and ask them why they've decided to stay for six hours and uh, we'll wait for the more teams to come in. Thank you. So Dallas would have stayed there for six hours uh, the first time he came to Karmali. What would you have done? Oh, absolutely. I would do the same. I mean, it's never wrong to take rest early in the race. You will gain a lot of advantage by taking early rest. And we're talking about a long distance race, but for me, 215 kilometers, which is this part of the race, the last part of the Volga Quest, 215 kilometers is not actually very long. I, I mean, a well trained dog team have no problems going 250 kilometers non stop without mandatory rest. <clears throat> but here you have six hours, you need to take those six hours. Mm. Yes. And uh, absolutely, I would spend those hours in the sun of the mid of the day here at Carvalho One and have the advantage of cooler temperatures traveling at night, just as Dallas said. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. You're nodding, uh, Steinar. Yes, I, I, uh, I agree with Nina. Well, you know, Steinar, uh, he's been mushing himself. He's been yeah. doing uh, competitions himself. I, so. had to, I have tried it. I have run the famous lap at one time myself. So I, I, um, I have tried it. And Why did you try mushing? Uh, since I uh, have been vetting races for many years, I think it was appropriate that I also knew what it was all about. So I borrowed dogs for a season and trained them and uh, completed the uh, shorter families than it's one year. Was it fun? Really fun. Yeah. <laughs> now we'll talk to uh, the mushers uh, at the Karir Mali checkpoint. Mm. You were the first one to come to the finish. Could you explain a little bit of how you see this first stage? Uh, Первый этап какой? Эту часть? Отличная дорога. Все идеально ровно. Идеальная трасса. Погода хорошая, то, что надо для собак сейчас. Жестковато немножко, но все равно классно, хорошо. 
um, he says um, it was a uh, good day, good weather, good trip. The uh, road is a little bit hard, but uh, the dogs come good through, so it's a good stage for him. So how are your dogs doing? How's your team doing? Ой, они отлично. Так, немножко там понатирали лапы, а так хорошо все. Ну, тапочками натерли, не об снег, а именно тапочками там немножко. They're doing awesome. They're a little bit, uh, uh, get a little bit some hurt through the dark shoes, but not through the snow. But all in all, they're doing awesome. And you're going to wait here for six hours? Да, обязательно. Обязательный отдых 6 часов, чтобы потом э, можно было уже самому решать, когда остановить на, на отдых, и чтобы не, не приехать в конце э, и нервничать, переживать за то, что там все ушли вперед, а я стою 6 часов отдыхаю. He takes no necessary breaks that afterwards when he is under uh, tracks that he can decide when he stops that he didn't have to stand here and to see what the others do and he can't move. So this is his decision. And you saw uh, Yuri, he went, went by. What do you think about that? Ну, я не приветствую такие <laughs> решения. Может, у него какой-то свой план, на самом деле, это его личное дело, то есть, может, какой-то специальный план, но тогда он будет отдыхать точно на обратном пути. Я буду знать точно, где он находится на трассе. <laughs> He say um, it's not this uh, his way what he starts off, and um, he didn't appreciate it. But everybody has his own uh, strategy, and he says, and he have to stand when they come back and to see, and he really know where he is, and he can decide how he makes a race. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Спасибо. 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 Now that was uh, Diemchenko, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what do you think? Uh, he was say, uh, talking about the, the he was he was doing awesome, but something about the dog booty. So I didn't catch up. Uh, you uh, see that the what he was doing right now is he was uh, he was putting an ointment or cream. Uh, like uh, with zinc in it on the paws. He put the zinc inside the paws and on the paws to, to make them softer. And probably the Velcro from the dog booty, uh, the Velcro from the dog booty is making a little mark uh, above the, the extra claw the dog has on the front legs. So it might be a bit of a, like a rub from the Velcro on the dog booty. So he put some ointment there as well. Yes. Is this uh, a veterinarian? This is what, uh, no, this, uh, this Oh, sorry? Is this a veterinarian? No, this is Dem Demchenko himself. Oh, it's, yes. Okay. Yeah, because it is Demchenko yeah. himself, because he's the only one allowed to take care of his dogs, and the veterinarian will give advice and help if something needed. But he has to, the musher him or herself needs to take care of the dogs. So he's now taking care of his dogs and giving them a massage, and they probably had some food. And now the dogs will rest on the straw and the hay for six hours and also eat and drink. And now when he's finished with all this, he is able to uh, go um, and get some food himself. And I'm sure maybe he'd like to stretch his back a little bit as well. Yes. Yeah, but you, you talked about that, Nina, uh, or uh, Maria, you asked about uh, if they would go to, for sleep. It's only six hours and uh, time flies when you are out on the checkpoint. And since the distance is not more than 215 kilometers altogether, you do not have time or a need for a sleep. For sleep. Uh, oh, and Maria, we also, and Sandra, we also have to remember that in this race, we have the first part of the race, which was uh, the, the stage race for three days. Mm -hmm. And then all these teams had a day off yesterday. Mm. So they actually had a regular day with no activities yesterday and the mushers have been sleeping in their beds or in their hotels or whatever for many days or also night for, uh, before the start. So at this point they've been on the sled for four, five, four, hour, four hours today. I don't think they were tired. No. So basically you don't, you don't need to sleep much for 250 kilometers if you're a musher. Um, but the dogs, of course, they will have a lot of nice rest now at Karmali 1. Yes, and we will talk uh, more to Arseni Tyriumin, uh, another musher who came in second. So tell me, you're at the first checkpoint now, and, and explain to me uh, how did you how you experience this first leg? Arseni, you're now at the first checkpoint. How did you feel the first step of this race? Well, normal, calm. The road is a bit of a difficult one. Вот. Ну, есть некоторые проблемы с собаками. Один у меня захромал, скорее всего, я его сниму. Да, скорее, я его точно сниму. 
Вот, а дальше, дальше посмотрим. Сейчас главное отдохнуть, восстановиться и продолжим гонку. Uh, track was uh, it's, it's a little bit difficult it's not so easy route he coming good through he sees that one of his dogs think he will maybe take off one dog and now he's they take some rest he take it slowly and then he will go on after the rest so which dog is it one of your lead dogs that's uh, having a problem or the second one Hank he is his, uh, his uh, leader in reservoir So you're going to have a six hour rest and then you will decide after that? Uh, it seems so he took no his decision and he will take it off. Okay, thank you so much. We'll talk to you a little bit later. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, Arsene Thuryumin. And uh, did you notice anything special here, uh, Nina? Well, I just uh, think uh, Thuryumin looks like a uh, very... Uh, Yeah, well, he's uh, more seems more experienced. Uh, well, he does it more the way we would um, the way we do it here in the uh, other European races or in the other races of long distance. He puts coats on his dogs and he takes care of his dogs in a very nice way. And he talks about one dog he's unsure about, so he's uh, making a decision. He want to drop his dog, that dog, so he'll be down to nine dogs. But what I recognize, which is a bit different, you see that these dog lead dogs, they have their necklines between their collars. And uh, normally, uh, when you have dogs resting, you will uh, make sure the dogs are uh, attached uh, only at one point to their collar. Here, the lead dogs were attached between the two of them and also at the tug line uh, from the harness behind and back to the gang line, which means these dogs can't move around very freely because they're attached to their lines at two places. Uh, I didn't get enough time to see the other dogs, but uh, what I hope that, uh, that he will do is to make sure the dogs are only attached to their collars when they rest, because that makes the dogs stretch out and move around a little bit more freely instead of being attached both at the back of the harness and also in the front. Mm. Mm. Is so that, uh, uh, that could be my, uh, a little bit of lack of uh, experience, because you can see that as well other places when you are a beginner, you don't forget to take off the 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 um, the, li the lines to, to they unclip un clip the dogs in yes. one point. But uh, Steinar, is that something a veterinarian can uh, talk to them about or let them know? Uh, yes, it, it can be, uh, and I guess uh, a well-trained veterinarian would actually inform them about that and give them that piece of advice that mm. they should do that so to allow the dog to to move more freely when on the gang line, on the checkpoint. Mm. But Maria, we do have to remember that we don't have uh, many races in Russia. They don't have the same uh, educational system or the, rec the system as uh, we, who, we have so much more races in the other countries. So they might have a little lack of education mm. about how to do things. And also maybe the veterinarians are not too sure about exactly how to do that. No. But this is what we see or I see as a dog mushroom for many, many years. Mm. Yeah. I would always make sure the dogs are only attached to the collar. Mm. Yes. And now we uh, get another musher in to the Kardmali checkpoint. Let's look at uh, Mikael Fatiev. Nina, what can we see here? Well, this is Fatiev with his seven dogs, a houndy dog is coming in. He has quite fast dogs, maybe a little too fast for uh, a, a, pure, a pure long distance race. You see he's like got long legged, very fast dogs. They look nice here now coming in. He's only got seven, which means he needs to be careful how he drives his dogs for the rest of the race, making sure he has enough dogs to cross the finish line. What we're seeing here now is that Fatiava is going to take a six hour rest at Karmale 1, mushing into the area where they stake out the dogs or let the dog rest. As we know, only one team has gone straight through and that was Guriano. So Fatia will rest here as uh, the third team coming into uh, resting here. And dogs waving their tails and 
I am sure he's gonna take care of his dogs and make sure they, the, the paws of the dogs are checked because I knew he had some problems with the paws earlier in the race. And uh, the veterinarians are checking. Steiner, do you recognize any of these veterinarians from your time in no. the Volga? No, they are all, they're all new to me, uh, at least those we have seen so far. But I know they are kind of creating new trade vet groups, so, um, uh, but they are new to me. What we're seeing here now is that Fatigev is trying to stretch out his dog team to put them to rest, um, but he's, maybe he's going to uh, switch the direction of the sleds to make the dogs rest. And looks like he has a female in heat here. There is one male very interested in the <laughs> back part here. Exactly. So I, I was just to say about that, and that can cause quite a good deal of problems yeah. while you have uh, females Female in heat and uh, bringing them with on uh, a competition or if they get into heat under the competition. It can cause l lots of problems, both within the team itself and also with uh, competing teams and passing each other since you have females in heat. What he's doing right now, he just actually turned the team around, but uh, I would have untouched some of the lines before he did that because the dogs are getting position backwards. But uh, another thing is that if you recognize that sled he's driving, I probably said something about that earlier, but that's actually a sprint sled. It's a very small sled. If you need to have a dog in the sled, you have to take something out from the sled and carry on your back instead to have enough space for the dog. Um, they have less mandatory equipment in the sled here in this race than they do have in the Famine, in the Aditrad or Bay of Greece. So they probably won't need such a big sled but because they don't have so much mandatory equipment. But still, this is a sled which would not be um, allowed if you want to do the Famine race. You have to have another sled uh, which has more space. There are certain rules. So this is a perfect sled in Norway if you want to do sprint races or maybe mid-distance, uh, which uh, a bit long distance. Uh, this is a too small sled for the long races. So there we, there we do see uh, quite a lot of differences here, but what he's doing right now will be the same as we do in other races, making sure the dogs are bedded down, I get taking the booties off. Uh, I would personally, I would prefer to work much faster than he does uh, to make sure the dogs are able to rest as much as possible. I think he uses a lot of time right now to talk to people. That's my opinion. Um, and uh, he should take off the booties pretty soon and also Put, uh, take out the straw, put out, bed down the dogs. Would you give them a big meal now or would you uh, wait before they go, after they've rested six hours? What I do, Maria, is that I always give my dogs a snack immediately when they get into the checkpoint, always. Like a 200 gram of meat, some kind of meat or salmon. And then I start taking out the booties and then I uh, untouch, the, untouch the, the tug lines and I bed down my dogs on the straw. And then I keep. And then when the dogs are getting tucked into the straw, I would start preparing the food. Or if it's warm, I would give them cold water. If it's warm, I mean minus five, ten degrees Celsius, I would give them fresh water. And I will also make them a good meal. And then make sure they have coats or blankets, whatever, depending on the temperature. It looked like it was a lot of stray and hay there. Uh, I haven't seen that much uh, straw uh, in other races. Well, we do have uh, like one bale. Of straw for each checkpoint per team uh, because like we do in the northern Norway it's hard to get enough straw transported to the checkpoint so we only have one bale of straw for each dog team at each checkpoint. Um, maybe they have a good quantity of straw here so it's good for the dogs because it's got to be a big nice soft bed. Mm. And our reporter uh, it, at uh, the checkpoint uh, she talked to Mikael Fateev. So, Mikael, you're the fourth one to come into this checkpoint. How how is the the first uh, stage for you today? Mikael, we are the fourth one to come into the checkpoint. How was the first stage of the checkpoint? I don't know. How was the first stage? It's hard. The dogs are tired a little bit. But I think we'll see what will happen. It was a little bit hard. The dogs are a little bit tired, but now they take a rest, and he will look forward. And uh, how is your your dogs? The, the you had some problem with their paws. For the, after the for two days ago, they're okay now. 
как ваши собаки их лапами? Они сейчас после этого этапа все в порядке? Ну, вот у этой сейчас будем мазать немножко. Mm -hmm. Где-то сбило. Mm -hmm. А так более-менее. On the first one, the wheeler on the right um, have a little bit little damage on the paw, but now he will take care of it and will look after the rest. Yes, the veterinary was happy with what he saw, he told us. The button held down, he should uh, change the dark shoes, but uh, he didn't get it. And this is uh, the spot where the dog got hurt and this damage, but he think it will be okay. Uh, and you're going to stay here for six hours and rest now? Yes, yes. And what about, what about uh, Yuri? He decided to go on, not to stop. How is Yuri that he decided to go on, not to stop? He is happy with his dogs, but it will be difficult to go 160 km without rest. He will stay um, he say um, it's um, his decision, and maybe his dogs look good and running good, but he have to go 160 kilometers. He think he will take a break somewhere on the road, and afterwards he have to take here a break. Okay, спасибо. Вам спасибо. Вам спасибо. Now that was uh, Fatih. Uh, what do you think about uh, the strategy strategy of uh, Gurionov just uh, passing the? Uh, well, as a, a, a good, you know, he needs to take a six-hour mandatory rest in the night. As I've said many times now, it's better to do it in the daytime um, because it's warmer. So then it's better to mush the race during the night hours. And here is uh, Goryono, is it? Yes, yeah, uh, in so the trail. We have pictures uh, directly from the trailer. That's Goryono, who is in the lead. He's the only one who's gone straight to the checkpoint. Look, his uh, snow anchor uh, was loose, so now the team... He has to jump on his slide, so we won't lose his team. Well, what we're seeing here is probably, uh, I'm not sure because we are not too close, but it look, could be that he has some lead dog problems here now that maybe has, uh, they look happy. I mean, they're whales, uh, their tails are wagging, but it looks like uh, they ha he has, a l well, the lead dog want to go, but the others want to go to him. So. Uh, this is absolutely a measure who a team that should have been st uh, should stopped at Karmali one and had the six hour rest. Look, like it looks like he's having a walk in the park <laughs> with his dogs. Yeah. I mean, they're waving their tails. It's just that nobody want to take responsibility. What's that? How do you uh, how you do you interpre uh, yeah, interpret yeah. this? I interpret the same way as you. It's it's a uh, it's a team without <laughs> the, the right kind of motivation here. So uh, the the poor musher, he he, he goes up in front there and, and try to motivate uh, the, the, the pack of, of dogs uh, to run for him in the right direction. But they are they they do not want to do that. Okay, no, because, because, uh, we, we don't know his dogs. He might I have to I have to excuse him if if he had problems with the, the female in heat. There might be a little bit of anarchy in the team because yes. the males want to, 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 to uh, yeah. But here we go. It's his, uh, yeah, and he's, he's on her, his way to Uslada, oh, and he passed enough. right through Karmali checkpoint, and now he's uh, on his way to a turnaround at Uslada. That's right, Maria. But what you see right here now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, wait. Uh, does he have one dog in the sled? You, he started with eight, because this is uh, Guriono, and he started with eight dogs. So uh, he might have one dog in his sled at the moment, actually, because he's going to have three, four, five, six, and he only has yeah. seven dogs. What we see here, you see the white dog in swing here, the light one, the attentive one running alone. That dog was in lead earlier, I believe, and he changed the position of the dogs. But he does have problems because now the dogs are watching the camera crew and normally the dogs would not bother at all and the camera crew is far behind here. They use their lens. And these dogs, they are just mentally tired. Look at their waving their tails, they're attentive, but it looks like they're just mentally tired, I yeah, think. They are they're fine of, physically. It looks like, but they are kind of frustrated and uh, 
They, they do not know exactly what uh, task... Look, now he's changing position on one of the dogs because he has problems getting the team to move straight good forward. Mm. So he's trying new combinations to make sure the dogs will uh, move on as he wants to. Mm. And that could be a problem because of a female in heat. But it is, can also be like he has some leadership problems with his dogs. So these dogs are not trained to go on. Uh, to me, it's they, they, these dogs have not been run, run a long way yet because they had like a day off yesterday. This is a dog team that is just mentally tired. They just want to rest. Do the, these dogs uh, get affected uh, by that? The other dogs were oh. left, uh, were staying at the Karamali checkpoint. Yeah, uh, that's a good point, uh, Maria. That could be, but right here now there could only be one dog that is tired, uh, mentally tired, and that's, and then the rest of the gang here is uh, getting um, uh, affected, affected by this dog. I, mm. I mean, and, and I think also they are kind of. Uh, I think the situation is, is getting a little bit out of hand also for the musher uh, and the dogs understand that the musher is not satisfied it's not satisfied with yeah. them and he's uh, the more he's uh, they are uh, he's not doing the job that they are doing the job he asks for he he get more frustrated and you see okay he, they he, want to turn it's, back it's kind yeah. of a chaos and it's an ar anarchy building up but it, yeah. but it, it might be a, a hit a female in heat problem here. Yeah, it might uh, be a female in heat uh, who he has put back in the sled. I believe he has a dog in his sled because he started mm. with eight dogs and we did not see him drop any dogs mm. at Kermali. Um So I, uh, uh, the black of, male. He's turning back all the time towards the sled. I, I guess oh, there is something. It's a nice long legged male dog. <laughs> and and, uh, and if um, Mikhail Fateyev decide, uh, uh, think that it was a bad decision not to stop at Karin uh, Mali. You mean Gorionov? Gorionov, I'm sorry. Gorionov uh, uh, sees that this was maybe not the smartest thing I've done. Can he turn around? Yeah, or he does can. He, he can turn around, but I... Uh I don't know how they would work that out uh, no, I, in a minute. Uh, minutes. No, and I, don't, sure. and, I don't, and I don't think that's a good strategy either, because then he will have to cover lots of stretches that he has already done, and he have to go all the way back, back to the to Slada come, yeah. later on. So yeah. I, I think I would have either stopped my team and rested them for a while and kind of sorted out the problem, or I would have tried to motivate them in one way or another uh, by changing positions in the, on the gangland and so on, and try to continue to Oslada for, for a, a longer stay there just to relax. And Look here, what you're seeing right now, he's taking out his cell phone actually. He's, um, he's calling somebody <laughs> and this is legal here. And it's also legal in the Nordic North Scandinavian races to use a cell phone might call his handler and uh, tell what's happening and maybe he is complaining that his lead dogs doesn't want to move for example and maybe he has already made a decision to scratch i don't know i don't know maybe we don't know no. uh, what you will probably see maria is if he now decides to go back and he wants to turn his team around what you're going to see is a team who want to run this team i'm 100% sure if you turn this team around now, they will run nicely back to the checkpoint at Karamale 1. Because these dogs are just mentally tired, they're like opposing their leader. So, um, there's nothing wrong with these dogs, he's just been asked to do more than they've been trained for, mentally. So if he would turn them around, you think that the dogs would know that maybe, go oh, back. go back. Oh yeah, I believe so. Yeah. Yes. And remember this uh, Guriano, he was uh, number three coming into Karamali. And these dogs had the smell of all the dog teams on the trail before coming into Karmali. Now he is the first, these are the first dogs on the trail this day. So there is no fresh smell and the dogs feel that there is no smell. Where are the other, the, the other ones? So, of course, if they're not trained to just continue through checkpoints here, well, well, this is a typical, I would actually go and say, this is uh, like a beginner problem. Uh, he should have understood this uh, before coming into the checkpoint and re um, learned this from other races that uh, 
when you're f having like structural problems in your dog team, you should absolutely understand that this team needs to rest. Although they're physically totally fine, they're just mentally tired. This dog team should stay uh, at the checkpoint and then go in out in the night instead. And what is he doing now? I think he is he is trying to talk to them. Yeah, they they look, yeah. They're waving their tails, but I mean, I, I think he's he's despe desperately trying yeah. to 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 involve them more in <laughs> doing the, what he asks them to do. Oh, oh. That means continue. Look here now. He is asking for the dark team to move, and he has well something is happening. You see the lines have stretched out. Okay, they're turning around, so he's probably going back or scratching. That's what I said, Maria. Did you see how the fast the dogs turn around? Mm -hmm. And now he has to stretch out the team. And now you are going to see a dog mm. team. Look, the tails are waving. But do, but do you think actually he asked them to turn around? Or did they just no, do no. it all, all I, by he themselves? He said something. He said something. I believe he actually had a command for turning around. I would never learn my dogs that command mm. because I never want my dogs to mm -hmm. turn around. I want them to go forward. But what you're going to see here now, when he has stretched out all the, the, the fuss in the, the lines, you're going to see a dog team that want to go move. Because these dogs want to go back again, I'm sure. We'll see that. It's pretty interesting that the camera crew was able to catch this. Yes, and so uh, you were talking about, Sina, the mentality of the musher is also extremely important in mushing. It's, oh, a, yeah. it, it, it's a team. It's a teamwork. Teamwork all the way. So uh, what? Uh, Look, no, what, Maria. what goes on in the? the Look, Maria. Yeah. You see, now the dog team is moving. Uh, sorry, Stan, oh, for yeah. interrupting you. Yeah, sure. But I was just going to say that because now you see this dog team is running. They're physically able to run. He's just going to stretch out some more lines. Uh, and uh, I believe he has a dog in the sled as well. Anyways, uh, this dog team is going to go back to the checkpoint. And uh, if he is yeah, going to rest... He's on the way back again, but he's done a turn. So he's now done again. Yeah, I believe he is, uh, will scratch. Because it's going to take more than six hours, I believe, to get these dogs moving nicely again. And it's still a long 150 kilometers left of the race. Mm -hmm. And now he's arranging, uh, rearranging a little bit. Yeah, but it may be when they turn around, the lines were tangled up in the dog's legs. So we just need to hook up the lines again. And the one of the dogs is peeing right there. So uh, when he goes back on the sled right now, I'm sure the dogs want to move. But um, uh, this is uh, not a very common sight, you know? I would, I would actually say something like if you have a pet dog and you open the front door and you want the dog sees the rain and it doesn't want it to be in the outside in the rain, so they don't want to move. So he's continuing to, towards the checkpoint. He's back to the He's end. returning. He's returning. He turned around, returning to Carmelie 1. If he's scratching or if he's just going to stay there for more hours and. Uh, what? Oh, well, it's one of uh, these dogs that is peeing well. now, it's just <laughs> it's So, uh, but uh, what were you talking about, Stana, that the, it's teamwork and the mentality is important? Yeah, oh, sure. Uh, you know that the musher is, is the boss of the team, and there is uh, always a need for the best cooperation between the boss and the rest of the gang, and which also counts for, uh, for all... Um, what is, it, what is it called? Equipage? The equip teams. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, the teams. Yeah. So, so um, there has to be a mutual understanding between the two of them, the, the pack of dogs and the mushroom. If you see now that uh, his dogs are actually galloping, I mean, he's not, obviously, he's not standing on the brake, uh, and the dogs have a, a good speed, so they're not physically tired, but they, I mean, he pushed them through, or not pushed, but he asked them to go through the checkpoint, which was a big mistake, and now he understands his mistake, and now he's returning to the checkpoint again. And what he does, we'll see, he's got uh, as far as I can see, two opportunities. That's to scratch from the race or give his dogs a lot of rest. Mm. And that will be probably be the six hour mandatory rest, mm. but I don't know how they do the timing because he's already left the checkpoint and now he's going back again. Uh, yeah. But I would say these dogs would need more than six hours uh, to, for, uh, to finish the race.
Yes, and uh, we have an update from the checkpoint from our reporter and Dallas CV. Now we've here at the checkpoint. We have seen four teams go four by, teams, and the yep. three of them is here now. And Dallas. What have you seen so far and what do you think about how the dogs looking? Yeah, so um, first in we had Slova come in with a very nice looking team. You know, those dogs have been a little more mellow the whole time, but they set a really good pace on the trail and they look very strong and healthy coming in. Uh, just two minutes behind him, we had uh, Sini come in here. Again, um, a very nice looking team. They had a little more pep, they had a little more energy, right? But they traveled the same speed on the trail. So that could be this, the variation of the type of dogs, right? Both of those mushers quickly got the dogs bedded down on straw and started taking care of their feet. Um, then right behind them, we had uh, Yuri. Yeah, Yuri. He came in, um, but didn't actually stop in the checkpoint. You know, talked to the official real quick, got a little supplies, and took off on the trail. So it'll be fun to see where he ends up uh, stopping. And then a little bit after that, we had Mikhail come in uh, in fourth place. Now, he did this run about 30 minutes slower than the other guys. Everybody else was pretty consistent. And so I think we're seeing a little bit of the effect of a faster first half of the race. He's starting to slow down a little bit now, but he had a very nice looking team. Just seven dogs, but they looked good. Uh, and uh, you agree that uh, they look good, like Della said. And uh, we also have uh, Greg and Bruce uh, commentating on the race from Russia. Okay. Okay, race fans, this is Greg and Bruce. We're back here at Karmali, uh, an important checkpoint, Bruce. These teams have to take either a six hour layover here or when they go down and turn around and come back through Karmali, so one or the other. But we have four of the five teams now stopped here with one team that's gone through. Yeah, we saw him actually out in some of the open pasture land on the way here. Gurionov. Feeding his yeah. dogs there. Yeah, Yuri Gurionov. And uh, he chose not to take it here. We really think these other guys, the way they're feeding and bedding down, will take their six hour here. They say they are, but of course, a great skill in mushing is being able to lie. Yeah, and say, yeah, I'm taking yeah. my break, and then pull on, yeah. pull on out. But uh, they've they've got their cookers out. Very typical checkpoint scene in any race. They got their cookers out, making hot water, uh, making up the the meal for the dogs with meat and kibble, and got them bedded down on straw. It's some of the cat and mouse, the drama that that may unfold here as these hours uh, begin to unwind on the trail. I have been able to confirm 76 kilometers to here, not 62 as we were reporting uh -huh. from the road crossing. That makes more sense, 72, uh, 76 kilometers. But behind us uh, is Alexei Dudkin, who was the, the final team to pull in with this beautiful team of Siberians, again, came in looking strong. Yeah, and he, did, he carried the one that we saw him load at the road yeah. crossing all the way here. And uh, his backpack had probably about 25 pounds. I picked up the bag. He had about 25 pounds of weight in that backpack on his that he carried on his back uh, to make room for the dog that he wanted to haul. It was a pretty small female, but he needed the room. But yeah, they look good. They don't honestly look tired. They're just cleaning their feet and yeah. looking for food, and he hasn't had an opportunity to feed yet. So, so Bruce, let's walk through this team, and, and you can kind of assess this for us. So obviously, here we've got four dogs together. We've got one that's already sound asleep up under the straw, two that are just kind of feeling their way out, and then one is who's not interested in laying down. And so break, break this situation down for us. What do you see here? Well, the simplicity of it to me is they're not really tired. I mean, yeah, the one's curled up and they're kind of taking a nap and cleaning their feet, but they're up and as I look on up the line, I see dogs that are still up. They look like they're ready for a meal. And this early in the race, they look like they should look. They're just kind of doing their business, resting, but but casual about it, not just falling over and basically still up and interested in what's going on and looking for their food. And so explain to the race fans, a six hour mandatory rest, uh, that's a good chunk of rest. We are 76 kilometers into it. We have one team in Guryanov that is out. These four teams may sit here for six hours. It seems traditionally that's a little early mileage-wise in a race to take such a big break. Your thoughts on that? That's absolutely true, but these guys may not have been in as many competitions mm -hmm. and trained to the level that dogs would. I'll pick a race that we know in Alaska, the Cusco 300, where you wouldn't take a break this early. You want to get the dogs more tired and then give it to them to rebuild 
later on. But these dogs, if, if they need this break now, then this is the place for them to take it. Uh, it is a little early in the race, but these guys know their dogs based on the type of training that they have on them. And to me, it's really a training thing. These two teams behind us look like, I mean, they look powerful and they look typical of any race team I would see in other races. And it, But it depends on how much training you put on them and how far they can go before they need that big meal and uh, and more rest. And to me, it's more of a matter when they need that big yeah. meal. Okay. And so let's walk over here. Elena, can we ask uh, Alexi some questions while he feeds? And, and maybe you can help translate us. Uh, Alexi, can we ask you a few questions? So let's uh, just talk generally. How was the run to this point, 76 kilometers in? А просто кратко очень как вообще эти 70 с лишним километров. Хорошо? Хорошо. Ну, легко. Тра трасса нормальная, хорошая, твердая, довольно. Собаки нормально. Ну, вот у одной небольшая травма плеча, и поэтому буду ее снимать. А так хорошо, легко дошли. Можно было даже не останавливаться на 6-часовой отдых, но мы решили остановиться. He said that uh, the road is fine and uh, the dogs are feeling so good. And she, she exactly, she, he told that the dogs are feeling good. So actually, probably he was so hurry up to tell that he will stay for another six hours. He thinks that uh, probably he needs to continue. Um, to to go through the checkpoint, and uh, he said that also he's feel, feeling good, so everything is fine. He's he's happy. Okay. He's happy with his dogs, with his team. Okay, and we saw him load a dog at the road crossing. Can you can he tell us why that dog was loaded? Uh, she probably uh, she probably a little bit tired. Okay, and uh, it seems to me that he wants to drop her. Off. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So, so I have a question for him. Yep. How's his back after carrying that pack? Все очень интересуются твоим красным мешком, как твоя спина. Спина хорошо. Спина хорошо. Мешок я за поворот заехал, я его немножко разгрузил, то есть тяжелое сложил в нарт и оставил только легкое. He said that um, so it's everything is fine with his neck. Don't worry about him. So as soon as he turned around from us, uh, he p took out some of the stuff and put inside of the uh, inside the sled. So don't worry about him. He's smart enough to take about his neck. <laughs> Alexei, thank you. Thank you. Alexei Dudkin. Okay, Bruce, so uh, sounds like he... Uh, He's thinking about not taking a six hour, maybe just put an hour or two rest on him and, and then get moving down the trail. Yeah, well, again, it's what every musher knows about their team. And like I said, these guys don't look tired to me. They just look hungry. Yeah. And then we have the thing that they are the Siberians, so they go at a, much, a real steady speed, but it's a slower gait. And he, it might be to his advantage with this particular team to go on and that's one of the fun dynamics about sled dog racing that we all talk about is it is this the place to take your break is it, should you go farther and rest should you rest earlier and that's the interesting dynamic in every race we've ever covered and every year in every race like in Iditarod where do you take your 24 because we've seen people make a move that cost them the race or won them the race in some years, or at least contributed to it. And it's the same in this. We're going to find out how this plays on, out. But with his team that has moved at a slower but steady pace, and they haven't used as much energy as these dogs that move faster, I think that's probably a wise thing if he's got the training on them. Uh, qu another question. Siberians, knowing that the Alaskan Husky is faster, and if you're in a race... Why would somebody choose to own Siberians? I think it's an interest and a pride in in doing as well as you can with that dog. I think you have to really like Love the, the breed, breed first, yeah. and then the challenge is how can I he help these dogs and work with them to reach their highest potential? Just like people who have Siberians know who Siberian team ran the Iditarod or the Yukon Quest fastest. They didn't win, but they have the track record, so to speak. So, And also in Europe in particular, 
This is the first sled dog that they were introduced to as far as working sled dogs. The Alaskan Husky thing really in the history here is very young, very new, and they'll come to love that breed because they can do anything. Ladies and gentlemen, Greg and Bruce, we're here in Karmali. The race is just getting good. We're having a blast. Maria, back to you in the studio in Oslo. Are you in there? Okay. Yes, Greg, I'm in here. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like they're having fun in Russia. That's good. And uh, Greg and Bruce are friends on site here. They were talking to uh, Alexei Dudkin. What do you think about his strategy? Well, Maria, I believe it's good for your dogs to get rest at this moment. But Durkin's strategy is obviously to take one or two hours now and then take the six-hour mandatory when he gets back to Carmali too. Uh, I would personally, if I would be mushing uh, competitively with Siberian Huskies, um, this is during the day, I would rest six hours now to get um, the, the, the dogs to rest in the heat of the day. I mean, it's not warm, but it's obviously going to be colder during the night. So if he gives his dogs six hours rest now, he could race during the whole night and then maybe give them one or two hours at the Carmelli 2 checkpoint before going to the finish line. That's what I would have done. Mm. To, to, to use the cold, the, the temperature in the night, which is more, uh, is more uh, better. It's got to be better for the Siberian Huskies with thicker coats. Mm. Uh, they but, like uh, the cold. He yeah. obviously wants to stay one or two hours now, get some snack, food, drinks in the, his dogs, move on, and then take the six hour during the night hours. Mm. And uh, we have some uh, questions uh, from the viewers uh, to you. And uh, Steinar, I think this is for you. Uh, do the vets intervene somehow, uh, dogs being examined, or is it the area of responsibility of the musher? Um, the, the health and the welfare of the dogs is always the musher's responsibility. And uh, even though the fact is that there are veterinarians uh, attending all sled dog races or long distance disciplines, uh, we are there to give pieces of advice and help out if there are situations. But it's always the musher himself or herself that has to take decisions and being responsible for themselves and their dogs. What can you do as a veterinarian? Uh, what is the system if you see something? Do you, what do you do? Uh, very often so, uh, the situation is that um, the mushers are those knowing their own dogs. They, they know their, um, what they have of training. And uh, as veterinarians, my impression is that we, we should stay a little bit back. We should not be too active being out there in the straw. Uh, cuddling with all uh, dogs at, at all checkpoints all the time. But, but if we are asked by the mushers to, to a second opinion for, for uh, any kind of question, according to the dog health, we will do so. And of course we will help out if there is cases of emergency uh, or if dogs are become ill or hurt in any way and they are actually pulled out of the race, we will start treatment on them. Mm. And uh, uh, do you, can you give a warning? How does that work? We can, but very often we do not have to do that because uh, the, musher, the mushers themselves, they are pulling out dogs that, they, that themselves see are having problems or are in the chance of getting problems on the next, le next leg. Then they prefer to take them out themselves without having any uh, veterinarians or other official in the race asking them to do that. They will do them all by themselves. That is the most common situation. Well, Maria, I see we have some pictures here and there's a veterinarian checking one dog here. But if you saw, there was like an instrument uh, kept close to the dog's body right now. That instrument is a chip reader. That instrument is the veterinarian is using that close to the body of the dog to, ch to find the chip where you have the microchip uh, to check that the dog is one of the dogs that is signed in to race this race. So this is just a, a classification that it is the right dog 
mm. which was on the starting line, are uh, st uh, the measure uh, applied to the race, uh, wanted to bring to the race, and then they just check that the microchip corresponds with this name of the dog. Uh, I don't find any other <laughs> way to explain no, it. But, uh, <laughs> it's uh, a microchip. We do have microchips in Norwegian. Uh, and I'll every, just yeah. only correct you. That, <laughs> yeah, thank uh, you. that is actually not a, a veterinarian's work. It's, it's the organi right. organizers. But uh, here the veterinarian did uh, it. It might be a veterinarian. Yeah. What is he yeah. doing here? I, I uh, guess Santa. it must be a veterinarian then. Because he, here he is doing a checkup on, uh, on the dogs to see this, the, the state of hydration. And uh, he is bending the limbs to see if there is any kind of um, soreness or uh, uh, sore muscles, or is, uh, that can cause the dogs to start limping on the next next leg. Yes. What? What? what this is from the mid the, mid the first stages of the race. This is, uh, I believe, this is from Monday. So this was uh, before the days the dogs had one day rest. We have to remember that these dogs have done a stage race uh, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, and they've already run about 240 k, 240 kilometers, and then they rested yesterday. And the mid-distance uh, measures they finished Monday, right? Mm -hmm. So they have had their press ceremony. They finished. So now the Volga Quest only consists of the ones that were in the stage race that also are in the uh, longer part now. So they have done. 240k, now they're doing 215k. Yes. So the mushers have got to rest for one day, but does the dog need as much rest as the the musher, the humans? Uh, I could take Do that they one. Need uh, that much sleep? Uh, the dogs get definitely more rest than the humans because the dogs are taken well care of and they are able to sleep and rest and, f f um, and get food and or eat while the machine needs to take care of the dog team and the machine will definitely get less sleep during a long distance race mm -hmm. but as i believe the machine were able at the day off yesterday they were able to get help from their handlers so i'm sure the machine got a lot of help um from the handler team on the day on the day off but now in the last part of the race the machine will have to do everything on its own or her own Yes. And uh, we have some more uh, questions from the viewers. Uh, and this one is for you, Nina. Uh, when they pass, do they have to wait a certain amount of time or can they just uh, continue straight forward? When you are overtaken by another team, you have to keep a certain distance between the team that has overtaken you or passed you and yourself. So there will be, if you are taken over by a team, the team in front of you has to be one sled length ahead of you. And when a dog team is passing you, your dogs will automatically start, start to run a little bit faster because they want to f continue after the first team. But you have to remember that there is one reason why you have been overtaken, because your team is slower. So if you are overtaken, there are rules, you have to keep a certain length. And in this particular race, I believe you have to wait 10 minutes well, not stand still, but you have to wait 10 minutes before you, if you feel you're going faster, you have to wait 10 minutes before you ask to overtake the other team again, right? Oh. But in Norway, we do have different rules here. You have to keep a certain length between the team that has overtaken you, and you have to wait for a, long, a certain amount of time or distance before you can overtake. These rules apply in the race. There are different rules at the end of the race. The last kilometers of the race is actually called no man's land. That's where the trail is going to be a little bit wider and you're not allowed to say uh, trail, uh, which means you want to pass. In the last kilometer before the finish line, you have to try to move around the other team without the other team stopping. That's like, uh, you can go, um, there is no rules. This first, the first uh, uh, musher to the finish line is the winner. So, but uh, if you are overtaken here in the middle of the race, you need to respect the other one coming behind, and you have to stop, and the other team have to pass. And if there are some tangles with the lines, you are able. You have to make sure you are able to help as well. It is actually quite a lot of rules, Maria. I'll take that a lot of time. It takes a long time to explain more. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nina. I hope that our viewers will know more by now. Uh, we'll have another report from the checkpoint Karmali. We have arrived to Karmali, Dallas, 
There's no doubt about it. What do you think? I think we are literally on Carmelie at the moment. Uh, you know, this is the town where the next checkpoint on the race is going to be, and we've gotten to see a little more of the Russian countryside on the way over here. And it uh, looks like a great place to be mushing a dog team as we look out over the kind of the wilderness and then these small towns that it passes through. This is actually a historical place, actually. There's been a lot of archaeological founds here, like pottery and also last last century they found some Iranian coins, and, but yep. they have never found a weapon. Isn't that interesting? It is. You know, I, mean, I, I think what you were getting at there and telling me about before is that it's, you know, it was said to be a very peaceful community, and it ties right into this Volga race. It's kind of commemorating, commemorating the trade route. You know, that went through here between what is now modern day Scandinavia uh, or, or the modern Scandinavia and Persia, I believe. So it's cool to see sled dogs still commemorating these older trade routes. Whether or not dogs were used at that time is kind of almost irrelevant. And then passing through the small towns that each have their own history and culture. Yes, because you have Beer Grease, John Beer Grease, and then you have the Edith Rod. Yep. Each, each race is kind of celebrating something. But it's. I don't know. For me, it's about celebrating a way of life, one that's kind of disappearing, and um, it's cool to remember that. It's cool to remember your roots and your history, and uh, and then each place has a specific person, like John Bear Grease, that a specific person, or the Iditarod, and it was the gold rush, and that really opened up Alaska. And here in Russia, we're getting to explore more of that and kind of see that that history is here as well. It's a beautiful day, lots of sun. How's, how is it to be out there mushing right now, you think? Uh, this would be a great day to be mushing. I'd rather be sitting on a sled than uh, <laughs> sitting on a sign. But um, no, it's this is this is a great day for mushing. It's cool enough to where it's comfortable for the dogs, but not so cold that it isn't comfortable for the person. Um, there's a little breeze, and that's gonna be nice if they're up on uh, the hilltops and their sun's a little bit warmer. But this is great mushing conditions. They should be putting down some pretty good times, I think. You know, we've seen these rolling hills. There's not huge mountains, but there's enough to keep it interesting. You're not just running down a river for hundreds of miles, right? So it's enough terrain to make it interesting. On our way down here, we were watching Volga the River, and it was not ice at all almost on it. And the fact that they had to change it, it's 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 d dangerous to go on, a, on, a, on ice that's not safe, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think the most dangerous is when it looks solid, right? You have an ice covering, and then maybe you have another creek coming into it and it creates softer ice there, or a little warmer water coming in, or just that movement. But this river has no ice on it, right? Um, so clearly it wasn't even an option to try it. But, yeah, it, races have to change sometimes, and that's always a, a conversation for the mushers. Oh, how is it going to be different this year for taking a different route in some ways, everybody's a rookie if you're going on some new trail. Well, we're, gonna, no, we're not going to continue to sit here for so long. We're going on to the checkpoint at Carmeli. So we'll see you soon. Thank you uh, there, <laughs> Carrie Ann and Dallas sitting <laughs> uh, on the sign. <laughs> well, are they sure in trying to have some fun while waiting for things to happen? I mean, it seems like Greg and Bruce had a good time as well. So. I'm yes. glad they were uh, having fun in uh, Russia. And it looks like the sun is up and uh, yeah, it's a good vibe there. Yeah. Yeah. And, it's, uh, and it is exotic for us Westerners to, to be able to uh, experience Russia. Yes. Uh, how, how did you feel like? Was it a big difference from, uh, from Norway when you went there? Uh, the, the main issue is the language thing which is a really big problem. And also the fact that they have uh, uh, other letters than us. So just you are, you are in a strange country. You do not understand what is said on the signs. So you can't orientate yourself what, what's uh, happening. And the fact that few uh, inhabitants speak English. So then you are, you are feeling a little bit lonely. So it's very good that we have an international atmosphere where more English-speaking people are around. And uh, Dallas Seavey said earlier that uh, mushers are mushers, that he could recognize and uh, he was familiar with the mushers and their routines and how they acted. The environment was a little bit the same. Yeah, but you know, Maria, um, the mushing culture is a kind of subculture. <laughs> we do things uh, <laughs> the same way, most of us. Uh, we we uh, talk about the same things. We, we uh, dress almost the same way because we're handling dogs, uh, we train, 
<laughs> we are uh, concerned about our dogs. I mean, we have uh, some kind of strange way of communicating. We don't talk politics. We don't talk about uh, music. We talk about dogs. We talk about shit. We talk about trails, temperature, weather, feeding, which quality headlamp is the best, you know, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's ma basically <laughs> what we talk about all the winter when we meet our friends in the machine community. So it's a kind of narrow-minded uh, <laughs> subculture, actually. Yes, but it's very fun to watch. Uh, and, well, it's and fun to, to be a part of this subculture as well, uh, of course. But I um, mean, sometimes you need to get to the, 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 the um, f surface of the sea and soak in that there is a life outside as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> but now we'll dive deeper into the world of dog mushing. Uh, our reporter Greg Heister is talking to the landlord, Elena. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to Carmali. And so, Elena, uh, we have a yeah. young lady here. Yes. She owns this property that the teams are all parked, and we're on a working farm. Is that what we're at? Uh, yes, it's agriculture working farm, yeah. and um, uh, she is uh, and her husband. They are the owner of this place. Okay, and so can you ask her? Well, first of all, her name. What's uh, как вас зовут? Наталья. 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 Last name. Okay, so uh, ask Natalia why it's important for her to have a checkpoint on her property. Why does she invite dog teams in? Почему вы разрешили собакам сюда зайти? Почему для вас это важно? Мой муж просто участвует в организации гонки. Он прокладывает маршрут. Пока он ездит, что они там стоят метки, как должны, где должны собаки пройти. Я вас понимаю. <laughs> uh, it's actually first of all he, 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 her husband uh, he takes part in the race committee and uh, also he is working on the trail he is a snow machine driver okay. and they have also their own dogs okay. so this yeah. is why we are here yeah. and why she is welcome to us yeah malamute right Did we yes see those? yes huge malamute большие yeah. ваши маламуты so do, do they mush them и вы на них ходите муж ходит на них ну да мы катаемся но конечно не такие расстояния большие проходим а так здесь по округе максимум по моему 25 но он ходил на север на на них гулять Ah, so actually we have uh, malamuts, we are mushing for ourselves, for sun, and some years ago we put together like a small expedition up north of Russia oh. by themselves. Oh. Okay, mm -hmm. so tell us a little bit about the farm. We walked around a little bit, we see horses. What kind of horses are they? And then we see pigs. Yeah. Спрашивают, какие животные у вас на ферме. Мы вот сейчас лошадей видели, что это за лошади, свиней видели. Это кто такие у вас гости или ваши постоянные обитатели? Нет, это даже не свиньи, это кабаны. Так получилось, что нам принесли первых из леса маленьких, и они у нас вот выросли в такое маленькое стадо. Лошади это тяжеловозы. Okay, so it's it's not a home. Pigs. It's a uh, real wild. A um, couple times ago, the small one probably their mom was sh sh shooting, okay. and this small one they came here. So right now they are home. <laughs> So all the pigs in the pen back there are actually yes. wild pigs yes. that they've domesticated. Yes. And yes. So do they eat them? Do they sell them as livestock? Вы их разводите на мясо или как на что вот сейчас? So right now for for like a meat, yes. Okay, wow, that's fantastic. And what do they use the horses for? And what kind of horses are they? А лошади какие у вас и для чего вы пользуете их? Ну к нам приезжают люди кататься на лошадях городские, которые давно забыли, как выглядят животные. У нас есть еще козы, куры. Okay, for, about the horses. Uh, she said that a lot of people from the city they are coming, they are coming to touch the uh, horses oh, okay. and uh, to drive them. Yeah. And it's interesting. She said that a lot of people in the city they almost forget how these animals looks like. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it's only pigs and the horses. They also have uh, ships, okay, sheep, ships, yeah, yeah. and uh, children. Нет, еще какие-то животные. 
uh, and the chicken is. Yeah. yeah. Wow, fantastic, Elena. Thank you. You're welcome. Natalia, thank you. Yeah. You're welcome on any time. Okay, great. We'll be back soon. <laughs> Let's go back to Oslo. Thank you, Greg. Uh, and we'll also check in with Carrie Ann, who is uh, uh, giving us an update from the trail. So, as you can see, just behind me here, at the, we're at the Carmelese checkpoint, and um, I'm all by myself. And you know what? I lost Dollar CV. He said he needed a power nap. And if you want to know how a musher during the Idida Rod do their naps, turn around and have a look. Because look at that. He's having a power nap. It's tough being a TV reporter for him, so I'm going to walk over and wake him up. <laughs> Hi, Dallas. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> you? You're sleeping. Is it how you how you rest when you're out mushing or? Yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> I usually have a dog team beside me though. Yeah, but there's dog, dogs over here. But tell me, you, you you never get into your sleeping bag or what? What's what's the decision you make to just to lay down or use the sleeping bag? Yeah. Um, on a day like today, I'm not gonna get out the sleeping bag. <laughs> Because it's what it's maybe a couple degrees below Celsius, and so on temperature like this, usually like on the Iditarod, you only get an hour, or an hour and a half maybe to sleep. So you'll get cold sleeping like this, but not in an hour, right? So sometimes I feel more comfortable laying down to sleep, knowing that I'm not gonna uh, sleep for six hours. <laughs> like if I if I don't hear my alarm. Mm -hmm. But yeah, if it's if it's um, I can't do Celsius math right now, but if it's like 10 degrees Fahrenheit, I'll get out my sleeping bag, definitely. How, how long would you, I mean, you decide to go down and take a power nap, um, how long do you sleep for? 45 minutes to an hour and a half would be pretty normal, somewhere in there, depending on how much um, dog chores you have before you can go to bed. If, if it's at the end of the race, and maybe you only have a 10 dog team and everybody's really healthy, you can maybe even get two hours of sleep on a on a four hour stop. Well, I don't think you're gonna have that long sleep now because the teams are soon coming to the checkpoint. So I'm gonna wake him up for sure, and he he'll be ready to work again. Thank you, uh, there, Carrie Ann. Now, uh, Nina, is this how you would take a nap? Well, if you have a big, nice jacket like that, sure, you will no problem. I've done that myself in a in a, in a race where I was a handler uh, many years ago. Uh, I did not have the time to find my sleeping bag, or I didn't know where it was, so I just laid straight down on the snow in a very warm jacket. It's like a, the jacket was so warm as a sleeping bag. So, But um, normally the musher will either sleep uh, together with the dogs in the straw, or they would, uh, if there is a possibility, to walk inside a cabin or a tent, a heated tent, the musher will definitely go inside Maybe they are wet and need to dry some clothes as well. Mm -hmm. But if it's a sunny, nice, warm day like this, I would have done the same thing as Dallas. I would just lay down. Hmm. Can the measures just rest on the trail here in the Volga Quest? Well, Maria, I believe uh, there are certain rules. If they want to rest for a long time using straw, I believe they have to use the Carmali checkpoint here. If they want to rest for like only five minutes, which is actually not a rest, but just a quick stop to fix a dog booty or to fix uh, to give the dogs a snack, they can stop five minutes along the trail. That's maximum. And they're not allowed to leave any dog food on trail. If they want to stop for a little bit more or uh, like an hour or two along the trail, they got to move off the trail. They got to be, uh, I think it's about 50 meters, I believe. They have to go away from the trail, not interrupting teams coming behind, right? So if you want to rest, but they, uh, I believe they are not, they're allowed to stop, but I believe they're not allowed to have straw. Because remember, this is in a national park. And most of this race goes into the national park of Samarskaya Luka. So uh, they are not allowed to leave a dog booty. They're not allowed to leave dog food. They're not allowed to leave straw or uh, hay. So every, every uh, garbage has to be removed Yes, because I, um, you don't want to pollute. Mm. But I believe uh, most of these mushers are most familiar with resting at checkpoints, which means they will be resting at Karmali. But uh, they sure 
probably more comfortable. Uh, absolutely, yeah. and uh, maybe they need veterinary check as well, and that's the only po uh, point where you have a veterinarian check. So. But but uh, when when that that is said, it's it's always important for a long distance musher to have trained himself and his dogs to sleep and find rest outside a checkpoint because you never know weather-wise what happens when you are out on the trail. So you should not you should not find yourself in a situation where you do not handle that thing. Dogs and uh, mushrooms should be kind of trained and familiar with sleeping outside under harsh, harsh conditions. It's Anna. definitely an outdoor sport. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Can I just add one thing? Yeah. Anna, you remember, Maria, resting along the trail or resting up trail, as some would say, is also a definition of strategy. So in the uh, Iditrud race, which is coming up in some weeks' time, you'll see a lot of the teams resting up trail, uh, along the trail between the checkpoints, blowing through checkpoints, resting on trail. But that's also basically a, a question of strategy. Yes, but right now we'll look at the strategy of this race. Uh, we'll take a look at the map. Now, Nina, what can we tell from this uh, map here? Yeah, well, we have already seen that um, uh, Goriano, he went straight through Kalmari checkpoint on uh, the way to uh, the next uh, and then back again. We turned his team around. We saw that on a video uh, some a uh, little while ago. And what we see now is he is actually uh, in a standing still, more or less. He, we don't know right now if he's going backwards towards Carmali 1 or if he has turned his team ag uh, one more time. We don't know. I believe he is standing still. And he, I believe he has problems uh, because his dogs are mentally tired. But you know, you do see a road underneath here. We can't see a road. We saw he made the telephone call when we had the video footage uh, a little while earlier. I don't know, we don't know, but he might have called his handler realizing he has problems with the, the trust in his dogs or the dogs does not trust him. So I don't know, but it, there might be a chance he has decided to scratch and is actually standing there waiting for somebody with a car. He's handled him coming, picking him up. We don't know. No, we'll see. Uh, so he's the only one out of the checkpoint uh, and, and then at the Karmali one checkpoint we have the rest of the teams, the other four teams. We only have five teams uh, in this race now. And we know that in the interview Greg, Bruce and, and uh, Dallas and Kariana did at Karmali one. We know that Goriano, no sorry, Dudkin, Alexei Dudkin with the Siberian Husky team, he plans to rest for one or two hours and move on, which means he needs to take his six hour mandatory rest at the Kermali 2 checkpoint. And that means he'll be traveling during daylight further on, whilst the other ones who are still present at Kermali 1, they will be resting and taking their six hour mandatory rest at Kermali. So here we see the, the uh, race, the times the measures have been using coming into Kermali and uh, Dudkin, uh, no, that's the rest time in Kermali, sorry. Uh, we see that uh, Demchenko Dem Dem has been there for almost three hours. Uh, Trigyormin, a little bit less. Uh, Goriano, who was the first one, he was there for three hours, but then he left the checkpoint. Three minutes. Uh, sorry, three minutes. I need Glad new glasses. <laughs> <laughs> and then Fatih Yao, he is resting at the checkpoint. He's been there for two hours, 23 minutes. And then uh, Dudkin has been there one hour less, or 50 minutes less. So he's been there one hour, 32 minutes. So that's uh, four teams at the checkpoint of Carmeli. One, and then Goryono uh, has left and uh, is somewhere standing still or moving along on the way. And how much uh, do they have left of the trail now? They moved uh, about six, 70 kilometers. Yeah, so a to quick Kermale. mathematic will uh, will say they got about 150k left uh, uh, traveling uh, in the race, and uh, which also means that um, talking about the rest times, which means that uh, the first ones will be able to leave the checkpoint if they're taking their mandatory six hours. The first one will have, still have three or more hours of rest before they can leave the checkpoint. And then they will have 150k left 
of the race. Yes, and uh, they will have to make a turnaround at yeah. Uslada, right? Yes, they go from Karmali 1 up to Uslada by the Volga River. Uh, this is all the way out on the tip of the peninsula of uh, uh, the Samarskaya. Uh, and then back from Uslada, which is not a checkpoint, it's just a turnaround, and they go back to Karmali, just, and they probably meet other teams head on. And then back to Karmali, and if they need to take their six-hour mandatory rest, they could, it can be taken here if they have not already taken it. And from Karmali, the trail moves on, go right to the, uh, uh, to the right here on the south side of the peninsula, and then back, meeting the trail again from the starting line, at the start uh, the first leg, and then all the way the same trail, and then a little bit another loop here coming in north again to the finish line which is at the same place at the start and this is in uh, Giryevo and uh, this is pretty close to the city of Togliatti where you are familiar Steinar so she, Togliatti yeah. is just north on the other side of the bend of the Volga river yeah that's right so you um, that's a quite big city, isn't it? Yeah, the biggest city in the area is Samara that we can see just on the... Yeah, it's on the east side the of the island. East, uh, yeah. of, the, of the bend there, and, and the, the city of Togliatti is a little bit further north. I, as far as I remember, the Togliatti, they have a population of approximately one million, something like that, if I do not yes, almost one remember million, wrong. Yeah. But in my ears, that's a big city. Yeah, it's a big city. Remember, we are only 5.5 yeah. million in Norway. So. And it's a little bit strange that you have a city in uh, Russia that is called after an Italian. But that's that's the fact. That's where they make the Ladas. <laughs> the, that's the right. Cars. The, the, uh, it's the a the car, yeah. car manufacturer in Togliatti. Yeah. Yes, so we get to learn some about the Russia and the Russian culture as well. Well, mushing is up and coming in Russia. And our reporter has talked to some young spectators, maybe some future mushers. I'm standing here with some great spectators and tell us where are these guys coming from? These guys are the local orphans here from the area and they come here to see the start. Okay, tell me, um, ask her in, in Russian please, How, what, do the girl, what do the children think about the start? What <laughs> Вообще дети очень любят собак, им очень нравится это мероприятие, они в восторге на самом деле. Вот жалко немножко спрашивают, почему ну, лапы у них в носочках, да? Вот все очень интересно, все здорово, круто. They say that the kids love dogs, they love this event, they are uh, looking forward, they sometimes ask why the dogs wear dog shoes, so they're really interested, and they're uh, just now going for excursions, so they're looking forward to see some more huskies. And who, uh, what do you like the most about the, the dogs? А их глаза, их вид, они такие классные. The eyes, the furry, how they move. То, что они лают. And that they bark. And that they bark, they make a lot of noise. Yes. So the children love. Сильные, да, беговые собаки, да? Да, да, да. Такие выносливые очень собаки. These are dogs with endurance. They are really awesome running dogs, and the children are amazed about them. Thank you so much. Spasiba. 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 Well, many people who love dogs there. And if you have a funny dog, or maybe, you know, you have a dog who knows a cool tri trick or two, we'd love to see it. Use the hashtag KrillPass the next time you upload a video or a picture on uh, Instagram and face or Facebook, and we might repost it. You can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook for updates on our furry friends. We'll be back shortly with more live updates from Volga Quest. Uh, stay tuned. Let's go. 